This is Sarah. Welcome back to another video here on my channel. This is going to be the compilation of all the videos I did talking about the very last season of The Vampire Diaries, season 8. This one makes me a little emotional because this project was a year long in the making and I hope you guys enjoy. So we open this season with a couple in a car driving down like a misty dark road. So we can assume that we're back on the whole like vampire hides and road, vampire attacks people train. We are. Uh, Damon is there. They end up swerving out of the way and not hitting Damon. So then Enzo like jumps in front of the car and they hit him and kill him. Uh, but then when they get out of the car, Damon's there. Enzo wakes up and like puts his bones back together, which is so scary. The kids are freaking out because it's like this young couple in the car. Um, they kidnap them and take them back to the warehouse where they've been like, you know, hiding all those victims. We saw them in the last one. They tell us that they're being mind controlled to do all of this. It's clear that Damon is a little off. Like he's supposed to not have his humanity on, right? But he's a little too normal. They do brutally murder the boy, but Enzo takes the girl away because she's not evil enough. They're being told to like bring only the worst of the worst to whatever the creature is that they're killing for. So Enzo takes the girl away. Damon murders the boy by dropping him into water and then like he gets torn apart and the hook comes back out of the water and there's no body on the hook anymore. Like it's, it's gross. And when Enzo comes home again, he's like, so... You want to watch some TV tonight or what? And Damon's like, actually, I think I'm just going to read. And Enzo's like, okay, good night then. And Damon's like, good night. And they just walk away from each other. Weirdly normal. This scene has no business being as funny as it is. We then cut to Caroline and Stefan happily making out in his bedroom. They're having a great time. Bonnie is at the cabin still trying to play guitar. One of the strings breaks and she has a whole little meltdown because she misses Enzo so much and it triggers a memory of him like fixing a broken string on the guitar for her. This is when her hair finally looks like this. By the way, I've been using this picture almost the entire time because this is my favorite look on Bonnie, but she looks like this now officially. Rick has taken over running the armory. He's working with some um, like assistant intern people. One of them is named Dorian. He will be important later. The other one is named Georgie and she's definitely into Rick. So buckle up for that storyline. They've also hired a nanny to help look after the kids because they're both so busy right now and they can't be with them all the time. Caroline is a little uncomfortable because the nanny whose name is Celine is kind of hot. The interns, Dorian and Georgie, are working on trying to figure out how somebody could have gotten out of the vault. Somehow they put it together that they need like sensory deprivation to unlock a secret room. So they blindfold Rick and put headphones on him so that he can only use his sense of touch. And he finds like a false wall and goes through it into like a treasure room, basically. Damon is reading Fifty Shades of Grey, which personally, I don't think he would enjoy. Like, I think he would see way too many similarities and he'd be like, mm, self-reflection, I think not. And he would like throw the book away. Enzo complains to him about how he doesn't want to be doing what they're doing and he doesn't understand why Damon is so okay with it. And Damon's like, uh, duh, I flipped my humanity switch. So I'm not caring about anything anymore. You should do the same thing. They're keeping like whatever scary demon thing was in the vault under the water. So it's an aquatic scary demon thing. And he throws Enzo in there so he can talk to it himself. Uh, but Enzo ends up just getting like roughed up a little bit and then dragging himself back out of the water. Rick in the secret treasure room cave system thing is being all cool, calm and collected. And the interns are just eating it up. Like they think he is so cool and sexy and nerdy in the best way. But I am officially off the Rick train because What's happening to him now is when I start to dislike him. I don't like his bad father era. Um, I didn't like his Caroline Forbes' is hot era either. So I'm not a Rick lover anymore, unfortunately. But the interns are. 
we get a nice scene of Caroline with the girls at her office at work. She has been given like an edited version of the video of Enzo talking to Virginia in the mental hospital. Uh, but for some reason, the like footage cuts out whenever Virginia tells him the truth because she, she's the only one that knows and he's the only one that was told, but he obviously didn't tell anybody. So now they have no way of figuring that out again. Bonnie is reaching her breaking point, but Stefan is trying to convince her to hold on to hope because they're the two that care the most. So they need each other or the boys are screwed. The gang gets alerted that a body has been found. Remember, all these people have been disappearing, but the bodies were disappearing with them. So they had no leads. Now they have a body and they're like, oh, maybe this is gonna be a good thing. It looks like the girl was strangled with guitar string. Then they realize that the car has exactly three miles left of gas in it. And three miles from the crime scene location is a slaughterhouse that for some reason was recently closed down. So Enzo had told Damon that he had about 2% of his own self-control left. And it looks like he left some clues for Bonnie to help find him. Caroline is still trying to listen to the video, but it's not working. The nanny calls and says that Rick still isn't home. So she's wondering if Caroline knows where he is. Then the door blows open. Caroline has called and found out that Rick is still stuck at the office. Okay, they can't reach him. But the nanny is like, oh no, he's here. The door just opened. Except no, it's not Rick. It's Virginia. She steals a knife from the kitchen. She cuts the nanny's throat. So the nanny is dead. Caroline takes off running to get there. But Virginia is in the house looking for the girls. We do get these scenes of her stalking through the house with a bloody knife. It is in fact giving Kai from 1994. I don't make the rules. If you don't want me to think about him so much, quit doing these scenes that mirror scenes we already saw him do. Caroline thankfully gets home and stops Virginia and saves the girls. She also is able to heal Celine somehow, even though her throat was cut and she absolutely should have died. In the treasure room, Rick is like geeking out about all the gold and the artifacts and stuff. He's losing his mind. And Georgie is like, wow, you've never been hotter. I'm obsessed. And he's like, hold on now, young lady. I only have it in me to be attracted to one far too young for me woman in my lifetime. You must back off. And Georgie's like, man, okay. I had to shoot my shot though. And I'm like, girl, you didn't. You don't want him. I can tell you this, you don't want him. He gets the call that something's happened though to Caroline and the girls, so he rushes home to help them. Bonnie is at the crime scene and they find candle wax in the girl's ears, which is definitely suspicious and weird. Stefan goes to the slaughterhouse to try to find Damon. And then when Damon shows up, he's like mopping the floor being like, hello, brother, you found me. You need to leave immediately. Damon admits that he knows what's going on, but he can't tell Stefan what it is. It is in fact connected to hell. And so that's why Damon gave up his humanity because he knows where he's going at the end of everything. And so it's not worth fighting it. But Stefan is like, I won't leave you alone. So he refuses to go. Caroline sends the nanny away with the girls and then wakes Virginia up by slapping her in the face. Virginia though, will only say, you shouldn't have opened the vault. I was coming after the girls because you had them open the vault. They are coming. And then she chews off her own tongue and dies. So Bonnie shows up to the slaughterhouse while Damon is explaining that he gave up everything because he knows that Elena's going to go to heaven and he's going to go to hell. So what's the point anymore, which is crazy, but they, they really do be bringing heaven and hell into this in season eight. They ran out of options. Enzo shows up and then Damon snatches Bonnie by the throat and threatens to kill her. Bonnie is trying to get Enzo's attention, but he's like not even fully looking at her and clearly acting like she doesn't exist, which is really upsetting to her. Yeah, so Virginia died. Rick comes home and helps clean up the body and everything. Turns out Caroline has been living in her old house in Mystic Falls. And now Rick has decided that really he should move in there and out of his crappy, you know, single dad apartment, he should live with the girls. And then Caroline should go move in with Stefan because that's what she really wants to do because he's a mind reader and he knows these things. And Caroline agrees. 
Stefan takes Bonnie home to the cabin and now he is the one like being swallowed with guilt because Damon said that it was all Stefan's fault and everything that's happening to Damon is because Stefan forced him to turn 160 years ago. So now Stefan's being all emo again and Bonnie is like, no, we have to hold out hope. Enzo left those clues. Something's going on that they're not being able to tell us and we're gonna be able to save them, Stefan. Don't give up. And then once she goes inside, she has even more memories of Enzo reading the Odyssey to her, specifically the part about the sirens and how the sailors like plugged their ears with wax to get by her. Uh-oh. We go back to Damon and Enzo at an art gallery. Now they've gone after an artist who seems to be making his paintings with his victim's blood. Interesting story that we don't get to hear more about, but that guy dies. Damon in this moment reminds Enzo that the creature controlling them can see into their minds, implying that he switched his humanity off to keep his loved ones safe. And he knows that if Enzo doesn't do that, their loved ones are still in danger because the creature will go after them to get total control of Enzo and Damon. Stefan writes to Elena saying that he thinks there's one more piece of humanity left inside Damon. And then we see Damon dreaming about Elena and meeting her for the first time. So he is holding on to like his attachment and his love for Elena. And that's why even though his humanity is like technically flipped off, he's able to like sort of be himself and remain like a little bit in control. They sort of just like gave up on the humanity switch rules because this is the first time he's ever been able to do that. So Caroline comes into Stefan's room and says she wants to move in with him and he's thrilled and they kiss. Bonnie calls Rick because obviously he's like resonant professor. So she's like, Enzo left all these clues connecting back to stories about sirens. What does it mean? Rick explains that everybody has legends or stories about sirens. Normally they're connected to the devil and they do his bidding to lure people to hell. Then we see Enzo and Damon taking another victim to the water to be eaten and torn apart. And then this time, instead of scary clawed hands coming out of the water, it's a very pretty lady. Here she is. Oh no. Now Damon is going after sketchy businessmen. He takes one of them to see the siren lady. She's in the pool swimming around because she likes water, obviously. She gets the guy to come into the water with her and then kills him via her mind control singing powers. She also tells Damon that Enzo is definitely not as like involved as she would like him to be. So they need to figure that out and handle it. It's Caroline's turn to update Elena about Enzo leaving them clues and also her moving in with Stefan and how happy she is. Stefan is redecorating and updating the house for them. Very cute. Rick is settling into his new life at the old freaking Forbes house with the girls. Uh, Celine comes and is like, hey, I think you and Caroline accidentally overpaid me last week. And he's like, no, no, we didn't. We've given you a raise, you know, because she died in their living room. The siren wants to know how Enzo is able to fight her off so easily. Turns out our boy is really, really good at dealing with torture. Okay, we already knew that, but she was not prepared for how strong he is. So he's able to like fight her from getting into his head and he's still hiding memories from her. However, she insists and insists and insists until he finally gives up the name Sarah Nelson, which is not good. Caroline then finds women named Sarah Nelson that are being murdered in North Carolina. And that really worries Stefan because obviously the real Sarah Nelson is actually Sarah Salvatore and she also lives in North Carolina. So this is Enzo leaving them clues and warning them about what's coming. They race off to find her because Stefan is terrified that it's Damon who's like controlling this. And so Damon is gonna want to kill Sarah because he's killed all the other Salvatores. And this is when Bonnie in the back seat goes, wait a second, is this a story about Damon killing the pregnant lady? The worst thing he's ever done? Oh yes, I've heard this before. You know where she heard it before? I can't, I can't. Bonnie's also watching Caroline and Stefan hold hands in the front seat and she's clearly very upset about that because she misses Enzo. Damon is still trying to convince Enzo to just turn off his humanity to keep everybody safe, but Enzo refuses. Weirdly, again, Damon's really scared about what's going on and Enzo's like, I don't really understand how you feel that way if your humanity is off. And Damon's like, why don't you stop asking questions? 
So they snatch Sarah from her campus and then take her to a quiet place to talk, but thankfully she remembers Enzo. So she verveins Damon and she's like, what is going on? And Enzo's like, I'm so glad you remembered how to take care of yourself. Where's your passport? We gotta get you out of town. He takes her home. And then we see Caroline, Stefan, and Bonnie waiting for her to get back. When he sees Bonnie, he goes, hello, love, help. Georgie is still flirting with Rick, okay? She's also starting to get suspicious that he's making them do all this weird research, but he's talking about the potential fact that sirens might be real as if sirens are really real. And she's like, do you actually really believe in this stuff and he's like no you're helping me write a book behave little intern stop asking questions she freaks out when she sees a certain symbol doodled in the notebook that they're going through and like storms out of the room back at sarah's apartment enzo can't really look at bonnie because he's trying his hardest to like fight off any memories of her and not let like new emotions into his head because he doesn't want the siren to be able to read his thoughts she pushes him and I'm gonna be real, she pushes him a little too much, okay? Because he's trying his best to explain what's going on. And she's like, I don't understand. Do you wanna be with me or not? And he's like, girl, yes, of course I do. Why do you think I'm fighting this as hard as I am? But I don't want you to get hurt. Bonnie obviously wants him to run with her. And he's like, girl, I am running in all the ways I know how, okay? I'm leaving you clues. I've been leading you to us. I need your help, but I can't leave her. So Bonnie's like, oh, I understand. And she knocks him out and kidnaps him anyway. Since Bonnie left, Caroline is alone in the hallway and she gets attacked by Damon. He takes her ring and throws it out of the way so that she can't get out of the shadows. And then he goes inside to confront Sarah and Stefan. Sarah's mad at Stefan, which is a hot take. Okay, I get it that like he's been lightly controlling her life and like orchestrating everything, but he's been doing all of it to keep her safe. Okay, and he gave her a trust fund that she stopped using when she realized where the money was coming from because she was like, and I quote, I didn't wanna take money from murderers. Girl, in this economy? So Damon jumps into the apartment and attacks her and Stefan is like, please Damon, don't do this. He explains who she is and that she's Uncle Zach's kid and Damon somehow is able to fight the compulsion to kill her and stops himself. Rick goes after Georgie and has the nerve to be like, hey, listen, if you wanna be taken serious in academia, you have to leave the room with more decorum than that. What's wrong with you? And Georgie is like, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I've seen that symbol before when I died. And she tells him about how she had like a near death experience, or I guess, a death experience like she was in a car crash that she caused and she killed her best friend in the process and she died and was then brought back but while she was dead she knew she was in hell because it was like this horrible dark space where she was existing just like wallowing in self self-loathing and then uh, she saw the symbol and for some reason then she got that symbol tattooed on her to like mark herself and then when she was in jail for, you know, vehicular manslaughter for killing her best friend, she um, did research and now she basically has like a PhD in all things hell, which is so convenient. Good work, Georgie. Enzo wakes up in the back of Bonnie's car, absolutely freaking out that she took him. His nose starts bleeding, like he is frantic because he knows he needs to get back to the siren lady. So Bonnie reluctantly turns the car around. He explains that his mind is literally bonded to the siren lady's mind and she has like basically total control over him and he can't fight it any more than he already is. Bonnie is like, I can't lose you again. And he's like, Bonnie, you never lost me. Oh, it's so sweet. Stefan's trying to get Damon to let Sarah go. And he says like, maybe if he spares Sarah's life, then like the bad guy skill will tip in his favor and he'll be able to go to heaven with Elena. So it works. And Damon's like, okay, sure, run. Sarah goes running out of the apartment and straight into a knife that the siren lady is holding. Stefan tries to save her by breaking the siren lady's neck and then going to give Sarah his blood, but the siren lady is much tougher than that. So she stops him, makes him freeze in place, and then Sarah is bleeding out and he's unable to help her. And obviously Damon's also in under mind control. So this is not gonna go well. So the siren goes up to Damon and is like, who's Elena? She heard everything they were talking about. And now she knows for sure that he has a loyalty leak 
and he's a liability too, just like Enzo. So she goes into his memories and she basically reprograms them so that he thinks that she was there the night he was supposed to meet Elena. Yes, Sarah bleeds out on the floor in front of Stefan, who is unable to help her, and she dies, which just absolutely breaks his heart. Damon leaves, and Stefan tells Sybil that Damon is stronger than she thinks he is, and she's like, no, sweetie, he isn't. Bonnie finds Caroline out in the hallway and gets the stake out of her back, and then they proceed to have a fight because Caroline is upset that Bonnie broke off their plan and risked everything to try to save Enzo. And then ultimately it didn't even work and Enzo went back to Sybil anyway. So it was all pointless. And Bonnie's like, I'm sorry. Did you think that I like shouldn't have done that? And Caroline's like, yeah, kind of. And then that devolves into Caroline being like, I'm sorry, are you mad at me and Stefan for being happy in front of you? Like that's lame. And Bonnie is like, no, I'm not mad but I am hurt and it sucks watching you guys have everything that Enzo and I wanted and we were right on the brink of getting and then it was taken away from us and then Caroline very quickly is like oh hold on I'm reverting to bad habits and being a terrible friend Bonnie of course I hadn't even thought about how this would look to you and how it would make you feel I'm here for you I promise I'm gonna do everything in my power to get Enzo back and we're gonna make your happiness the most important thing and it's like are we I don't know if we will be doing that, okay? Because at this point, I have no trust in anyone. Bonnie is always being given the shortest stick and I'm sick of it. Rick comes home late and then ends up dumping on Celine everything that's been happening to him at work. She teases him about Georgie the intern and then Georgie calls and she's like, hey man, you know that artifact we've been trying to figure out? Well, I found this and it's a giant tuning fork, okay? like very large tuning fork with the same symbol carved into it. When Enzo comes home to Damon and the siren, Damon grabs Enzo by the heart to distract him with pain long enough for her to get into his head. We see the aftermath of Enzo asking Bonnie to like send him back, Bonnie freaking out on him again, and then Enzo kissing her. So unfortunately now Sybil knows about the Bonnie Bennett connection, which is deeply, deeply bad for everyone involved. When they get home, Stefan's not doing well. He like doesn't even really want to talk to Caroline about it. He's basically just reached this point of being like, my life is terrible. All of my relatives are dead. I was trying my best to keep Sarah alive and I couldn't even do it. So everything is awful and all of it sucks. What's the point of being here anymore? Caroline is like, um, Stefan, Damon's still here. He's not gone yet. And Stefan is like, yeah, except I've never seen him like this before, okay? But then he quickly changes the subject from all of that and is like, I have something I want to show you. He takes her to the room he's been renovating and explains that it's for the twins, okay? He's making them a bedroom. She's so excited and touched by the gesture. She starts looking at the furniture that he's picked out and when she opens one of the dresser drawers, she sees a freaking velvet box waiting for her. He says, oh yes, actually that's for you. I was hoping you'd wear it. No, I am not kidding you. He proposes right then and there. It's adorable. Caroline and Stefan are engaged. Happy second episode of season eight, wow. So remember how Sybil was messing with Damon's memories? We open with like a replay of the Elena car crash, only this time the sheriff says that all three of them died. So then Damon and Sybil are standing on the Wickery Bridge and she's like, oh, how sad. Did you know her? And he goes, no, I never got to meet her. Oh no. Enzo is once again fighting Sybil because she's trying to like force him to turn his humanity off and like be her little puppet and he's refusing even though now he knows that she knows the truth about everything. So it's like even though things are bad and they just keep getting worse he's still fighting back which is so sexy and it's even sexier once Sybil confirms that she's like thousands of years old okay and Enzo is one of like a handful of men that have ever fought against her. I love him. Enzo is insisting though that Bonnie doesn't actually mean anything to him and Sybil got it wrong. So Sybil's like, okay, that's fine. Damon, go kill Bonnie Bennett for me. And Damon's like, sure, I'd love to. 
Caroline wakes up in bed, but then instead of Stefan being there, it's Bonnie. <laughs> she's decorated the room and she wants to take Caroline dress shopping because she's so happy for her. This, after the fight that we just saw and Bonnie admitting that seeing them so happy makes her feel so lonely she wants to die, is heartbreaking, okay? Because Bonnie is like the most selfless character in the show. And the thing that makes me really sad is that I don't actually think Bonnie is that selfless. They just write her into this corner where she is constantly just doing everything possible for everybody else. And her own suffering is just like put on the back burner. Even an episode later, after she has just finally admitted how she feels, she's once again back to just like being the perfect best friend for Caroline and making sure Caroline has everything she needs. And I hate it. I really hate it. Watching it this time around really, really opened my eyes to all of this nonsense. And it just makes me so sad because I love Bonnie so much and I know what's coming. I'm so angry. Caroline even says, you don't have to fake being happy for me. Like we can wait a little bit. And, and Bonnie is like, no, I brought your wedding book that you made when we were kids because this is all you've ever wanted. And I want to celebrate you. Caroline gives in and is like, oh my God, I'm getting married. And it becomes like, everything's fine. And they're having a great afternoon. Good for them, I guess. Stefan goes to see Rick to make sure he's okay with the engagement and Rick is shockingly fine. The interns have come over to work from home since Rick needs to watch the girls and then he shows Stefan the tuning fork that is clearly a tuning fork, but no one seems to recognize it. Remember how mad I got when they didn't know what Viking runes looked like? That's how I feel about this tuning fork situation. I'm like, none of you have seen one of these before. No one? At the dress store to look at wedding dresses, Caroline is now in like full bride mode. She knows what she wants and she's ready to try everything. Also, Bonnie's gonna be her maid of honor. They even make a joke about how if Elena wasn't in the coffin, Elena would be maid of honor. Why would you admit that? They can both be your maid. You can have more than one. Then Damon shows up, he kills the dress assistant and then attacks Bonnie. So then Caroline distracts him by fighting him and Bonnie gets to run away. It's bad, he chases Bonnie through the shop. He's like tormenting her. So then Caroline like impales him through the wall and the girls get away. Sybil and Enzo show up and Enzo lets slip that Bonnie means a lot to Damon, or at least she used to before he flipped his switch. So now Sybil knows that connection is there. I'm like, Enzo, honey, you could have just not smiled. Why did you have to smile in this moment? Now that Sybil knows that Damon likes Bonnie, so he wasn't really trying to kill her, she inserts herself into all the memories of Bonnie too. So she's like rewiring his brain so that all he thinks about is Sybil and he's got no other connections to anybody else. Caroline gets Bonnie to the Salvatore house, but Stefan has been freaking childproofing. So the weapons are not where the weapons are supposed to be. Rick now has hours to help figure out what that weird tuning fork, that's definitely not a tuning fork. He's got to figure out what that is in hours instead of days so the interns get frantic. Damon calls Stefan saying that he needs help and he's clearly fighting some compulsion. And Stefan's like, all right, I'll be right there. Yikes. So when Caroline and Bonnie come back into the room, having found the crossbows, Sybil is waiting for them in the living room. Sybil wants to know what makes Bonnie so special that she's got Damon and Enzo wrapped around her little fingers. She hints that something must have happened in the prison world, but Bonnie's like, mm -mm, nope, I swear nothing happened. Everything is strictly platonic between me and Damon, which I think we all know is a little bit of a lie. She's holding on to that, okay? And I'm gonna let her have it. Georgie tells Rick that she thinks the weird weapon thing is definitely the devil's pitchfork. She's also like officially being like, hey man, uh, I understand that you think this is real and I would love more information so that I can properly help you since we're clearly not working on a book, okay? What are we doing here? He lies and says, oh, well, I'm gonna go use this weapon against a secret magical creature, bye. And then like blows it off so Georgie doesn't know if he was being serious or not, but he leaves her her home alone with his daughters and says that Celine will be back soon. Okay. Well, Stefan meets with Damon at the high school and Damon says that he literally 
cannot tell him what Sybil is planning, like her big plan. He knows it and he knows that he knows it, but when he tries to tell Stefan, the words come out scrambled and he can't say it. Then he shows Enzo tied up and verveined in the trunk of his car. Sybil tells the girls that she wants Bonnie to pick which one of the boys gets to live and stay Sybil's slave and which one of them gets to die a horrible death and end up in hell for all of eternity because she confirms that both the boys are homicidal murderers. So both of them will be going to hell when they die. And this is so funny to me because you know who else was a homicidal murderer? And Bonnie hated him, but I, that's fine. Bonnie is like, oh, I get it, you're jealous because both of these guys love me unconditionally, one as a friend and one as a boyfriend, and you are having to like trick them into being with you. And the only reason why they're staying with you is because you're using your magic on them. Which yes, that is exactly what's wrong with Sybil, but she's a mean girl. So she's like, you know what, Bonnie, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Damon and Enzo have currently been tasked with fighting to the death. So if you don't pick, one of them's just gonna kill each other anyway. Then we see the boys getting ready to fight each other but thankfully Stefan is there. The twins have the devil's pitchfork thing and they're fighting over it. Uh, we're gonna learn really quickly that Lizzie likes to take things from Josie, okay? That's, that's, a, that's a problem. Lizzie is always the one getting into trouble for taking things from Josie. So she's holding it and she's like, but daddy, I had it first. And Rick's like, I said, put it down. When they drop it, it goes ding, 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 ding on the floor and they start screaming and Rick starts screaming and Georgie comes running into the room and is like, did they cut themselves? I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have um, left it out. I didn't mean to blah, 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 blah. And the girls are like yelling and Rick is like, no, everybody's fine. Everything's okay. Everybody calm down. Bonnie and Caroline are in the car racing off to where the boys are fighting. It is pointed out that Sybil is not wearing a seatbelt that will come back in a few minutes. So prepare yourselves. So Damon brought Stefan along so that Stefan could help him fight Enzo. And Enzo's like, wonderful. So this is once again, not going to be a fair fight. I love this for us, Damon. At least you're consistent. Stefan is like, are you serious right now? Can't you fight this? Like if you kill Enzo, Bonnie will never forgive you. And Enzo is like, it's okay, Stefan. He doesn't know what he's doing. She's messed with his memories. It's not his fault. Stop being nice to him. Damon at this point is telling everybody that he doesn't care about anything anymore. He just doesn't want to go to hell because he saw it and he never wants to go there again. Right after this, Sybil is like explaining to the girls that hell is real and it doesn't matter again who dies, whichever boy dies, they will be going to hell and it will be awful for them. She goes into Caroline's mind and sees that Caroline thinks that Stefan will somehow get there and save everybody. But Sybil points out that Stefan will not actually fight against Damon, okay? So no matter what, if they just leave it to Stefan, Enzo's gonna die. She makes fun of Bonnie for also not picking Enzo because she doesn't wanna make the choice and pick between them. So Bonnie crashes the car and Sybil goes flying out of the front windshield because remember, she's not wearing a seatbelt. So the girls get away. The clock hits the allotted time and the boys start fighting to the death in the basement of the high school. I think they're in the basement. I don't know where they are, somewhere near the gym. But at least Stefan is there to keep them from killing each other because it is brutal, like right from the jump. Bonnie is freaking out in the car now because she knows that Sybil was right and no one is gonna pick Enzo over Damon. So what can she do? She doesn't have any powers anymore. She of course picks Enzo, but she can't actually help him. The fighting gets really crazy and it definitely looks like Enzo is going to win. And then Stefan interrupts like right on time and keeps Damon from dying. But then Caroline shows up and stops Stefan from killing Enzo. So Damon knocks Caroline out and Enzo knocks Stefan out. And now it's just the boys once again fighting. Damon reaches in and grabs Enzo's heart, but then Bonnie shows up and cries out and makes him stop. Sybil shows up and is like, yeah, Damon can't control it, dude. I told them to kill each other. So that's what they're gonna do. Unless of course you're ready to pick. So Bonnie frantically yells that she picks Enzo. Damon begs Bonnie not to do this to him. Like, bro, you got some nerve. She says that she knows that there must be some part of him that's still in there. So she knows it's gonna hurt her to live with the fact that she killed her best friend, but she can't let Enzo die because she loves him. Sybil is then like, yeah, so here's the thing. Damon is an asset to me and Enzo's always been a burden. So Bonnie, you actually made the wrong choice and I'm revoking what I said. She will let Damon kill Bonnie and then she'll kill Enzo unless Enzo turns off his humanity. 
Enzo obviously can't let Bonnie die, so he turns to her and says that she is the only one that can bring him back, and he's so sorry. He kisses her, and then we watch the light leave his eyes as he freaking turns his humanity off. Sybil's like, oh my god, this is great news. Now I'm actually going to take back that second deal I just made. And Damon, I still need you to kill Bonnie in 10 seconds. She starts counting down from 10. And Bonnie is like so shocked and appalled by what's just happened that she's like frozen and she can't run. And she doesn't start running until she gets to four. Of course, Damon catches her and slams her into a car. She's begging him to fight, but it's clear that at this point, Damon has given up. So he starts like listing off the different ways she she could choose to be killed and then Rick hits him with his car. He gets out of the car and bangs the tuning fork on the hood so then Sybil who has come outside with Enzo collapses in pain. Enzo goes to attack Rick but thankfully Stefan is there and he snaps Enzo's neck so nobody gets to Rick and the pitchfork is still going ding 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 and then Caroline shows up and kicks in Sybil's face. Georgie followed Rick so I don't know who's home with the kids and she saw it all happen. Damon stands up and he doesn't go after Bonnie, but they realize that his mind control is still not completely broken, even though Sybil is unconscious. He has been told to do something with her like big master plan, but remember he can't say what that is. So he just gets into his car and drives away. I really hope you guys like Sybil as a villain because she's so evil and also so annoying. Like I, I think I feel the way most people feel about Kai about her, but I think that's a good thing. I think we're, we're, you're supposed to hate her. I, for the life of me, can't remember how her arc pans out though. So if it ends up being dumb, I, we'll get there together, I guess. So yes, they lock Sybil up in a cell in the armory. Bonnie is taking Enzo to the cabin. Also, she's very upset with Stefan and tells him that she thinks it's ridiculous that he would have picked Damon, even though Damon has given up and is not fighting the mind control and Enzo was doing everything in his power to help them. Caroline is also gonna go to the cabin because she doesn't wanna leave Bonnie alone. Stefan apologizes for the fact that they were on opposite sides of the fight today, you know, their first day of being engaged. And she says that she hates it too and everything's gonna hopefully work out. Stefan writes to Elena to update her on everything while he's drinking at the grill. Rick shows up and they bond a little bit. Rick says that Damon is the closest he ever came to having a brother, and he believes that if Damon can be saved, it will of course be Stefan that can do it. But Stefan really has lost hope at this point, and he's like, I've never seen Damon this way before, and if the compulsion isn't stopped by Sybil being imprisoned, I don't know what we do. But then we see Sybil in the cell humming and singing, so of course the compulsion's not been broken. Like, what? We see more of Damon's memories from the prison world, except this time he's making pancakes for freaking Sybil instead of Bonnie. She's feeding on this like selfish fear of hell that he has and reminding him that the only way he can be totally connected to her is if they ruin all of his friendships because there's still people out there willing to fight for him and she needs to destroy all of that. So he does the body in the road trick on Tyler. And when I tell you Tyler looks so damn good in this scene, they brought him back for approximately five minutes. But man, the scruff, he looks so good. Tyler begs him to hold off and fight the compulsion. And Damon says he doesn't care. And he doesn't even know what's real anymore. Everything is so scrambled up in his mind that nothing makes sense. So Tyler's like, okay, then go ahead and kill me because if I'm gonna go out, I wanna go out just like this. I wanna be the last face you see. I wanna be the face that reminds you that you gave up and let yourself become a siren's little bitch. And then Damon starts to walk away and leave Tyler in the road. So do you think that Tyler quickly gets into his vehicle and drives away? No, why would that be what he does, okay? Of course he eggs Damon on a little bit more. So Damon gets angry and turns around and freaking attacks and kills Tyler. Okay, so we open up with a 750 BC flashback. There's two girls laying like on the bank of the ocean. Basically, we can't see a lot. So it's like trees behind them. They're on a shoreline. There's water. They're both really upset looking. 
They're telling the story of Arcadius. He was this guy from an ancient village who was a psychic. He was the first psychic. So he knew everybody's secrets and of course they turned on him. So they burned him at the stake. I guess he was probably also the first like witch burned at the stake. And while he was dying, he was able to realize the evil in the humans around him. The girls explain that in his death, he was able to get revenge on the evil men of the world. And then one day they will get their revenge too. And we zoom out and we realize they're on an island, presumably alone in the middle of the ocean. Stefan wakes up and explains to Caroline that him and Rick are gonna use the tuning fork to get information out of Sybil. Because remember, she is like, not chained up or anything, but she's locked in a cell at the armory. Georgie shows up, even though Rick told her not to come in. And she's like, why do you have a girl tied up in the basement or something? She is so next level suspicious. Rick also calls her a temptress, which they're trying to make siren references as much as they possibly can, but also he's a creep. Damon's at a mechanic shop looking for a guy named Pete. He kills a worker because the worker killed one of his ex-wives and so Damon is still sending people away to hell for the siren. The boys go after Sybil, but she won't tell them anything even though the tuning fork is hurting her. Also, the tuning fork messes with the twins, like the Saltzman twins, and that's something that they're trying to figure out but Sybil's like being really vague and weird about it. She explains though that Damon is still serving her because deep down he must want to. That's like one of the tricks, like you have to be willing which is why Enzo was able to fight. Sybil then starts telling the story of the little girls on that island. She says that she was a village girl who got cast out and she ended up like floating on a raft to this island, except she wasn't alone. There was another girl there. So then they like survived together. So yeah, she has a sister somewhere out in the world. And the boys are like, oh, excellent. This is terrible news. Y'all want to guess if it's Georgie or the nanny? I'll give you a second. Just go ahead. Leave your bets down below. We then cut abruptly to Georgie breaking into Rick's house. She steals a journal with the little hell symbol on it. And then Celine catches her and is like, I'm literally going to call Rick like right now. And Georgie's like, mm, don't do that. And they have like a standoff moment. Pete, the guy who owns the mechanic shop, gets to work, sees his dead like worker on the ground. Damon like barbecued him or he had him barbecue himself. It was really gross. Damon shows up and is like, surprise, Pete. If you think I'll just kill him for funsies, I'll also kill you for funsies. Don't scream. So Damon compels him and Pete is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're here for. I don't know Sybil. I have no connection to her. Sirens aren't real. What's wrong with you? Are you insane? Damon explains though that he's looking for a Maxwell, because that's Pete's last name, family heirloom that Pete may or may not have. And Pete's like, huh, maybe it's in the box of my dead grandma's stuff. Want to come to my house and look? And Damon's like, yes. So they go to do that. Sybil finds out the nanny's name is Celine, And she's like, wow, that's such a siren sounding name, isn't it? Except she's like being really freaking suspicious about it. So we can't tell at this point if it's Georgie or Celine. It's back and forth, back and forth. They won't let us figure it out. She tells him about how they were starving on the island. So they started calling out to ships to get the sailors to save them, except the island was surrounded by really sharp reefs. So the sailors kept crashing and then their provisions would wash up on the shore and the girls survived off of those. But it means they were killing a lot of people all the time. Sybil says she didn't want to kill, but her sister enjoyed it. Then she draws parallels between the two sisters and Damon and Stefan. And she's like, which one are you, Stefan? Damon and Pete are in the garage now looking for the heirloom. Damon suddenly notices his watch and takes it but his watch has vervain in it. So he's like, Pete, you lied to me. You weren't compelled earlier. And Pete's like, compelled? What do you mean? My son gave me that watch. He told me to wear it, so I've been wearing it. What are you talking about? So Damon is like, sorry, you're a liar, Pete. You gotta go. And he stabs him. And then freaking Matt Donovan shows up in the garage, shoots Damon in the back and like knocks him out. And then he looks over at Pete and goes, oh no, dad. This is actually like 10 out of 10 reveal because Pete and Matt, as you can see, look like father and son, but until it happens, you're like not, there's no warning because his name is Maxwell and Matt's name is Donovan. So we had no idea. Damon's knocked out, but Matt makes Pete drink Damon's blood so that he can be healed. Then he sends his dad away because he's gonna torture Damon to find out why he was attacking him. 
Celine calls Rick and is like, hey man, the sexy like intern girl that you like so much, she broke into the house and stole a journal. Is that normal behavior for her? Rick then sees Georgie in the armory and he's like, Celine, I gotta go, keep watch on my kids, okay? He hangs up, he follows Georgie and she tricks him and locks him into the vault. Stefan's playing good cop with Sybil and saying that they don't have to be enemies and they don't have to fight. And she's like, oh my God, just shut up and listen to my story. She keeps telling him about how the good sister believed that God would provide for them. So she convinced the evil sister that wanted to kill the sailors to not do that. But then the island was pretty much barren. So God wasn't providing. So the good sister's faith was like shaking. So the second, you know, evil sister hunted wild boar and was like, surprise, surprise, God did provide. Yay, all is well. Except no, she was bringing back like butchered dead sailor bodies. Yeah, there were never any provisions. They'd been eating people the whole time. There's clearly a lot of tension between the sisters in the story and Stefan is pushing back on that saying that they aren't like him and Damon because anything that's happened between them has been forgiven. He even says that like there's nothing Damon could do that would ever make him hate him completely and Celine is like I think you're overestimating your sibling and I've clearly underestimated mine and then Georgie shows up in the hallway and freaking vervains Stefan to get Sybil out. Stefan wakes up outside at um, the falls and he's like, how did I get here? What's going on? It's actually just Sybil screwing with him and it's not the falls. It's the island that the sisters were on. She was gonna like scramble his brain and kill him, but she says the boss has other plans and thinks that he deserves to know the whole truth. So she takes him to a cave where the evil sister was hiding the bodies after they'd been butchered. And so she explains that like for years, they were secretly cannibals and the good sister had no idea. And then finally she like found the cave and then hid in the cave waiting for the bad sister to show up to like know for sure if that's what was happening. And she says, I wish you could have seen the look on her face. Oh wait, you can. And freaking Celine walks into the cave. So Sybil is the good sister. Celine is the evil sister and Georgie is not a siren. Sybil then says that she tried to be good because this whole time he thought she was the evil sister, but no, turns out she is the one that was not willingly a cannibal. And then she turns to Stefan and basically implies that he is the evil brother, which is what I have been saying this whole time. Meanwhile, Matt is torturing Damon in the garage, but Damon flipped his switch. So he doesn't care and he's not scared and nothing is working. Matt is like, you know, you need to really care about this more because I will kill you, okay? All I wanna know is why you went after my dad, what's going on? Damon's like, oh, you don't wanna play games with me, Matt? Even if I tell you that I ripped out Tyler's throat and then locked him in the trunk of a car and left him at this very specific location that you would have to leave me here to go to, would you not wanna play then? Are you sure? What if I'm lying? What if I'm not lying though? And what if Tyler's bleeding out in the trunk of a car somewhere, hmm? Matt is like, there's no way that you would actually kill Tyler. Like no one would forgive you. Elena would never forgive you. And Damon is like, oh, haven't you heard? I'm done with Elena. She and I are over. I have a new girlfriend now. Matt hits him again and says that if Tyler is dead, Matt's gonna like kill him with his bare hands. And Damon's like, okay. Rick is trapped in the vault and he can't get to the secret room to get out because he can't block out his hearing and his sight. He can just blindfold himself. So he records a voice message to Caroline and Stefan so that he can talk to us in this scene and then digs in his ear with the knife that he has saying that vampire blood will heal him hopefully. We then cut to Celine with the kids now that we know she's the evil sister and she is tucking the twins into bed and tells them a bedtime story about Arcadius. While she's with them, Georgie calls and is like, hey, I locked Rick in the vault like you asked me to. Why did I do that? And Celine tells her to just pull over and wait and they'll talk soon. Damon wakes up in the garage again. He ends up knocking the iron shelves down on himself so that he can like bust the chair he's in and get out of his chains. He finds the heirloom, which is like a weird cannonball looking thing with like an ornate M carved in it for Maxwell. Stefan asks Sybil to just please let him go. She laughs and says, sure, I can do that, but you're not gonna even remember this when you wake up. Then he wakes up in the hallway and he says he remembers the story of the two sisters, but he no longer has memory of who the second siren is. 
she wants to tell him how to save Damon, but she's like, first you have to tell me which sister you are. And he says he's both, victim and monster. Okay, sure. She tells him she was wrong about him. He is worthy, so she can tell him the truth. That is that Sybil, once she found out they were secretly cannibals, she threw herself off the cliff so she would die to like atone for her sins. Obviously, Celine found her and was like, oh my god, no, this can't happen. I don't want to be alone on the island. My sister, ah. Cade showed up. He offered to save Sybil, saying that there would be a price to pay, and Celine agreed before, like, asking Sybil if it was okay. So they're immortal, but they have to eat people and stay cannibals in order to stay pretty. And Cade, in turn, collects the souls of the people they eat to keep them in hell. So if Stefan kills Cade, then Damon will be free. But Stefan is like, hell, the devil, this stuff doesn't exist. Like you're just making things up. And she's like, I'm sorry, but y'all have werewolves and vampires. And like, you don't believe the devil could be real. She explains that Cade basically created hell when he died as like a realm for himself, for him to like continue existing in. So it's not really like biblical hell, or like the biblical devil, it's just like a devil figure. She warns him that he is technically gonna go to hell too, so he should just stop fighting it. And he says that he deserves it, but Damon doesn't because he always is willing to be like, we made Damon the way he is and his choices are because of our actions and blah, blah, blah. Rick then climbs out of a sewer grate from the tunnel system like in front of the clock tower in Mystic Falls, which the armory is not anywhere near there. Matt and his dad are in the truck catching up on the whole like vampires are real nonsense and Pete's mind is blown. He says a glass of vervain every day keeps the vampires away, which is a thing that his grandma used to say when she made tea. So that's suspicious. It's funny that like they still manage to find a way to connect Matt's family to the vampire lore, because remember the Donovans aren't founders. So this whole time he's been like left out of that group, but now it's like, oh no, the Maxwells though, they were important. Matt then finds Tyler dead in the back of a trunk. It's awful, he has a complete breakdown. His dad like sits there and holds him and they just cry, it's, it's so sad. Also, we have to also look at Tyler's dead body, which is not fun for anybody. Celine meets with Georgie and Georgie's like, I did what you said, but your sister wouldn't come with me because she said, and I quote, piss off, I don't need your help. And Celine is like, oh, that's so annoying. Also, remember when you killed your friend in that car accident? Haha, ha, you're a murderer, enjoy hell. And then she freaking kills Georgie. But then Georgie wakes up and you're like, wait, what's happening? Is she supernatural? What's going on? How, does she escape death every time? What's going on? What is this? Except no, she's just a ghost. So she turns around and sees Celine eating her dead body, like in the middle of the street in the neighborhood. And then Georgie gets swept away on that like weird, scary wind thing that we haven't seen in way too long. Time for Tyler's funeral. Everybody get ready to cry. Stefan and Caroline are making breakfast when the phone rings and it's Matt. Enzo is tied up on the floor of the cabin, like literally like bound up on the floor. Bonnie is sitting on the couch when the phone rings and it's Matt. Rick's having a tea party with the girls when the phone rings and it's Matt. The phone tree thing is really painfully effective, okay? It's, it's really sad. It's like a long drawn out opening scene. It's super effective. We then cut to them all sitting together, kind of going over it and like adjusting to the fact that Tyler is dead. Kind of awkward after everything Matt did, but like they're coming together because their friend is gone. We get Rick writing to Elena to update her and he's like, I don't even know where to begin. Celine shows up and tells him she's happy to watch the kids for the day because she heard that their friend is gone and she knows he probably needs time to mourn. She admits to having a sister in this moment but says they're estranged. Then she goes to the girls, but now she's being all evil and nasty and like sneakily like glaring at Rick over his shoulder. Stefan is smashing bottles in the living room. Caroline's feeling really guilty about how she hasn't talked to Tyler in months. Stefan's trying to figure out what to do with Damon now and Caroline's like, I think the best thing to do is just mourn Tyler with the rest of us. 
Bonnie's trying to mourn, but Enzo's being really difficult over in the corner. He says her grief is making her even more beautiful. And if she'll just let him out, he'll take her away somewhere. They can go anywhere she wants. He's lying and like lying Enzo is so scary because there's an element of it where you're like, is he telling the truth? I don't like this. Like he's clearly lying, but also you could trust him, maybe. Bonnie cuts him free and he holds her face for a second before running away, except she is using a secret candle because her magic is not back yet. So she took an artifact from the armory and it's a candle that like spells the cabin so Enzo can't get out and she's the only one who can put the candle out. She tells him they may have lost Tyler, but she will not be losing him. Sybil's doing yoga in her cell. Rick shows up and bangs the tuning fork to ruin her day. He wants to know where Georgie is because he thinks that she's the second siren still. Also, he set up an intercom system and he's leaving Dorian in charge of banging the tuning fork like once every hour so that they can like keep Sybil from having her powers. Stefan, Matt, Caroline, and Rick carry Tyler's coffin to a grave. When they get there though, there are four empty graves like Doug and Damon is there waiting for them. Stefan breaks a shovel over his knee and threatens Damon. Damon's like, brother, just go ahead and pick a grave. I'm gonna bury all four of you. Matt draws his gun and then Damon grabs him by the throat and threatens Matt. And everybody's like, don't do this, Damon. And he's like, what, don't do this? And he force feeds Matt his blood so that like if he kills him, he'll come back as a vampire, which is Matt's nightmare as we know. Rick is really spooked by how unhinged Damon has become because remember up until this point, Rick's kind of been the one that's like, I think we could get him back. I think if we try hard enough, which is weird because just a few episodes ago in season seven, he was like, I never want to see you again. I like my life without you. Leave me alone. Caroline tells him to leave because nobody wants him there. And Damon's like, okay, good, excellent. I've cut my ties. Because remember, that was like one of the last things Sybil told him to do. So he was still trying to just follow her orders. Caroline then calls Bonnie and fills her in on the Damon situation and how terrible he's being. Bonnie says Enzo is resisting flipping his switch like crazy. She has tried everything. She has starved him. She's tortured him. She's tried to just like shove their memories down his throat and he's not having any of it. Caroline explains that she turned her switch back on because she faced her biggest fear and like overcame it. And that was basically like accepting how much her mom had loved her and knowing like she messed up in the end, but also she did deserve to be loved that much anyway. Enzo shows up again in the doorway because he can't get out she's like sitting on the porch and he says that no humanity Enzo is so much more fun than Enzo with his humanity on because Enzo with his humanity on is boring and lame he does end up convincing her to go to Tyler's funeral though to see her friends because he says like it's really cold that she didn't leave to go be with them Rick once again like I said is trying to convince the others that like Damon's still in there somewhere and they shouldn't give up on him and Stefan is like haha very funny we need to put him down Okay, we need to put him down because that's the only way that any of us are ever gonna be safe. Damon goes to see Sybil in her cell looking for answers. She explains that he clearly felt pain when he killed Tyler and he regretted it a little bit, which means he's not fully under Sybil's control. She tricks him by being like, if you turn your humanity back on and give up, then you're gonna like suffer more because it's gonna hurt so bad and there's no way you can be forgiven and you're still gonna go to hell. So why don't you just give up and give yourself over to me completely and be my little slave boy and that'll be more fun. Matt is boxing up Tyler's stuff already even though it's only been like a day or so because he, and I quote, is an expert at loss and he's really shitty to Pete about it because remember the reason why Pete wasn't in his life is because Pete left. His dad is sticking around though this time and like trying to help. He then goes through a box from the armory from Tyler and Tyler left like a letter to him and everything explaining the research he was currently doing and that was looking for the second siren named Celine. Rick explains to Dorian about the weird tunnel system situation and how, like I said, the armory's over here, Mystic Falls is way the frick over here, but somehow there's like a seven mile stretch directly through the mountains connecting them. So they need to figure out who made it because it's really old. They also file a missing person report at this point on Georgie because she's gone and nobody knows where she is. Celine took the girls to the carnival. She convinces one of the dudes working behind one of the game counters to give them a fish, even though they didn't win, except the fish is dead. And she's like, it's okay, girls. I have a secret plan for what we're gonna do with it, okay? And those little 
freaky siphon twins are like, yeah, okay, Miss Celine, that sounds fun. Woo, dead fish. Stefan finds out that Damon's going to the carnival and insists on going alone to put him down. Even though Caroline wants to come with him, he's like, I need to do this by myself because I don't want anybody else to get hurt. Enzo's getting drunk at the cabin when Bonnie comes home. He's put up the lights and he's playing the song that they first danced to because he's really being a jerk. She explains she knows what she's gonna do now. She's gonna use his biggest fear to convince him to come back to her. And then she starts pouring gasoline all over the cabin, including in front of the front door. He's like, oh, you think because one time I was in a cage while a room was on fire, that's my biggest fear? Sure. She's like, oh no, honey, it's not the fire. It's the fear of being abandoned. She literally looks him in the eyeballs and goes, I would rather burn alive than abandon you. And then she lights the room on fire. Is that not incredible? Queen behavior. Stefan gets to the carnival to see that there's been a gas leak and everybody's being evacuated. Damon's waiting for him and he explains that he needs help. He's conflicted because on one hand, he wants to serve Sybil and stay away from hell, but also he's afraid to turn his humanity switch back on, even though he also kind of wants to do that because he knows it's gonna hurt. Stefan's like, brother, if we can't feel, what's the point of being alive? And Damon is like, exactly, you get it. What is the point? Stefan begs him to come home and he's like, let us love you. Let me show you how to be happy again. We can help you, please just let us try. Damon's like, bro, I have literally ruined everything. No one's ever going to forgive me. How am I ever going to be happy again? Stefan says, I am your brother and I love you. Just come home. Damon says no. So Stefan tries to shoot him with Vervain, but Damon catches it and then they're going to get into a fight. But thankfully, Caroline Forbes shows up and she shoots Damon in the back with three different Vervain vials. So he goes to sleep. Bonnie is now choking because the cabin is on fire and there's a lot of smoke. Enzo's just standing in front of her, finishing his champagne, not bothered at all. She holds him and just keeps saying, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you over and over again as she starts to cough and pass out. He is fighting it and just like staring at her completely unaffected, like unbothered, no thoughts in his little head. She passes out from the smoke and like collapses down onto the ground. And finally he's like, oh my God, the room's on fire. Oh my God, Bonnie, Bonnie, no. And he's like, Bonnie, wake up, Bonnie, please. And he picks her up and like cradles her to his chest and he's crying. We see the moment where like his switch flips back on and he's back. But uh, yeah, the room's on fire. So Celine takes the girls to like a warehouse space where she's made a pyre for the fish. She explains to the girls how special people's souls go directly to Cade when they die. She draws out the hell symbol and then lets the girls siphon from her so that they can use the incendia spell to light the pyre on fire for the fish. Except yeah, they're definitely burning Georgie's body. So Bonnie wakes up outside, like in the grass in front of the cabin once she can breathe again. So I guess that implies that Enzo literally like threw her out the front door. <laughs> But yeah, now he's trapped in the doorway of the front door, like choking, because the fire's getting so bad that even he's affected now. He tells her, it's my time. You love me more than anyone, and that's enough. But she's like, no, absolutely not. And so she sprints back inside, quickly puts the candle out, and he's like, Bonnie! And he grabs her, and they run outside again. He's just holding her and he can't stop apologizing. And he's like, I almost killed you. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. But she's like, no, it's okay, stop. We're okay, look at me, I'm fine. We're gonna be okay now. She tells him that he's stuck with her forever because she's never leaving him. They kiss and it's one of my favorite scenes, like top three favorite scenes in the whole freaking show. They both look so lovely and the lighting from the fire is just like making both of them glow. Everything's like warm and orange toned. It's just, it's so good. It will be so hard for me to ever do a ranking of these damn episodes because I wanna put all the Bonnie episodes together but season eight sucks. Stefan chains Damon up, locks him in a coffin and says he's sorry. Dorian gets a call that Georgie is dead because he's somehow her emergency contact. So he rushes away to go help with that, but then leaves the tuning fork behind and doesn't use it on Sybil anymore. So she's full strength now, I guess. And she puts her hand on the window of the cell and starts cracking it with her magic, but also 
like someone's voice like echoes back to her and I don't know if it's supposed to be like her voice doing something weird or if there's like it's supposed to be like a weird higher power siren entity I don't know how that works I don't know what it's supposed to mean yet I don't remember because season eight sucks but the window explodes and Sybil gets out and she takes the tuning fork with her Stefan holds a second funeral for Tyler, this time at the carnival. Everyone says sweet things about him. It feels like slightly more forced just because we haven't seen Tyler in so long. So there's not like new memories to talk about, but it is really sweet when Matt talks about him because obviously they've been best friends the whole time. Stefan says they don't know what's coming, but the most important thing is that they can't forget about each other. Again, kind of implying that like they forgot about Tyler and that's kind of why it doesn't hit emotionally for me. He tells them though the story about bringing Elena to the Ferris wheel and how he told her to focus on the special moments and then he like lights up the carnival even though they're the only ones there and basically says they need to remember how to live and be happy. Rick finishes writing to Elena and says that he misses her and especially today on such a bad day they wish she could have been there with them but he thinks that she would be proud of the way they handled it. Stefan thanks Caroline for helping him even after he told her not to. She says she's going to be his wife and that means protecting him and saving him whenever he needs her to. She tells him that the last time they were at the carnival she was struggling because she was a new vampire and he told her that all she had to do was remember every day that she was strong enough so now she is going to remind him of that whenever he needs her to. Rick calls, to, Rick calls Celine to check on her and the girls and we can see her going through the bank records in the garage, so that's good. She says the girls are working on an arts and crafts project before bed. We cut to Sybil having a grave digger break Damon out of the coffin. He says that now he knows that feelings make him weak and he's done with them. He agrees to go with her saying he's all hers now and then she feeds him the grave digger. Caroline tells Matt that she's happy he's home again, despite everything, you know, that happened between them. She shows him some pictures of the girls. He sees Celine with them and he's like, whoa, 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 hold on. So Rick and Caroline race home, but Celine and the girls are gone. The arts and craft project they were working on is a freaking like kid drawing of Cade, Celine, Lizzie, and Josie. Oh my God. So Rick and Caroline call the cops to get them to go after the girls to help find them. Celine answers a call from Rick to tell him that the girls are safe with her, but she can't bring them back because she needs to save them. He tells her to just stop talking. He doesn't care about her plans, but he's going to find her. And when he does, he's going to kill her. It's very much giving like that scene from Taken where it's like, whoever you are, wherever you go, I will find you. He's like, you've been in my home and yet you still missed how far I'm willing to go for my kids? I'm not coming for you. I'm coming for them. But the longer you run, the more I'm going to hurt you. When I tell you she's like shitting her pants, like she's scared. <laughs> and then Sybil shows up and sits down at the table with Celine and the girls. Also Damon is there. Bonnie and Enzo wake up in bed together. I think they're back at her house now. Yes, because she makes a joke about him thinking her like high school bedroom is hot, which is, why do we have to make those jokes? It's enough. Caroline calls Bonnie and then Damon calls Enzo, except when he answers it's Sybil and she like does a weird psychic attack on him with her voice. Stefan wants to come help with the kids and Caroline's like, actually, no, 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 sit down. You're staying with Matt. She gives back the ring and basically says that like Damon is with them and if Damon gets in her way, she will kill him. So she can't be with Stefan right now because she doesn't want any distractions to like keep her from getting her children back. Which is fair, but also really awkward because Rick comes back in and is like, hey, we have a lead, um, we gotta go. And he can see Stefan like holding the ring in his hand. At the diner, things are equally terrible. Sybil's really mad at Celine because she was locked in the vault for like a really long time, even after Celine got out. But Celine is like, girl, I was working on it. Also, why do you think I want the twins? I'm planning to offer them to Cade so we can be free of our bargain. Bonnie brings Enzo to Matt and Stefan being like, somebody please help me. He is losing his mind. Cause at this point, Enzo's like, in and out of consciousness, like screaming, crying, throwing up from the pain. Stefan agrees to go inside Enzo's head because he's hopeful maybe he can like 
get Sybil out or like break the connection somehow. We get some horrible moments of seeing what Enzo is seeing in his head and it's basically like Sybil with him tied up on the um, torture table from Augustine and she's playing with him and like messing with him but she's not even trying to get him back or anything. She's just mad that he escaped so she's torturing him for fun basically to punish him. Thankfully though, Stefan sees the correct diner where the girls are at with Celine. At the diner, an Amber Alert comes out on all the phones and everybody's like, oh shit, they're like sitting right there. So Celine very quickly has to use her siren magic on like the whole room. Rick and Caroline, meanwhile, are like racing from diner to diner because they don't know the exact one they're at. Stefan just knew like the area. They get to the right one, but everyone is gone. Stefan is starting to get worried that him like going into Enzo's head to try to help is actually making it worse. And Rick is like, screw you, do whatever you need to do, turn his brain into oatmeal if it means getting my kids back. Celine explains to Damon the criteria you have to meet in order to work for Cade. You have to be supernatural and you have to go to him willingly. So she's basically planning on like slowly but surely brainwashing the girls until they're old enough to take the siren's place. They get stopped at a roadblock and then she's able to use her powers to trick the cop into thinking the back of the car is empty, but then Lizzie has a freak out, grabs Sybil and like siphons her slightly so that Sybil's arm like reverts back to like demon form. When the cop comes back and sees the girls, Sybil obviously kills him. Damon ends up driving, so I guess that implies that Celine and Sybil maybe dragged him away and killed him together. I don't know. Damon ends up in the driver's seat now, and he takes them to like a sketchy motel filled with like sketchy people. He wants to go ahead and just call Cade now because he has a better idea that will help all of them. Celine doesn't trust him, but Sybil's like, ooh, absolutely delicious. I love a change of plans. Stefan thankfully admits to Bonnie that messing with Enzo's head might be hurting him and he doesn't know what to do because he's conflicted, but she tells him to just do it and be as careful as he can. Rick and Caroline are right behind the girls and he's starting to get like more and more aggressive as the episode goes on and they haven't found them yet. At the hotel, Sybil warns Damon that whatever he's planning, you know, she's ready to hear it, but he needs to make sure that he doesn't make Cade feel used or taken advantage of. She then admits that she was sort of tricked into the bargain because she was dying. So like, she didn't want to be an immortal cannibal forever, but also she wanted to live. So she did agree to it, but it was like extenuating circumstances. He trusts her enough that he's like, I'm gonna tell you my secret plan. And she's like, ooh, go ahead, I can multitask because she's still half in Enzo's head torturing him. Inside his mind again, we see that he's begging her to just tell him where the kids are and then just go ahead and kill him. And she's like, oh, sweetie, I'm already killing you because at this point, like his brain is melting and he's starting to bleed from his nose and his eyes and stuff. It's getting worse and worse. Stefan though bursts into the room they're in and catches her and like stops her from hurting Enzo. She says if Stefan will come to where they are alone and listen to Damon's offer, she'll let Enzo go. Bonnie is waiting for Enzo to wake up. She is so distraught because they keep getting like so close to happiness and peace and then it just keeps getting ripped away from them and I'm so sorry Miss Bennett but it is gonna keep happening. Matt assures her that she's not gonna lose Enzo because he's a tough bastard okay and he already broke out of Sybil's hold once he can do it again. Enzo whispers from the couch between them I'm not sure which one of you to kiss first and then Bonnie just throws herself into his arms and Matt's just sitting there smiling at them. Rick and Caroline get to the hotel Stefan told them to go to, but it's the wrong hotel. Meanwhile, Stefan pulls up to the real one, but it's also kind of weirdly quiet and deserted. Rick blows up at Caroline. He says that when they get back to town with the girls, he's taking them away from all of the vampires because darkness follows all of them, and he means Caroline too. He says, my kids should never have been involved in this life from the beginning. She says, our kids? And he goes, no, Caroline, my kids. They're my kids, mine and Joe's. You, mm. Celine has the twins light the pool on fire at the sketchy hotel. Sybil sirened the guests to like attack Stefan because she wants him killing people so he's vulnerable and scared and like really dark. We cut to Stefan like massacring the guests in the hallway to get to wherever Damon is. 
Damon catches him though and realizes that Stefan hasn't actually been killing anybody. He's just been like aggressively knocking them out. Cade isn't answering and Celine's kind of freaking out, but then all of a sudden the pool fire goes out and he does show up. He's a handsome, handsome man in a beautiful gray suit, okay? But he's so evil. After getting wrecked by the people in the hallway, Stefan is fighting like the very last guy. He does end up killing him to save himself, but he's really upset about it. Damon is like, bro, don't feel bad, okay? You don't need to feel guilty anymore. I have a get out of jail free card for both of us. He agrees to take Stefan to see the girls, but only if Stefan agrees to his terms. Do you see where this is going? Cade is toying with Celine and Sybil, but he does say he's intrigued by the plan to take the twins. Sybil steps in and is like, up, 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 I have an even better deal. And she pitches the idea of giving him two immortal vampire brothers instead of the little tiny baby twins. Stefan runs in saying, yes, I agree, as long as you let the girls go. Rick and Caroline show up to where the girls are. They each hold one of them. And then Stefan comes out and he just looks so upset. Enzo is awake now and feeling better, but once again, Bonnie is having a really hard time trusting it because everything keeps going wrong. She tells him she appreciates how hard he fought to come back to her and he says he always will. He explains to her that the reason why he's always been so good at like resisting torture and surviving is because this whole time, like his whole life from before he was immortal and everything, he's always felt like the higher power, I, th I think he says God, I think Enzo is slightly religious, but he says that whoever's in charge, like he knew that they weren't gonna let him suffer and suffer and suffer and never fall in love. So literally the idea of finding Bonnie one day and falling in love with her and experiencing true love is what kept him going all these years. She's like, oh, are you calling me an angel? And he goes, Bonnie Bennett, you're the entire world. Oh my God. Rick is having the armory doctors look at the girls to make sure they're okay before he takes them home in the morning. He apologizes to Caroline for being terrible, but she says he's right. You know, genetically the girls are Joes, but Caroline is the one that gave birth to them and raised them and loved them. And she was just as upset as Rick was when they disappeared. So he better not ever throw it in her face again. He's like, you're right, I'm sorry. But then she says that he was also right. And for whatever reason, darkness is following her right now. So the girls do need to go with him far away where they can't see Caroline anymore. Stefan is sitting outside the armory holding the ring. Caroline comes to him and says what she did to him wasn't fair. She says they're partners and they need to make these kind of decisions together. She puts the ring back on and tells him that she loves him. Also though she has a really bad feeling about what he had to do to get the girls back. He takes her hand and tells her that he gave Damon what Damon had promised him, which is an eternity of misery. He explains he agreed to give his soul to Cade and basically kill people for Cade to have in hell forever. She's like, no, there's gotta be a way out. You promised me a June wedding, okay? Well, what the heck, our day is supposed to be in June. No, and he's like, I'm so sorry, honey, but our day is gonna have to be tomorrow because part of my negotiation was saying that I could spend my last 24 hours with you. So they're gonna get married the next day. Celine is really mad at Sybil for not telling her about that new deal to trade the boys instead. Sybil says it was a lot of fun to watch Celine embarrass herself. Also, Sybil cut Celine out of the agreement. So I think that that means that Celine still works with Cade, or at least Celine is still gonna go to hell one day, but Sybil isn't. She says she negotiated like keeping her powers and her immortality. So something's funky. She even says like the games aren't over yet. So we cut to Matt and Rick and Rick says he's starting to believe that Matt is one of the only sane voices amongst them. Matt is like, yeah, but you know, dude, I can only take seeing my friends suffer so much. Sometimes it just makes me want to fight back. Then we see Damon at the grill getting drunk. He gets shot in the back by Matt. And then when he turns on Matt, Rick shows up and also shoots him in the back. Rick says to him, glad you're here. I've been wanting to kill somebody all day. Then he just like full on attacks Damon. He says he can't have the girls in danger and as long as Damon is alive, they will be. 
Damon is like, dude, your timing is hilarious. I just made the deal of a lifetime. Well, the deal of several lifetimes, hopefully. But Rick is like in a blind rage and he just starts like pounding Damon's face. It gets to a point where Matt has to stop him and be like, Rick, he's had enough, stop. Rick says, this is for Tyler and then stakes Damon in the heart. And if you know what's coming in Legacies, I wish Rick wasn't the one to say it because I forgot that he says this and it makes what he does in Legacies just like this much less effective for me now because that moment, that moment is so important to me and y'all are gonna be shocked that I love it as much as I do when we get to it, okay? But I, I do love it. I wish Matt had said it though. I wish Rick had the steak and Matt had said, this is for Tyler. Anyway, Rick brings the steak down freaking stabs Damon in the heart and we just watch as Damon slowly desiccates and dies. But I mean, I think you can see where this is going. So is anybody even upset right now? It's not even really a cliffhanger. Okay, so we open episode seven with a 1917 flashback of Monterey on Christmas Eve. Now, um. Do you remember who was in Monterey around that time? Like, I sure hope we don't run into any rippers, but um, that's exactly what's happening. So one of the villages that Stefan massacred, he freaking massacred them on Christmas Eve. Just it's such a good guy, that Stefan Salvatore. <laughs> then we hard cut to Stefan writing in his journal to Elena, it is still Christmas Eve. He's trying to like, decorate the house and get everything ready for Caroline so that they can have like one final day together since he's about to give in to his bargain with Cade and disappear. Caroline wakes up and apparently they had agreed to cancel Christmas dinner but she's been planning it because she's Caroline Forbes and he's like no honey I'm already cooking we're having everybody over we're gonna enjoy our family one last time before I have to go. The house is gorgeous like I cannot stress that enough it is so beautiful when it's decorated. I. Mm, it's my favorite time of year is Christmas at the Salvatores. It's so pretty. Also, Caroline and Stefan have like peak couple energy right now. Like they're so cute once they get together. The twins show up and Rick is kind of like, oh yeah, we can't stay long because remember him and Matt killed Damon and they have no idea about Damon's bargain and everything. So as far as Rick knows, Damon's dead and Stefan's gonna find out and be pissed. But then Damon strolls in with Sybil on his arm and he's like, Merry Christmas, we're here for the party. We cut to Bonnie and Enzo in bed opening presents. He gave her like a little figurine of the Eiffel Tower and she's like, oh my God, it's such a pretty paperweight. And he's like, you silly little witch, I'm taking you to Paris. Shut the, shut up, it's so cute. They've got the best like improv little moments. So even when the camera is not like fully focused on them, they're just being so adorable in the scenes. It's the way that they made their relationship and all the effort and time they put into it. It's one of my Roman empires. Like it's so good. Caroline calls and is actually so considerate by being like, Sybil's in my house. Enzo cannot come here. You guys cannot come. So then Enzo is like, Sybil, probably didn't bring the tuning fork with her. It'd be a shame if someone was to find out where she's living and go steal the tuning fork. So Caroline is like, excellent idea, Enzo. Let me get her drunk and then I'll find out that information and you guys can go get it. Out in the living room, Stefan's being mean and Sybil tells him to put away his umbrella because she doesn't need his shade. Caroline's now being ultra nice, but I'm gonna be real with you, this is the first time she's done it in like a not so suspicious way. Normally we can tell when Caroline's up to something and it's like real sketch. She's doing pretty good, okay? She's, she's doing a decent job here. Damon steals Stefan away and he explains what Rick and Matt did to him and how that kind of hurt his feelings. But he says the good news was when he was in hell, he got to talk to Cade. Then he asks Stefan if Stefan wants to go see Cade and Stefan's like, no, I actually just want to enjoy my final 24 hours with my fiance. And Damon's like, oh, turns out he wants to see you though. And so he stabs Stefan, killing him with like a wooden star for the top of the tree. So Stefan wakes up in like a weird version of the afterlife. It's kind of like a halfway house behind the veil. So he's in the Salvatore house, 
but he's not. Nobody can see him except for Cade. Cade shows up and wants to talk about their deal. Stefan uses like a Hail Mary moment to be like, can you just let me out of it? Because clearly I'm the wrong person for this. And Cade is like, no, actually you're perfect. And I will show you why. We cut to Sybil, pretty drunk at this point, like carving up the turkey for Caroline. And it is so gross because she's a cannibal and it's, ugh, I hate it. I'm a vegetarian. I think we've talked about that a couple times, but these scenes are like my nightmare. She spills the beans on where they live now. She's basically been like stealing houses from rich men. So Caroline runs off and quickly tells Bonnie and Enzo. They talk a little bit about how they wish Elena was there with them because if Elena was there, Damon wouldn't be acting like this. And Caroline gets an idea. Caroline then finds Stefan's body and she's obviously freaked out seeing him like that because he's like fully desiccated and stuff. Damon shows up and explains what he did and that Cade just wanted to talk to Stefan and he'll wake up in a little bit, it's not a big deal. He also gets the wooden star that has Stefan's blood on it and like messes with her with it, like puts it on her chest and stuff and makes her hold it. Like he's just the worst right now. Rick's hiding the girls in their room and it hit me for the first time that this room is the room they're in in Legacies. And that meant so much to me because I forgot Stefan made the room for them because it's like a double room. It's like huge. He knocked down a wall to make a bigger space. I can't. That's so cute. Also, Rick and Caroline have been having issues because the girls are like super attached to Celine and they keep asking for her and they don't know how to express to them the danger that Celine put them in. Peter and Matt show up for dinner and this is the iconic moment where Caroline looks at everybody and is like, well, Damon's alive, as you can see. Bonnie and Enzo are late and Stefan's dead. Merry Christmas, I've got gifts. Cade has Stefan in like a weird memory world and he's showing him the Monterey Village from Christmas. He says nothing but pure evil could produce something like this. And Stefan is like, I don't know what you're talking about, man, because I was not here on Christmas. Like even at my worst, I would not do that. Caroline passes out gifts and even had one for Sybil ready. And then she gives um, a little tiny box to Damon. She says that there's gonna be a version of him in the future that asks for her forgiveness. And she says, this gift is for that person. Damon is like, yeah, okay, whatever. And he just puts the gift away in his pocket and then says that he's there to kill somebody and that's his Christmas present. Bonnie and Enzo break into the house where Sybil is staying with Damon, but Enzo can't get in because he's a vampire. So Bonnie gets inside and finds a family like having Christmas still in the house and Celine is there. She's got the tuning fork and she's like, I'll give it to you, but first Bonnie, give me your phone. Back at dinner, Damon is explaining his whole plan and how he just needs to pick the most evil person in the room. Right now it's just him, Caroline, Sybil, Matt and Peter because everybody else is either late or dead. Damon teases Matt about the fact that he killed Penny, which is such a low blow and Matt almost like vaults over the table, but Caroline stops him because she is desperately trying to keep the peace. Sybil turns the attention to Peter and so they start pestering him for like reasons why he might be the choice. Celine calls Rick on Bonnie's phone and explains that she put like a psychic link between her and the twins and she wants to remove it but Rick will have to bring them to her for that to happen. Rick tells her to drop dead. So we then see Celine making a list of all the people she's killed in reverse chronological order. So like the last person on the list is Georgie. She's trying desperately to convince everybody that she's not evil and she's never been completely evil. And she's been trying to escape for like centuries, but girl, you are the one that resorted to cannibalism first. So I have a hard time believing anything you say. Enzo is like, where'd you pick up the little name habit? And this is where things get really annoying for me. Cause yeah, she got it from Stefan when she saw him in Monterey on Christmas, 1917. So we go back to Stefan and Cade and now he's looking at his old self with a beard, which was a jump scare. We see him scribbling the names of his victims on the wall. And then Celine comes in and sings to him. She tells him that Cade has claimed his soul, which Cade already said had happened because he witnessed Stefan doing this and was like, I want that man for my personal army immediately. So Celine went after him. She was gonna eat him and send him to hell. And she looked into his mind and she was like, dang, dude, you definitely deserve to die. You're a monster. What is wrong with you? But also she saw that he was innocent and he was only turned into a monster because of things that were done to him. And listen, I know I feel similarly about a certain someone, 
I don't think this is a good way to describe Stefan's behavior. Like, it is not the same. So yes, yeah, Celine chose to spare him in that moment instead of sending him to Cade right then because she realized that she was the same way. And so she like saw herself in Stefan and she was tired of doing Cade's bidding. So now in the present, Cade is like, you, you are work. So now in the present, Cade is like, do you see what I mean? Like you're an elite killing machine now, you're perfect. And Stefan is like, um, not so much because in order to be that killing machine, he will have to turn his humanity off. I hope that doesn't happen. Celine is now crying with Bonnie and Enzo. And again, I have such a hard time feeling empathy for her. We watched her eat Georgie's dead body. Like, but she says she always wanted to be mortal. And now because of her sister and that annoying little loophole in the plan, when she dies, she's just gonna go to hell and Cade will be able to torture her forever. So she says that redemption is the only way out and she gives them the tuning fork, begging them to convince Rick to bring the girls to her so that she can like sever the psychic bond and let them go. Rick joins dinner and tells Damon that the worst thing he ever did was not make sure Damon was dead. Peter's worst thing was that he lied on his tax forms a few times and Damon's like, that's so lame. I wanna know the truth about why you deserted your family. And Peter says that he was ashamed because um, Kelly had gotten pregnant again and they were poor and he didn't feel like he could support them because he was a plumber. So he just ran away to start over somewhere else and just forget about his family and basically leave the weight of taking care of them behind. Which as you can imagine, is devastating news for Matt. Cade shows Stefan his first meeting with Elena and basically says that the right thing to do would have been to let Elena go, which funnily enough is exactly how Ian feels about all of this. He thinks that <laughs> it was a horror show because she never should have ended up with Stefan or Damon. There should have been no vampires and they should have left the poor human girl alone. So yeah, according to Cade, the only way to keep Elena safe would have been never meeting her at all. And Stefan's like, oh, Sybil takes Peter away and is like healing the cut on his face because Damon like attacked him with a knife, but nobody ended up dying at dinner. So that was good. She says she's looking for that artifact and she's pretty sure Damon found it, but she's not sure. And does Peter still have it because she wants it? Peter says he has no idea what she's talking about. So she looks into his mind for herself. And then Bonnie and Enzo run in. He uses the tuning fork and Bonnie freaks out along with Sybil. And then Damon rushes in and gets Sybil out of there. Stefan's mad at Cade now and he says that Cade took too much of his time because he was supposed to spend the whole day with Caroline and he's literally been in this weird hellscape with Cade for hours at this point. Cade tells him that if Stefan doesn't fulfill the bargain like completely and to the best of his abilities, he'll just wait it out until the twins are of age and then he'll take them anyway. So Stefan says that as a ripper, he's one of a kind and Cade will have never had a killer like him before. He says he'll agree to turn his humanity off for a short time, as long as at the end of it, Cade will let him and Damon go. Cade is like, I'll agree to a year because I think that at the end of that year, you're gonna wanna stay forever. Sybil and Damon are walking through downtown together and she's all pleased that he saved her. And she's basically like implying that he has a heart for her and he's growing to really like her and he's not denying it. He gives her the Christmas present from Caroline and it's Elena's freaking necklace. The second he's holding it, we can tell that something happens but he still puts it on Sybil and she goes to kiss him and then he rips out her heart, puts her like up on a bench takes the necklace from her and just sets her heart down and walks away. We are back. We are so back. Merry Christmas. Enzo and Bonnie are in the car with the tuning fork. She is thinking that maybe there's some connection between like the sirens and the witches because they all have psychic abilities. Truth. Good job, Bonnie. You figured it out. She makes a joke about getting him t-shirts for Christmas while he's taking her to Paris. And he's like, babe, you are the best Christmas present of all help. Caroline is waiting beside Stefan when he finally wakes up. 
He's asking for Damon, but she says that everybody's gone. He grabs her and takes her downstairs so they can kiss under the mistletoe. And then he begs her to just not ask questions about what he had to agree to because they have seven minutes left and he just wants to finally enjoy Christmas with her. Rick agrees to meet with Celine, but they do it at the Salvatore house. She does get to like have a final goodbye with the girls and she basically tells them that they've got to do something together, like one final spell, and then they're gonna forget about her, but it's okay okay because they have so many people that love them. Matt drives Peter home and it is like stupid awkward now between the two of them. Things were going so well. All of that's ruined. Damon drives up on Stefan walking his way out of town and they get into the car together. Damon wants him to go ahead and flip his humanity switch to make things easier. As they drive out of town, Damon turns on the radio and Christmas music is playing. We watch Stefan flip his switch and so he's got like his evil ripper eyes and his evil ripper smile and we are all in trouble. Okay, so now we're in nightmare mode because Stefan is a ripper once again, and we know how this goes. They're at an anger management meeting. They're basically trying to like pick people to send to Cade. They end up picking the main guy, like the group leader, because he says that he doesn't care about anybody in the room. He would let any of them die to save himself. But then when Damon stops killing him, Stefan has like killed and eaten everyone else in the room. But he's being really like careful and clean about it because he says that one of his triggers is like watching the blood drip down. So he's like making sure the wounds are really clean so that he doesn't have to worry about anything. Damon is like clearly concerned about him and he's like, this is an excellent plan, brother. I'm sure nothing will go wrong. Caroline is journaling after three weeks to update Elena. Bonnie and Enzo are in Paris. He took her to Paris for like a whole month. I love that man. Rick is off hiding with the girls, which was exactly what he said he was gonna do. Caroline is back in Mystic Falls for the day. She's at the high school because she's been like asked to do an assignment on Founders Day for her job because she's a journalist. She calls Matt and they're gonna meet up for lunch, but he is currently going back to the armory to drop off that box of Tyler's stuff. At the armory, Matt meets up with Dorian. Dorian now knows everything, so he is part of the inner circle. We learn the tuning fork is referred to as the staff of Arcadius in like old writings and stuff because it was made to control Cade. Dorian brought in Peter, not knowing he was Matt's dad, because the blacksmiths behind the tuning fork are the freaking Maxwells. Sybil is now the history teacher at Mystic Falls and she is like freaking controlling all the students in her class. She threatens to kill all of them if Caroline tries to attack her. She is the reason why Caroline is here. Like she tricked her boss into sending her on this assignment and everything. So something is going on. She wants to give Caroline a history lesson. Stefan and Damon are hunting for more victims. Stefan picks out a doctor who's like helping um, an older woman at the cafe that they're at. She looks shockingly like Elena. And he's like, that's the one I wanna test next. We're gonna kill her. Damon's like, cool, whatever you wanna do, brother. I don't care, but he's holding Elena's necklace in his pocket and he's not being discreet about it. So Stefan is like clearly suspicious and he verbains Damon to knock him out and then goes like, help, help, we need a doctor. Damon wakes up in the hospital room. Stefan's got him hooked up to a vervain IV to keep him weak. Been researching the doctor. Her name is Tara and her parents were killed in a hit and run. They were organ donors, so that's why she became a doctor and he's thinking about going after her support group. He's just trying to figure out a way to get her to potentially turn evil, even though Damon thinks it's a stupid plan and it's never gonna work. Dory and Matt and Peter talk about Celine and the blacksmiths. Peter says he has no idea what the weird metal ball thing could be. He doesn't know where it is, but obviously we know Damon already has it. Peter, looking at all the notes and things, realizes, wait, hold on. This is the bell that our family made for the town originally. Stefan tries to get close to Tara by explaining that Damon is pretty evil and maybe this is like punishment, like he's supposed to die. He's like, my brother's an organ donor. If he dies, he could save other people. Tara says she has to remain impartial because she's a doctor and she swore an oath. Stefan compels her though, to believe that Damon is the one that killed her parents. Damon thinks that she's gonna prove to be good and Stefan's like, we'll see about that. And then he gives him even more vervain to like induce like a medical emergency on the machines. In class, Sybil gives Caroline a lesson on the founding families and how they lied about founding the town because when they got here and set down roots in Mystic Falls, there were already people living here and we know it's the witches. 
they go out to the old haunted witch house and the students start setting up like little pyres around the front yard where the hundred witches were burned. Sybil says that actually there was more going on and it wasn't just like they were burned for no reason. They like gave over some of their power for the bell that the Maxwells created. Where is that bell now? You might be asking, not the freaking clock tower where it should be. Peter threw it off of Wickery Bridge and Sybil knows that because she saw it in his head. So she makes the kids like tie themselves up and pour gasoline on each other and then poor little Violet Fell is just standing there with a lit torch waiting for the order to burn all of her friends. In the hospital, Damon's dying and Tara is faced with the choice of like, okay, do I save him or do I let him go? And she's struggling. Stefan's trying to convince her that if Damon dies, at least other people could live because they could use his organs. He basically tells her to like follow her instincts and do what she thinks is right. And she asks him to leave. Once she's alone with Damon, he begs her. He can't compel her right now because he's too weak, but he begs her to like do the right thing and let him go and let him seek redemption on his own. She says she can't forgive him and shuts the blinds and freaking injects him with a medicine that kills him. Stefan hears the machines beep and he hears Tara call out Damon's time of death and then he finds Elena's necklace in Damon's things and he's like, mm, I knew it. Caroline calls Matt to get information about the bell and he tells her that they actually found it and it's been with like Sheriff Forbes's things all this time because she found it when they dredged the lake to get Elena's parents out of the water. So now Sybil and Caroline are heading to Caroline's house to look in the garage and find that bell and Matt and Peter are going to the students to try to help them. Peter explains that he got rid of the bell because they always used to like display it on Founders Day during the parade and it annoyed him that the founding families had basically like pushed the Maxwells out of the history and acted like they never existed because they didn't exist until this season. Like it's a little late in the game for me to feel pity for Matt Donovan, okay, but thanks for playing. Stefan stops Tara outside the hospital and says that basically the whole thing he was doing was a test to see where her morals lie and she failed and then Damon strolls up and obviously he's alive. So she's terrified. Damon wants to give her a second chance and Stefan calls BS and basically says like, I know you're thinking about Elena. I know she reminds you of Elena. We have to nip this in the butt right now. Dorian calls Matt to tell him that the tuning fork, the bell and the striker, which is what that little metal ball is, all go together and make like one bell. Matt and Peter then frantically start untying the kids. Caroline and Sybil are in the garage going through Liz's things. Caroline finds the spot where the box should be, but there's a note instead from Celine saying like, sorry, sissy, I got here first, oops. So Sybil has a little sister freak out and is basically like, okay, I'm gonna kill some high schoolers. Thankfully though, Matt and Peter have gotten everybody untied except for the last group. So Violet lights the fire and it starts like, quickly catching all the pyres on fire, but they get the last kids out just in time. Stefan and Damon are back on the road. Stefan's picking on him about being weighed down by the past. So Damon takes the necklace and throws it out the window. But Tara is still alive in the back seat. And Stefan's like, I think you're forgetting the most important thing. So Damon quickly pulls over, drags Tara out and starts killing her. And it is so iconic because there's music swelling and it's all intense and Tara's screaming, but we can't hear her screams. And Stefan's just like watching from the cracked car window in the corner of the shot. It's cinema. Matt and Peter are still fighting. Peter is trying to explain to Matt and like basically begging him to be like, don't you see that I feel guilty about this and this is my biggest mistake ever and now we've been giving a second chance and I wish you would just let me enjoy being with you and we could be a family again, finally. But Matt is pissed that he had a legacy in the town all along and Peter kept him from ever finding that out. Sybil is still throwing a tantrum in the garage. When Caroline goes to just kill her and be done with it, Sybil is like, oh, so I actually made a psychic link of my own between myself and your daughters. So if you try to hurt me, I'll just kill them. Damon circles back to find the necklace. He says he feels better when he holds it, but he doesn't really completely understand why. He opens up to like the trash collector dude that he's talking to on the side of the road about how Stefan is like seconds away from losing it. And he's really concerned for him. Damon finds the necklace and then spares the guy because he was so nice to him and like talked Damon through his feelings. So something's up, he's being fishy. Stefan meanwhile is back at the hospital and he's like fixating on a really pretty nurse. 
we see him killing her in the hallway and he's struggling with the whole like clean the wounds keep from being a ripper and then damon comes to the hospital to pick him up and finds him in the middle of a massacre having killed like an entire floor of staff and patients and everybody in the hospital he's gone full and total black-eyed ripper it is really bad so now Stefan is full ripper mode, killing people while they travel along looking for victims. Damon's distracted again because of the necklace. He's also worried about how crazy Stefan is becoming. Sybil calls looking for him and sounding upset. She asks him to come back to Mystic Falls to give her the striker. And even though Stefan wants him to say no, Damon can't. So they go back to her anyway. Bonnie comes back from Paris and gives Caroline a gift to open once Stefan's come home because it's like a wedding gift. Enzo gave Bonnie a gorgeous necklace filled with his blood as like a symbol of the fact that he will love her forever. And Bonnie is like, don't worry, I'm not turning into a vampire anytime soon. And Caroline's like, um, you mean like ever, right? Because you don't want to be a vampire. Which like, Miss Girl, her magic is gone, okay? Let her do what she needs to do. Let her cook. This is her choice to make. And if she wants to screw Elena over and become a vampire, I'm not going to stop her. It's not going to be me stopping her. <laughs> Celine shows up while the two of them are out, like, catching up at the grill. And she basically wants to make a deal with them first to make the bell. She's planning to help kill Sybil because she thinks it will help her with her redemption arc. The girls leave, though, without agreeing to it, and they head to the Miss Mystic Falls pageant which I don't know about you guys, but I've missed the events. We're bringing them back this season because we're getting to the end. Matt and Dorian are also trying to figure out the bell situation and like what it does because it's clearly like a magical item, but nobody's figured out what it does yet. So now they're going after Celine to try and find it and steal it from her. Damon and Stefan show up at the pageant and obviously Stefan's humanity is off. So Caroline's like not excited to see him. Sybil, wears the same shade of blue that Elena wore in the like iconic pageant from the beginning where she first danced with Damon. And I hate her for it. Damon is like wandering around the house, dealing with these memories and like holding the necklace and trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Sybil is trying to like infiltrate his mind even more and she can tell he's thinking about Elena, but she was supposed to have taken all those memories. So it shouldn't have an effect on him anymore, but it does. And he's able to like push her out of his mind for the first time and fight back and say no. So he doesn't give her the striker. Bonnie catches Sybil sirening the contestants and Enzo shows up and it's like, what are you doing here? Go away. You're in danger. You cannot be here right now. But he looks so good in his suit and she's wearing a green dress. Her hair in this episode. God, they're just everything to me. She asks him if he started wanting her to like contemplate turning for him and that's what the necklace meant. And man, he's trying so hard not to put pressure on her, even though like obviously... He wants her to turn so that they can stay together forever. She reminds him though that Kai was super clear when he told her the terms of like the spell with her and Elena. So if she does any witchy woo or finds any weird magical loopholes, Elena's gonna die, Bonnie's gonna die, everything's gonna be over. Dorian confronts Celine at the grill by banging the tuning fork and basically being like, I want answers right now immediately, you killed my friend Georgie. I guess Dorian and Georgie were really close. Remember, he was her emergency contact for some reason, so. Damon tells Caroline about Sybil wanting the striker and he has the necklace and so he's like, I need to know why you gave this to me. What is it doing to me? Like, I don't understand why I'm so affected by this damn necklace. What's the point? Caroline wants him to just go ahead and give her the striker instead, but he's worried that if they kill Sybil before they fix the influence she has on him, he'll be stuck like this forever. This is when Caroline realizes how bad Sybil messed with him. And it's kind of our first inclination of like how dark and twisted things got because we really haven't been like in Damon's point of view much and he hasn't been talking about it because he's been with Sybil this whole time. But yeah, basically she infiltrated all his memories, which we knew, and she like switched herself out with Elena. But now because the necklace is back, he's being confronted by both sets. So it's like, is the Sybil stuff real or is the Elena stuff real? He doesn't know who to trust. 
So Caroline is like that necklace represents the love that you and Elena have for each other and being back here should really help you understand that and hold on to it. He teases her for only believing that love can defeat any kind of evil because obviously she wants Stefan back, but he reminds her that Stefan is a guilt-free ripper now. So he's not going to be coming back to Caroline anytime soon, if at all. But all she can see is Damon struggling and him like expressing worry for Stefan is just proving her point that he wants to come back and help get Stefan back too. Violet Fell, by the way, has been a reoccurring student the last episode or so. She was in Sybil's class, now she's here in the pageant. She's been sirened to feed herself to Stefan. Sybil shows up to talk to him and basically say like, I wanna know what's going on with Damon. Why does he care about Elena again? Stefan kind of reiterates what Caroline said, which is basically like now that he's back in this house, even seeing Sybil in the blue dress, like all these things are like triggering memories for him. So she really screwed herself by bringing him back on this day. Cause this is the day where Damon like really hooked into the idea of like a love story with Elena for him. So they make a plan to get Damon back to their side by reminding him what really happened that day. And he like turns back to Violet Fell all ominous. Matt is in Celine's house looking for the bell. The cops show up, he gets arrested for all of like 30 seconds and then they realize he's the old sheriff and they let him go. When he asks about the bell though, as like the reason he's in the house, the cop goes to shoot him because Celine has sirened the local law enforcement to watch the bell and kill anybody who comes looking for it. Stefan tells Damon that he's annoyed and upset that Damon's being weighed down by the past and he wants Damon to let it all go so that they can finally be brothers again. He reminds him that this may be the moment that Damon thinks the love story with Elena started, but what he really should have been doing that day was helping Stefan. Because remember, the only reason why Damon stepped in and got the dance with her is because Stefan was back on a ripper binge or like the beginnings of a ripper binge. Stefan breaks the necklace and Damon gets flashes of like Elena turning into Sybil on the staircase because the dress is the same color and now he's even more confused. Caroline steps in and sweeps Damon out onto the dance floor reminding him that these moments are special because he decided that they were. Also, Caroline is wearing a dress that is the same color as the freaking bridesmaid's dress from Joe and Alaric's wedding. This costume department in this episode alone, they were working. Man, we also get to see Enzo and Bonnie do the iconic dance together. I'm so thankful we get this. Thank God we have this moment to look back on in the future. She explains that the idea of turning freaks her out a little bit because she remembers how her friends struggled and so she doesn't want to go through all of that but also she doesn't hate the idea of being a vampire anymore because she met a vampire who she fell in love with and he makes her feel alive. She says that if becoming a vampire meant just being with him for forever and there were no other implications, of course she would turn for him. But that's not what it means and they can't have that future so she gives the necklace back to him saying she can't wear it if that's why he wants her to have it. Stefan cuts in and takes Caroline away from Damon so now Caroline and Stefan are dancing and Sybil and Damon are dancing. She says that one day he's gonna thank her for sparing him the pain of all these memories because there's no world where Elena's ever gonna want him again. He says he just wants her to stop stealing his memories because he can't take it anymore. He's not afraid to face his human Humanity, even if it hurts. He just wants Sybil out of his head. But then he gives in and he's like, okay, I know where the striker is. I'll take you to it. Just leave me alone. They're playing She Used to Be Mine from Waitress in the background of this scene. I feel like you need to know that. Dorian's still with Celine, keeping her occupied. He's confused though on why she would help them make a bell that freaking kills sirens. Like, why would she do that? She is clearly being suspicious and she's like, you guys don't even know what it really does yet, do you? Bestie, I'd love for somebody to tell us. I'd love for the damn thing to get rung already. I can't wait any longer. He admits that he's working with Matt and she's like, that's great because his family's the only ones that can make it work. Bonnie and Enzo start evacuating the party and Caroline goes after Damon and Sybil to get the striker first. The contestants stop her though because they were compelled by Stefan to stay behind. So Damon gets the striker and he's gonna give it to Sybil, but then he like pulls it back and he's like, I wanna know, like all the time you spent in my head, did you ever try to understand Elena? 
and get a grip on her capacity for forgiveness. He tells her that the more Sybil tries to push Elena out, the more he's starting to understand that Elena can never leave him. And there isn't room in his head for both the girls. So he smashes the striker into Sybil's head and leaves her on the floor. Matt finds the bell in the police department like evidence room. He gets attacked again, but he's able to like subdue the guy and then he has him radio to send all the other officers away so that Matt doesn't have to hurt anybody to get the bell out. Stefan comes into the room where Sybil and Damon are. He says he's gonna leave and he's gonna start taking people for Cade without Damon's help. He says he actually wanted Damon under Sybil's control so that they could have fun and Damon would like enjoy what they were doing. Damon's like, you are the problem, child. You are the one whose messes I have been cleaning up and you're going to ditch me? Stefan is so funny. He's like, I don't know how to make it any more clear. I'm not gonna let you continue to drag me down. I'm my best self right now and I'm gonna do better work on my own. Goodbye, brother. Then he kills Damon and takes the striker and leaves. Like someone just ring the bell, just put the bell together and ring it. I don't think I can wait any longer. I'm, I'm losing my mind. Stefan gives the striker to Caroline, but then goes after the contestants. He snaps Violet Fell's neck before Caroline can stop him and says that he gave them all blood because he wants to turn them and then let them become evil and then send them to Cade. Bonnie and Enzo get everybody out of the party, but then he tries to stop her before she can go back to help Caroline. He's become like increasingly more worried about her, which is why he gave her the necklace because he wanted to know that even if he wasn't physically there with her, he could help her because his blood would heal anything that happened to her. He cries, y'all, like he's such a sweet boy. He swears that he's not trying to treat her like a weak human, but right now that's kind of what she is because she doesn't have her magic back so she can't protect herself. And he knows how dangerous things are getting. She asks when he became such a sap and he says, oh, well I fell in love with a human who makes me feel alive. I can't with them. I simply can't do it. Caroline reminds Stefan that not all vampires are evil. He reminds her that since they're engaged, anybody he kills is blood on her hands too. So she stabs him in the heart and he's like, <laughs> see, you're good at this killing thing. And then he like desiccates just right next to her and she's crying while it happens because this is awful. This is getting so screwed up. Caroline saves the girls though. And so Violet Fell wakes up and she's in transition mode, but the rest of them are gonna be fine. Caroline explains everything to her and gives her the choice about turning or dying. And Violet is like, I don't wanna be a vampire, please just kill me. So instead of doing that, Caroline's like, are you really sure though? Because I became a vampire really young and it was fine. You know, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. I can help you. So she convinces Violet to stay with her and like turn into a vampire and be like a student under Caroline because Caroline's actually really good at teaching people how to be vampires. So we'll see how that goes. Matt secured the bell, but then Dorian and Celine show up. Dorian says they need to listen to her in order to understand how the bell works. I don't care what she says, just freaking ring it already. Caroline waits for Stefan to get up. And then once he's awake, she tells him that she doesn't care what he has to do to get out of the deal with Cade. She'll be next to him, she'll stay with him. If the blood's on her hands, the blood's on her hands. She doesn't care as long as she gets him back in the end. He laughs and he's like, girly pop, I think there's been a mistake here. I'm never gonna wanna stop killing for Cade now, okay? I'm never coming back. So she gives him back the ring and tells him that one day he's gonna wake up and realize that he doesn't remember what happiness is. And on that day, he can come looking for her. But until then, he needs to leave her alone. She leaves and he leaves too, but he takes the ring with him. Bonnie tells Enzo she was wrong to give the necklace back to him and she lets him put it back on her, saying that she's happy to wear it because it's a reminder of the fact that she knows how it feels to want to be with somebody forever. He tells her that he understands her decision and even if their forever is only 60 to 70 years, it's enough for him and he's the luckiest man in the world to be with her. He's really worried and upset and sad though about like the idea of navigating life after she's gone because remember, she is the reason why he got through all those years of torment. So he's like, I don't know who I'm gonna be when you die, but we'll figure it out when we get there. And she says, what if we don't have to? 
What if you take the cure with me? Damon chains Sybil up in the Salvatore basement, and he's basically like, I'm here to give you some good old-fashioned payback. I will now be the one infiltrating your mind and screwing with you. He's back to using his evil powers for good. Like, this is the Damon I know and love. I have missed him. It's been like a season and a half of nonsense, Damon, okay? But he's back, finally. He tells her that the reason why after 2,000 years of being on the earth, she's still alone with nothing to show for herself is because she's nothing. She's a spoiled little brat and she's always been a lonely little girl and that's all she's ever gonna be. She cries and he's like, oop, 10 points for me. And then she grabs him and like siren forces all of his humanity stuff to come back. So she, I don't know how she does it. I don't know if she just reaches in and like flips the switch for him. That must be it. But she literally like rushes all of it in at once against his will. So he passes out on the floor. And the last thing we hear is her saying, I'm not the thing inside your head you need to fear, Damon. You are. <laughs> Okay, remember, Stefan is evil. Things are really bad. Bonnie calls Caroline and she's basically like, I gotta talk to you. She's on a jog. Bonnie Bennett is jogging in the morning, okay? She's running about and she's like, I need to talk to you about Enzo. I need advice. Caroline's moping in bed. Bonnie shows up to like breakfast in bed with her so they can talk and have like sleepover time. And then she walks into the Salvatore house and Damon is just sitting in a chair in the living room, staring into space. And Bonnie's like, um, Caroline, I think you should come downstairs. <laughs> we cut to Violet Fell, that poor girl. She's at the grill. She's killed people. Stefan comes in, explains that he was just trying to do what Cade wanted. He feels no remorse. And then he just kills Violet. So she is gone now. <laughs> Caroline and Bonnie do a head dive on Damon to see what's going on. All that they can like get a sense of is Damon is like on fire, screaming in horrific pain. In the real world, Damon starts to cry, like single tear just rolls down his blank face. And Bonnie's like, uh, I think he's suffering. Caroline finds Sybil in the basement and Sybil's like, yes, it was me. I flipped his switch. I bet it just is like nuking his brain from the inside out. I'm happy to help, but I'm gonna need something from you guys first. Matt is not sheriff anymore. That will be resolved quickly. The cops love him, okay? So he's finding out about Violet's death and he's upset again. He's back in his vampires are evil and I hate them arc. He never really left. He's just back at it again because they don't know what else to do with him. So they just keep recycling the same emotions for Matt Donovan. So vampire hater, that's our boy. Caroline calls asking for the bell because that's what Sybil wants in order to save Damon. And he's like, I'm sorry. Why don't we just let Damon suffer? Which... I'm gonna agree with him on this one. Caroline apologizes for Violet's death because she was gonna try to help her, remember? That didn't go well. And so Matt is like, yeah, you know, you keep doing that and yet everyone always seems to just be worried about Stefan and Damon. Sybil explains to Caroline and Bonnie that Damon is like subconsciously put himself in hell because he thinks that's where he deserves to be. So they're gonna have to go in and get him out. When they do another head dive with Sybil's help, they end up in the Salvatore house. Henry, like the random tomb vampire is there. He says he can't check them in because the boarding house is at full occupancy. So they're gonna have to find somewhere else to stay. They ask where Damon is and he's like, ah, yes, you mean Damon Salvatore, the Civil War soldier that died in the Civil War. And they're like, what? And then they get kicked out of his head. Civil is like, I don't know what that was, but it's his own mind. So he's gotta be in there somewhere. You two just didn't know how to find him. Stefan shows up and is basically like, oh, he used to do this all the time when we were kids. Like he gets in trouble, he runs away and hides. I find him and forgive him. And then he moves on with his life. It'll be fine. You just have to force him out and then like force forgive him and make him believe it. And then he'll, he'll come out and everything will be good. He's not in like any way worried about Damon. He just wants Damon back so they can keep working for Cade together. Because remember, his humanity is off. So the girls go back in again and they end up at the grill and they're starting to piece together that Damon is like subconsciously building this world. So they see an animal attack like on the newspaper and they're like, okay, well he's here, clearly he's killing people. And then they see Vicky with a little bandage on her neck in the same spot where Damon bit her that one time. 
Matt and Peter meet up at the cemetery at Vicky's grave. Peter says he tries to forget about Vicky, not because he doesn't love her, but because he blames her, but because he blames himself for what happened to her. Matt tells him about how they have the option to take her killer, which is Damon, and either help him or let him suffer. And Peter's like, I say, we let him suffer. The girls run into Liz in the grill. So Bonnie is like, I will handle Vicky, Caroline. You stay with your mom. It's the best. Like, I love this moment for them because Caroline gets to hug her mom and it's really sweet. Like, it's so adorable. But Liz doesn't have any memories of Damon either. When Caroline brings up vampires, Liz is shocked and then she dumps the vervain in her cup onto Caroline's hand and is like, looks like I found my evil vampire who's been killing people and freaking arrests Caroline. Bonnie gets Vicky to take off the bandage on her neck and it's not a vampire bite, it's a hickey. She says she doesn't know who Damon is either and then she leaves. Peter and Matt are working together to get the bell to work. Ring the bell, <laughs> please. <laughs> So they're working with Celine because remember Celine and Sybil want to kill each other. So they're both trying to build teams to get the bell. Peter and Matt have chosen Celine. She says all they have to do is ring it 12 times and then it will kill Sybil. Stefan shows up to stop them initially and Celine is like, I don't know what my sister promised you, but I can give you a better deal. Caroline starts bleeding from her nose in the real world because in Damon's mind palace, she's being tortured by Liz in that weird like room. I, I can't remember if it was in the church or if it was down in the crypt. I think it was in the church. I don't, that weird brick room with the window that they can open and the vampire chair in the center. That's where Caroline is. So now she's been tortured by both her parents in that room. Screwed up. Liz explains that like where she's at and how she believes in stuff is that Damon never existed. Okay, Stefan doesn't have a brother, but Caroline explains everything that happened to Liz out in the real world and is basically like, you already died, mom. I'm in Damon's head right now. She says that she's only helping him because Damon was the only one that when Liz died, he like knew what it meant to lose her, which is a hot take. Like I, I agree that he did care about Liz a lot, but I also think Elena was pretty sad and so was Matt. So <laughs> Caroline, come on. She says though that that's how she forgave Damon and then Liz like gently kicks her out of Damon's head and Sybil realizes that Caroline's forgiveness is not what's gonna save Damon, so they hope that Bonnie's will. Bonnie is at Grams' house, okay? So she gets to see her again and it's adorable. They also get to hug. Grams doesn't remember Damon and she doesn't wanna help do a locator spell because she doesn't help vampires because this is like pre-everybody working together vibes, okay, in Damon's head. Bonnie explains that most of her friends are vampires now. She's in love with one and she's really happy back home. So she just needs to help Damon so that she can get out and go back to her life. Grams is like, oh my God, that's cheating. You know that your happiness means everything to me. Fine, we can do the locator spell. Bonnie then pulls out the letter. She also says in this moment that if Damon wants her to know what the letter says, he will have to read it to her himself. So they're just gonna use it to locate him. She's not reading it. Celine explains that once the bell is rung, it will unleash hellfire. And not only will that hellfire kill the sirens that are present, but like anyone and everyone around them. So the entirety of Mystic Falls will go kaboom. Stefan accepts the deal because that's a lot of freaking souls to send to Kate. So he's like, win-win, you are the better sister. I will work with you. Sybil teases Caroline about not being a very good friend to Bonnie and basically says like, she was gonna give the cure to Enzo and she didn't even tell you about it yet because she doesn't really care about you. And Caroline is like, we were going to talk and then we got distracted. And Sybil, of all people says, it's weird how that always happens where Bonnie's concerned. So yes, Stefan's ready to blow up the town in order to get Damon back. Again, not because he cares about him at all, but because he wants his partner in crime to keep helping Cade. Matt's refusing to ring the bell, so Stefan rips off his vervain bracelet and compels him, being like, you can either ring the bell by the end of the hour, or you can forgive Damon for what he did to Vicky. Ring the bell, Matt Donovan. Oh my God, ring the bell. Bonnie goes to the crypt expecting to find Damon and instead finds freaking Tyler. She tells him that Damon can be forgiven and they can give him a second chance and he can deserve it and blah, blah, blah. And Tyler is like, no, I don't think he can. You need to leave. You need to get out of here. Valid, listen to him. Bonnie then says she's figured out how the mind palace works and leaves to go handle things. 
She tells Sybil and Caroline that Damon made this world where he lived and died as a, a human and never turned into a vampire, which means that he could protect his loved ones. Like he thought that was the only way he could keep them safe as if he'd never been a vampire. They call Stefan back, realizing that his forgiveness is the one that actually is gonna bring Damon back. Stefan thinks it's a trick, but he goes into his mind anyway and he ends up in the cemetery. Damon shows up to talk to him, but he says that Stefan got it wrong. Stefan isn't there to forgive Damon. Stefan is there so that Damon can forgive him. Sure, Jan. So Matt is now having a panic attack up in the clock tower, trying to get Peter to leave him behind and go save the town. But Peter doesn't want to abandon him again, so they're sort of just having a screaming fit. And Matt goes, okay, if you're not going to leave, kill me so I can die a hero instead of blowing up the town. Peter starts to cry and says he can't do that. He's like, I'm not laying a hand on you, son. And so Matt just starts beating his ass so that hopefully he'll get mad enough and fight back. Stefan laughs in Damon's face and Damon agrees that he is a monster, but he forgives Stefan anyway. So Stefan punches him and says, I have nothing to apologize for. And Damon just keeps saying he forgives him over and over again for like all the things Stefan has done while Stefan is just punching him in the face repeatedly. And Damon is still a human in this version of himself. So he's like bloody and hurt, but he's still saying that he forgives Stefan over and over again. He finally says, I love you. You're my brother. And there's nothing that will ever change that. Stefan is like, oh good, well I'm about to blow up Mystic Falls and kill you and literally everyone else. So good luck forgiving me after that one, buddy. Not gonna lie, I, I actually hate this. I hate it so much. Like this whole episode, I was like, if we don't move on quickly, if someone doesn't ring the bell, like I could not take it. it nothing, oh my God, it was too much. Matt is still beating Peter up, trying to get him to fight him. And then, he starts ringing the bell. This sends Bonnie and Sybil reeling, even though they're nowhere near the clock tower. Damon jumps up and grabs Stefan by the heart in the Salvatore room with Sybil and Bonnie freaking out. And then he kills him. So he's back and he's ready to protect the town. Matt's ringing the bell. He's ringing the freaking bell. It's glowing red. Things are happening. Peter, realizing that he's not gonna stop, grabs him by the neck and says, I'm so sorry. Matt is like, it's okay, I forgive you. But then before Peter can like actually break his neck, uh, Damon shows up and he knocks them away from each other. Matt hits his little head on the bell and rings it one more time, but thankfully it was only 11 times. So no hellfire yet. So Matt's fine. He's still mad at Damon though, okay? But then Damon stops him while they're leaving and like separating for the night and says that he should have told him sooner, but he's really sorry about what happened to Vicky. Matt basically says if Damon keeps helping them, he could maybe learn to forgive him. Again, sure, Jan, whatever. Also, Matt's gonna be sheriff again. As he's walking away, Damon quietly goes, I always did like the sheriffs in this town. I'm holding on by a thread at this point, okay? I give me what I want. I have waited long enough. <laughs> Caroline now has Stefan locked up in the basement, all right? They're gonna keep him and they're gonna get his humanity back on one way or another. Bonnie is waiting at the Salvatore house when Damon comes home and I will admit it right now, it's cute. It's a cute moment for them. She tells him what he did under Sybil's control wasn't his fault. He then starts reciting the letter for her and I'm just gonna read it to you guys, okay? Because I know you're out there, Super Sparks. I hope that's how I say your name. I know you're out there. You've been waiting long enough, okay? I've been waiting, you've been waiting. I'm gonna read you this letter. Dear Bonnie, I am a coward. I should be saying this to your face, not writing this letter. But I know if I do, you'll talk me out of running away from all my problems. You're gonna make me face a future without Elena. Then you're gonna help make me the best man that I can possibly be, the same way she did. And I'm absolutely terrified of failing you both. So I'm leaving, because I'd rather let you down once than let you down for the rest of your life. And I hope it's the happiest life because you, Bonnie Bennett, are an amazing woman, a mediocre crossword puzzle player, and my best friend with great love and respect, Damon. The crossword puzzle reference? Buddy, it's on sight with me and you. It's on, oh my God. Don't bring him into this. How dare you bring him into this? Bonnie cries and says it's a hell of a letter. She's not wrong, it's very sweet. He says he's so sorry that he left and it won't happen again. So they are besties once more. We cut to the diner 
where Sybil and Celine are meeting to talk. They're trying to like call a truce because the brothers have made up before, not currently, but before. So they could make up, but they can't, okay? Because truly they're sisters. And this is one of the most realistic moments of the episode because they just start going, you left me in the vault. Yeah, well, you turned your back on me first. You turned me into a cannibal. And I'm like, yeah, I've had that conversation with my little sister before. Like, what of it? We've, that's, that's happened in my house before. Cade strolls into the room, like walks into the room when he is supposed to be in hell. Okay, no one summoned him. How did he get here? How was he just in the world? He tells them he no longer needs their help and then lights them on fire and kills the sirens. End of episode 10. Okay, so Cade is walking among us now, all right? He's in a coffee shop, he runs into Bonnie. She's nice to him and he's like smiling and enjoying the world and having a great time, but also reading everyone's minds and starting fights because he is a crazy psychic who likes to spread chaos. Still in a suit though, he still is in a suit. Damon's teasing Stefan, trying to get him to turn his humanity back on. Stefan's not having it, okay? He's still locked up in the cellar at this point. It's time capsule day. So Matt tells us about a time capsule that was buried in 1790 that they've now dug up to celebrate Founders Day because it's, it's time for the events. Caroline dug one up that she and Elena buried and they look at pictures of like Bonnie and Elena and Caroline when they were kids. She's trying to stay positive about Stefan and getting him back, but it's hard. And Matt again is like, you know, I just don't think I can forgive him this time because even though he was possessed, he still did all those awful things. And I think I'm getting tired of pretending like it's not him doing the things just because he's a vampire and there's special circumstances. He still did the things. Enzo and Bonnie are driving the bell out of town to a secret location she has not told him about yet. They start talking about bucket lists because Caroline found the girl's old ones. And so Bonnie was like reading it to him. And now they're talking about his bucket list. He says he never really like had one because he was only a vampire for a little while before he got captured. And so there wasn't a lot to do. So Bonnie is like, okay, well, we need to do all those fun things that you didn't get to do yet before you take the cure. Damon brings Stefan breakfast and finds the cellar door open and Stefan gone. This time it was Cade. He shows up in the cell and tells him that he sent Stefan away on a task. Cade then explains that when the bell hit the 11th ring, like a portal door situation opened between hell and the real world and he was able to just like walk on through. Cade then gives Damon a task, which is by sundown, kill a hundred people or Caroline, his choice. Matt finds a weird Maxwell, like iron artifact in the time capsule and takes it. He calls Dorian and Dorian's like, hey man, you know I'm a person, right? Like what happened to, how are you? But Matt bulldozes over that and is like, tell me what this freaking artifact is right now before I lose it. He says it's a code breaker. It's one of those, I, I don't remember what they're called guys, but you, you, it's like a little square. It's got cutouts on it. You put it over a piece of paper. It tells you what the things say. All right, I didn't write down the word, I'm sorry. Damon comes to Caroline to tell her about the Cade situation and Stefan escaping. And she's freaking out because Stefan has been crazy and he's been murderous and they need to stop him. And now Damon is like, I've got it. I'm in control. No problem. No worries. Don't panic. And she's like, what if I did though? He tells her to get the people out of town because he doesn't need to be tempted to kill the hundred people that Cade told him to kill. Enzo's driving a race car around the track, okay, being a boy's boy. They kiss when he's done and he's so happy and cute and filled with adrenaline, it's adorable. He wants to skydive and she's like, absolutely, let's go. And then he's kind of like, hold on, you're a little sad. Something is lightly off, Bonnie, what's going on? She says that she's just worried about not having enough time so that he doesn't miss out on anything before he takes the cure. And she says like, if you're gonna take the cure and he's like, no, no, when I take the cure, like, do you not know me at all? If I say I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. Caroline's gotten everybody from the town square into the grill for the most part. She's like evacuated the general vicinity. She fills Matt in on the whole kill 100 people thing by sundown. So she wants to give him some blood, but he refuses saying that he would rather die with the rest of the town than be a vampire. Damon's over at the high school and Cage strolls up and like wind blows at his feet and the leaves blow around him. He's impeccable. I love that man. Oh my God. Damon wants to renegotiate their deal. Cade reads his mind 
and is like, oh, you think I'm being unfair because you don't want to kill Caroline, so you think you're going to try to kill me? LOL, buddy. Then he lights himself on fire to prove that fire won't kill him. And just to like really drive it home, he reaches into his own chest, pulls out his own heart, and still doesn't die. So what are they gonna do? <laughs> Stefan rocks up to a random gas station. He torments, a poor, he torments the poor lady that's getting gas next to him and then ends up compelling her and saying he needs her help with his current task. Matt and Dorian are using that Maxwell journal that they found in the secret room of the vault, okay? So the vault tunnels underneath the armory, that weird Maxwell room with all those Maxwell artifact things. They got that journal. They're using the Maxwell code breaker thing to look through the journal and find a specific code message. Also now Dorian knows everything about Cade. He is curious about Caroline being a vampire and also just vampires in general. And Matt's really disgusted by that. And Caroline has to be like, I know that it's difficult and there's parts of it that suck, okay, but not all of us regret turning. Bonnie takes Enzo to an Airbnb that she bought with the money she inherited from her dad. No one else knows about it, but it is such a cute scene when they walk up to the front of the house together and she invites him in and then he pulls her back out onto the porch, picks her up bridal style and carries her inside. He gives her a little monologue in the foyer about like, wanting to be with her forever and being so excited to take the cure. She's still making sure that he's fully done being a vampire. And he's like, girl, all I wanna do is be with you. He says, there's no more doubts in my head. Let's just go get Elena's blood right now and take the cure. And she goes, about that. Damon sits down with Caroline at the grill and has to be like, so I just watched Cade um, light himself on fire and then rip out his own heart. I don't think, we can kill him, Caroline. Uh, we need a plan D immediately. Caroline says they could use the cure to turn him mortal and then kill him. And Damon's like, whoa, bro, I can't risk my future with Elena. No, pump the brakes. She's like, no, this will be so easy. Okay, we'll give the cure to Cade and then Enzo will take the cure from Cade's body. And then when Bonnie dies later, you can take the cure from Enzo. And he's like, rewind. Bonnie was gonna give the cure to Enzo without telling me first? And Caroline's like, I mean, she was gonna tell you. So Damon loosely agrees to the plan, but he says that Bonnie's not gonna like it. So Damon goes outside and calls Bonnie and explains everything to her, but she's not convinced. Enzo is also listening to this phone call, okay? He's standing by the car, packing up the bell, but he's listening in. Damon has the fucking nerve to be mad at her over the fact that she wasn't gonna tell him Enzo was gonna take the cure until Enzo had already taken it. She's like, sorry. I was just putting myself first. I wanted to be happy. He swears he's gonna get them out of this whole mess. He just needs her help. And she agrees saying, we'll do it. We'll rescue everyone but ourselves again. Dorian is slowly figuring out the journals and he's starting to get even more confused because he says sometimes the messages in the code feel like more code, so he can't decipher them. Caroline gives him a blood cocktail too to give him the choice just in case with how bad things are going. And he's like, this is so cool. She asks why he's not freaked out by this stuff. And he explains that like his family has a history of like feeling cursed and stuff. And then his parents kind of like broke that generational issue. And so they were happy. And then one day his dad and his sister died and he was like consumed with this feeling that maybe they were like missing or where had they gone and were they okay? And then he had a dream about his sister and he knew in that moment that she was reaching out to him from wherever she was and she was fine and his dad was fine and everything was good so then from that moment on he was like I must know everything there is to know about magic and weird stuff and so that's how we ended up with the Dorian we know and love today it's very sad <laughs> then everyone starts screaming and two people like drop to the floor choking on their own blood it's Cade he comes in and lights another person on fire but then he frees everyone in the grill and like lets them go Dorian is eyeing the blood cocktail like is it my time is this what I need to do? Damon strolls inside saying that Cade is a micromanager and he gave him until sundown to make his choice. Cade tells them that Caroline is important because she's Stefan's girl. So that's why it was like a hundred people or Caroline. And then he admits that he gave Stefan the same order, which means that Stefan is after Elena right now. Damon kills someone hiding in the grill, basically saying like, I'm gonna do the hundred people. Caroline grabs Dorian and runs out. Also, Dorian decides not to drink the blood cocktail after watching Damon feed on this random lady. 
Kate is like, congratulations, you made your choice. I'll even throw in the three people I killed for free. Okay, so you have 97 more to go. And no matter what, Stefan is going to kill Elena because that was his choice too. So Damon takes off after Stefan, leaving Caroline behind in town. She calls Stefan and he answers because he says he's bored. His new friend, that lady he abducted from the gas station, is filling out paperwork for him. We go back to Bonnie and Enzo at the house. She actually bought it to hide Elena's body as like a new safe place for her. She wants to be selfish, but she also knows that she won't feel good about doing that to their friends. They hug. She says, I never get to have my chance. I always give it up and do the right thing for everyone else. He asks her if she wants to just keep the cure and she says, no, like, of course I want to, but I also want to help. It just sucks. He says he wants to stay with her no matter what, vampire or human, he doesn't care. He says to her, I'll stay in love with you. We can live here in this house. We can cook dinner every night, dance by the fire. She goes, play guitar. He's romanticizing watching her get older and still loving her no matter what. He promises he doesn't need the cure to be happy. He just needs her. She kisses him with her eyes open and I want to curl up and die, okay? I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this. We go back to Stefan. Yes, you guessed correctly. That poor woman from the gas station is transferring the deed of ownership over to her name instead of Bonnie's. So Enzo gets yeeted onto the front porch. He can't get back inside. And then Stefan asks that poor woman to let him in. I think her name is Karen. It's not important. Caroline, Matt, and Dorian clean up the grill. Matt has yet another soapbox episode where he tells them that this town has gone to shit and everything sucks and everything's scary and awful. Caroline is like, Matt, the town's always been like this, okay? The difference is we were kids and the adults hid the darkness from us, but now we're the adults. And Matt goes, no, actually, you're part of the darkness. It's a hardcore line, Matt Donovan. Dorian admits he's not ready to be a vampire because he doesn't want to be a scary killer like Damon. He finds a message in the journal and he says it's in another language and it's like weird Latin. So it's probably definitely a spell. He gives Matt another Maxwell heirloom, which is a golden pendant. Damon's racing to New York, but Stefan says you're going in the wrong direction, bucko. I'm going to the real location. So when Cade ran into Bonnie at the beginning of the episode, he read her mind and he found out about the house and where Elena was and he fed that information to Stefan and that's how Stefan is doing this job now. Bonnie goes inside to get the cure from Elena alone, leaving Enzo on the porch. That will unfortunately be important in a few minutes. Damon begs Stefan to turn around and come meet him somewhere and take his anger out on him and this is when Stefan goes, I am taking it out on you. I'm on my way to murder Elena. Bonnie takes the cure out of Elena. Damon promises that Stefan will never have to take care of him again. He will take care of them both now. He will handle everything. He will be the good big brother that he's supposed to be. And Stefan is like, yeah, I don't think you're capable of that, buddy. But he believes if he gets rid of Elena, then they'll never like be friends again. Like that will be like the final severing bond between them, which will free Stefan from having to deal with Damon. So Stefan strolls up the driveway to the Airbnb saying that Elena is a stupid human girl. They never should have cared about her. She's a waste of space. Damon says that he won't really kill her. And Stefan is like, oh, I can and I will. And you know what? I can't wait. Enzo is pacing on the porch, nervous, okay? He puts his hands up on the door frame and like leans in as far as he can go. Bonnie's taking the blood from Elena in another room. They're talking to each other, kind of talking through the process. Then Enzo stops answering. Bonnie rounds the corner back into the room and he's still leaning forward into the doorway, okay, looking at her. And she goes, Enzo? He gasps and falls forward, revealing Stefan standing behind him, holding his heart in his hands. So Enzo falls to the porch, freaking dead, and Stefan just strolls inside, straight to Bonnie. They fight. And he says, why do you even care what happens to Elena? In a few minutes, you're going to be dead. And Bonnie goes, yeah, and you'll be human. And then she stabs him in the leg with the syringe of cure blood. So Stefan passes out. She runs over his body. Okay, the sound goes out in the scene, by the way. All right, so it's silent now. She runs to the porch. She falls down on Enzo's body. She starts sobbing. She's holding him. She tilts her head back and screams bloody murder to the sky and a blast of magic shoots out of her before we cut to black. You know what I'm really sick of? Crimes against Bennett witches. I'm tired of it, Julie Pleck. I'm 
sick of this but in all reality this is one of like the best Cat Graham scenes it's so good okay I know I've gushed about how amazing the little details that um, Michael and Kat found for Enzo and Bonnie but like y'all this scene is so good this scene is so good and like I said it's silent okay we sort of hear her like brokenly call his name but it's like distorted and stuff and then when she screams that's when it like sort of shatters through and we hear it it's so good it it's the I made my husband watch it this morning I was like you you have to watch this scene with me and even he was standing there like damn that is rough and I was like I told you it's the worst Okay, whiplash time, episode 12. We open with Matt having a dream about the witches burning in front of the witch house with the bell being rung in the distance. He wakes up in the vault tunnels in the armory and like stumbles out the door and everything into the main space while the alarm is going off. And then Rick shows up with a gun and is like, Matt, what are you doing here? Bonnie is on the floor inside the house. Enzo is still on the porch. Her phone rings and it's Damon. When she answers, he's immediately freaking out thinking that Elena is dead because she's crying. And then when she tells him, no, Elena is fine, Enzo is gone. He does not have enough of an emotional reaction for me, okay? I, I don't know if it's just the choice Ian made or if it's the way it's written, but it's not enough, all right? But he does say, just stay there, I'm coming for you, even though she says no. He's like, I have to know you're okay. It doesn't do it for me because Bonnie's on the phone crying. Like, you should be crying too, Damon. He says he'll deal with Stefan and she says, oh, don't worry, I already did. I gave his ass the cure. So Stefan is racing away in a car, all right? Bloody hands on the steering wheel because there's still blood where he ripped out Enzo's heart. He's human now and overcome with like thousands of evil deeds. Caroline calls, knowing what happened. He says he can't be forgiven. He doesn't even want to think about having to talk to Bonnie because he doesn't know what he would say. He's driving really quickly in his panic and the fact that he's probably forgetting that he's not a vampire anymore. So then he gets arrested because when the cop pulls him over for speeding, he sees the blood on his hands and shirt because Stefan's wearing a white shirt covered in blood. And he's like, yeah, buddy, you're coming with me. And Caroline's just like calling on the phone like, Stefan, Stefan, what's happening? And he's in the cop car, he's gone. Rick sits down with Matt, all right? Remember Rick was off with the girls somewhere? I don't think we ever find out where he took them. He's back in town because Dorian called and said he needed help. Matt swears the dream wasn't just a nightmare. He said it felt like he was really there. And Dorian is like, I think you might have been actually, bro. I'm really sorry I gave you that necklace. I think it's a talisman linking you to an ancestor from your past so you're seeing memories through the necklace. Given the fact that there's like a Bennett connection to everything, Matt's like, okay, well, we should call Bonnie and see if she knows anything. Rick gets off the phone after somebody calls him, either Caroline or Damon. And Matt is like, what happened? What's wrong? Is something wrong? And Rick is like, yeah, it's really bad. Damon's drinking, shattering glasses in his hand, as one does. Caroline calls to say that Stefan got arrested and Damon's like, you know what, that's actually probably for the best because he shouldn't be alone right now, all right? If he does anything to himself, he's human, so we need to keep watch on him. Caroline says Bonnie won't answer her phone calls and Damon is like, yeah, Caroline, can you blame her? So at least he gets that right. At least he knows they need to just leave her alone. Kate shows up to tell him that he's sorry for his loss, not of Enzo, but of Stefan. The deal is broken now because the boys were supposed to be vampire killers and now that Stefan is human, null and void. But Kate is like, I will actually kill him unless by sundown tonight you give me the journal that I want, which is the Maxwell journal that Dorian is using over in the armory. If Damon gives it to him, Cade's more than happy to let Stefan live out the rest of his life as a human. So Stefan's in jail, okay? He's being shown by a lawyer all the different people he's killed and they caught him because his fingerprints were at the crime scenes. We never really touch on this, all right? The fact that they never get caught. But oh my God, it feels like they should get caught so much more than they do. I know that they can use compulsion and that's how he's gonna get out of it in a minute. But it just feels like to me, they should get caught more often. <laughs> Bonnie's making tea in the kitchen of the Airbnb and she hears Enzo, like distinctly Enzo's voice, calling for her, asking for help. Then there's a knock on the door and it's Abby freaking Bennett. Her mom is there because Caroline called and said that she wasn't talking to any of them, but she thought maybe Abby would be able to talk to her. Abby can't come in the house. So Bonnie steps outside and hugs her. It's really sweet. The lawyer comes back in 
and quickly lets Stefan go because Caroline has shown up and she's compelled everybody to forget everything and pretend like Stefan didn't do it. They hug, she sees the pictures of the people he killed too, and is basically like, this isn't your fault, this was Cade's fault, but now he's having a hard time believing that because he sort of feels the way Matt did, which is like, I still did the things though, even though I was possessed. Matt's still calling Bonnie for help and she is not answering him. Damon shows up to get the journal. Rick stops him by being like, buddy, you don't just give the devil what he wants unless you know why he wants it. Damon's like, you're gonna have to kill me, okay? Because I'm not letting Stefan die over this. Give me the journal. So then Rick just verveins him in the neck and Damon goes to sleep. Abby helps Bonnie get Enzo's body ready to bury it. It's so sweet, okay? Because at this point, Abby's still a vampire. She doesn't have magic. Bonnie doesn't have magic. They're still doing all the like witchy rituals over him. It, It's so sweet. It's precious. And they're in the greenhouse. So they're like surrounded by plants. It's, uh, it's amazing. Bonnie says she still feels him and she doesn't think Enzo wants to be put in the ground. Abby's like, honey, you're grieving, it's okay. But Bonnie's like, no, I've actually grieved plenty of times in my life. That's not what this is, this is something else. Abby reminds her that the other side is gone, so there's nowhere for Enzo's spirit to be, and they don't have magic. But Bonnie is like, mom, I think we have to try, okay? I think that's why you came here. You were supposed to help me make contact with him. While Caroline is getting Stefan out of jail, he sees the little girl of the lady. We're going to call her Karen. I think her name is Karen. He sees her daughter in the police station saying her mom is missing and she doesn't know where she is and she doesn't have any other family. So he tells Caroline, I didn't kill her, but I left her in the trunk of a car and she's probably dead and they're never going to find her body. So Caroline's like, okay, let's go get her. Damon wakes up in the armory. Matt is in bed in one of the cells being hooked up to some sedation stuff so that they can uh, put him to sleep a little bit and like hypnotize him into going into the memories of his ancestor and then telling them what he sees when he uses the necklace to see the memories. Do you see why this show, they, it, can you believe what I just said to you? Did any of that make sense? What's going on? In the memory flashbacks, okay, Matt goes to the witch house. He says it looks beautiful and brand new. There is a bell being built and he is basically in his ancestor Ethan's body and the guy looks like Matt, okay? So he's the one like making the bell and stuff. There's a Bennett witch there. Her name is Beatrice, I think, and he calls her B. They're being cute, all right? There's clearly something going on there with them. They're talking about how the Bennets put magic into the metal that he is now turning into the bell. They're the ones that have been using that cute little cipher together, okay? So they write in code. Sybil shows up and basically like kidnaps him from Beatrice. In the real world, Stefan and Caroline go looking for that missing lady. He's not totally sure where he left her anymore. Also, he's getting snippy and kind of mean and he basically lashes out at Caroline and says like, I know you just want to get back together and pretend everything's fine and get married, but I don't think I can do that. And Caroline's like, we've been together for hours and I haven't even mentioned the wedding. Relax. They find the car but the lady's body is not in the trunk. However, there is a blood trail that they decide to follow. Memory flashes, okay? Matt says that Sybil took Ethan to that secret room in the vault tunnels. Celine was also there. So now both sirens are there with Ethan. She shows him different artifacts and trinkets, including a knife that she says was made around the time that Cade died. They're the ones who made him put the tuning fork in the bell so that the town would explode. Bonnie and Abby, do a ritual over Enzo to try to reach out to him. She asks if he's there with them and the flowers like blow away in a really strong breeze. Then Abby falls back, letting Bonnie go screaming. She says she saw the power that blasted out of Bonnie at the moment of Enzo's death. And she thinks Bonnie must have opened a door to somewhere dark. So Bonnie is like, oh my God, I opened a door to hell and that's where Enzo is. No, I gotta get him out of there. Abby says they have to close the door by burying him and like putting a stop to this. Bonnie wants to get him out and then she hears him calling her again and then promptly passes out on the floor of the freaking greenhouse. Stefan finds the woman in the woods, but when she sees him, she panics and stabs him. He makes Caroline heal her first. And then once Caroline turns to give him some of her blood, they remember that the cure keeps you from being affected by magic anymore. So Stefan can't be healed and he is dying in Caroline's arms. Memories, okay, we're back with Matt in Ethan's body. The witches are gathering for the ringing of the bell. Ethan can't warn Beatrice, okay, but he keeps saying, I can't say, 
I can't say, even though he wants to tell her what's wrong because he's under the siren control. So he gives her the journal after he's written something, once again going, I cannot say. He goes to ring the bell, unable to stop himself, while she goes, oh my God, secret message in the book. And she uses the code thingy, looks at it, and it basically says like, when I ring the bell, hellfire's unleashed, town explode. And she's like, oh no. So the Bennets realize what's happening too and make a ring around the bell, sacrificing themselves. That's why the witches burned. They die and the town lives. What did I just say? about crimes against Bennett's. As the like fire dies down and everything, we see that only Ethan and Beatrice survived. Matt starts having a heart attack from the pain of the memories. Damon rushes in to give Matt his blood so Matt does not die from a heart attack. We see Beatrice and Ethan standing there over the ashes of her dead family. They're crying, both of them. It's cute, okay? Because Bonnie and Matt have also always had like a weird twin flame connection going on, okay? We've talked about it before once or twice. They just have these weird moments. And if they were gonna tie that together in some way, this is nice. This feels correct. Then we see Beatrice sealing the sirens in the cave. So that's how Celine and Sybil got locked away. They warn them that they're gonna be cursed together, the Maxwells and the Bennets, unless they free Cade and then kill him. They sirened Ethan to kill Beatrice, but she stops him with her magic and like pushes him into the room that they found his body in, leaving him behind. He is frantically saying, wait, I know how to kill Cade, but I cannot say, I cannot say. So he scribbles it down into his journal, hoping that Beatrice will like listen and come back and like get that from him. Obviously she didn't. She thankfully just left him behind. When Matt wakes up, okay, and now Rick and Dorian are like, oh my God, the answer to killing Kate is in that freaking journal. They realize that Damon took it and ran. Abby's trying to wake Bonnie up. It's not working. So she panics. She pours gasoline on Enzo. She lights him on fire. That makes Bonnie wake up, but now she's having a panic attack watching Enzo burn. Abby has to explain that Enzo didn't open the door, Bonnie did. She can't let Bonnie destroy herself because she knows that Enzo loved her and he wouldn't want that. So wherever he is, he does not want Bonnie to be dragged down there with him. Bonnie breaks down sobbing, watching the fire over Abby's shoulder in the greenhouse. Stefan, by the way, is still bleeding out in the woods with Caroline. He's accepted he's going to hell. He's like, it's cool, it's time, I deserve it. She begs him not to give up and to keep fighting. The ambulance is coming, but he passes out in her arms again. Damon brings the journal to Kate and gives it over. Kate says Stefan is now free to live out the rest of his human life. Damon asks if anybody has ever earned their way out of hell. Kate says he doesn't want to give him false hope and then burns the journal. Stefan sees the little girl get reunited with her mom. Caroline's ready to take him home. They talk about moving forward. He does apologize for having been a jerk earlier. He says he doesn't know what they're gonna do now that he's a human and she's a vampire. He's like, what does our life even look like anymore? And she says she doesn't know either, but she doesn't wanna give up just because it's not what they expected it to be. They agree that they both don't know how to make things right, but she says she knows where he could start. Bonnie comes home to find Matt waiting for her on the porch. He says he wanted to tell her in person how sorry he was about what happened to Enzo. She immediately starts to cry and she says she doesn't think she can do this. He says she's one of the strongest people he knows and he actually thinks he knows exactly where she got that strength from and he will happily tell her about it when she's ready. She says none of this would have happened if she just still had her magic because then she would have been able to protect Enzo. Matt tells her to find comfort in the fact that Enzo loved her as much as he did and that he will always be with her. And then he kisses her on the forehead and leaves her on the porch. Bonnie touches her necklace, which still has Enzo's blood in it. Stefan comes home to Damon. Damon wants to sit with him, but Stefan's like, no, actually I just need to change clothes because I'm bloody from being stabbed in the stomach. Um, and then I'm gonna go to Bonnie and I'm gonna try to think of something to say, but I have no idea where to even start. He does also thank Damon for saving his life from Cade and Damon says, no problem, bro. Typical Tuesday activities. Stefan asks if he thinks there's a chance for them to find redemption and Damon looks him in the eyes and says, absolutely, liar. Rick asks Dorian what he needed his help with and then Damon comes inside the armory and Dorian's like, gotta go, I'll tell you tomorrow. So now it's just Rick and Damon alone in the armory. I'm 
vibrating out of my skin right now. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Rick asks Damon if Damon realizes what he did in giving Cade the journal, and Damon's like, I'm assuming it's how we were gonna kill him, but you know what, I don't care, because I needed to save my brother. And guess what, Rick? I'm selfish. Then he's like, come on, we gotta go down into the vault. Please, go into the vault. Go. Stefan gets freaking tased standing outside of Bonnie's house and then like kidnapped. In the secret vault room, Damon explains that Sybil had a loophole to the bell situation and he picks up that knife thing that Matt mentioned in his dream as being made around the time that Cade died. And Damon's like, I bet anything, this is how we're gonna kill him. And Rick is like standing there like, damn, I'm a little impressed. Damon thinks they should drink apologize to each other, and make a plan to kill the devil. Lily, if you're watching right now, are you prepared? Are you ready? I know I am. From behind Damon, we hear, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but what if I told you I had a better idea? He's back. Kai freaking Parker just strolls from the back of the freaking vault tunnels, walks right into the room with Rick and Damon, and goes, mm. they're standing there like, Rick looks like he's gonna pass out. He's just standing there like ready to drop. Oh, uh, but yeah, after a season and a half of just absolute buffoonery, my boy is finally back. I can breathe, I can be happy. They took Enzo from me, but they gave me my baby back, so. So we start with a three days ago flashback and we go over to the grill and we hear Matt like ringing the bell with Peter. And all of a sudden, Kai just like spawns in the grill, like coming out of, I think, the kitchen. He just sort of appears in the doorway and he's like, Whoa. he's in his wedding suit and he's so ridiculously adorable because he's like confused. And he walks up to one of the waiters and the way he says, hey, where am I? Like lives in my head rent free. He's so baby girl in this episode. <laughs> of course because he is the man that he is, he's like food now, immediately. He orders like, what is it? Like three burgers, two beers, and then two beers, three burgers. I don't know, but a hot dog, fries, it's adorable. And then while he's waiting, he just starts like eating the jelly. But our baby forgot he's a heretic now, okay? So food tastes bad. He has a little meltdown. He ends up stabbing his own hand and then being like, wait a second, I can't feel the pain. I'm not really here, I'm not really alive. What is going on? I understand that I just called him baby girl. He does in fact like hold a knife up and then modus a waiter into his knife. Um, and then he says, well, at least I felt that. So <laughs> then we cut back to him in the cave with Rick and Damon, like explaining all of that to them. He's like half alive. He still technically has his magic, but it's like really low. And basically like the bell rang, he saw Mystic Falls from hell and he was like, I'm going there. So he quickly like got across the, the veil, I guess is how we're gonna talk about it. It's different from the other side, but also it's not. It's just still like a weird psychic dimension. This one's just hell and linked to Cade. So you can think of it as being basically the same thing, but like for bad people. And now he's hiding from Cade. He's terrified of being brought back to hell. Rick attacks him, like immediately. He breaks out of his like, oh my God, I'm in shock stupor and just like throws him up against the wall and is like, you murdered my wife. And Kai goes, um, fiance, it was mid ceremony as I remember. And then very quickly is like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was a stupid thing to say. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. It was a mistake, my bad. They have such funky screwed up energy together like they kill me but Damon stops him and is like Rick we have to ask him questions like you can't kill him Kai says that he will help them get rid of Cade and like share his better idea as long as they find a way to like completely bring him back to life Damon is down to try because like of course he is but he tells Rick like don't worry we're gonna double cross him okay so once we do all of this I'll just send him back to hell myself no big deal Rick is like, get, I'm not helping you with this. Me and the girls are going into lockdown mode, okay? That dude is insane. Caroline is still calling Bonnie regularly, but Bonnie is not answering because she has put her vampire boundary foot down, finally. Also, Caroline wants to know how the meeting between Stefan and Bonnie went. 
because remember, Stefan got kidnapped outside Bonnie's house. And for some reason, Miss Caroline Forbes just didn't do anything about the fact that her very fragile human boyfriend just never came home the night before. I'd have gone into red alert mode immediately. Caroline also says that she understands if Bonnie can't be around Stefan anymore and she's not gonna force her to do that, but she wants to be there for her if Bonnie wants it. Matt meets with her and apologizes in a really shitty way for having hurt her feelings, you know, when he said she was part of the darkness of the town. He warns her that people are coming into the police station being like, hey, I have a crime to report on one immortal vampire, Stefan Salvatore. <laughs> Because now that Stefan's human, all of the compulsion that he did throughout his life is like breaking down and people remember him. Stefan has been kidnapped and he wakes up in the back of the car of the person who kidnapped him. It's Dorian. He pulls a damn gun on him and leads Stefan out into the woods. So it turns out that Stefan is the one that killed Dorian's dad and sister. And then he compelled Dorian to forget about him and like faked the house fire as a way for Dorian to move on. But Stefan doesn't seem to remember that happening. So it happened back when Stefan was with Klaus. This is one of those like murders that he committed when he was rippering up the East Coast and everything. And I actually kind of love this because it's a good way to tie Dorian in to that part of Stefan's history. It's a nice little callback because that was like, many seasons ago. So then Stefan's like, okay, their names were Robert and Tina Williams. I remember them. I never forget my victims' names. And Dorian's like, and yet you forgot me, you idiot. Like, oh my God, you just leave the family members behind and forget that we ever mattered. You just think about the people you actually killed. What's wrong with you? And then Dorian pulls out a shovel, hands it to Stefan and goes, start digging. Oh my, he's gonna shoot Stefan in the head. Bonnie our sweet little witch is still holding like little seance rituals for Enzo trying to get him to talk to her again. She calls out to him, asking him to give her a sign if he is still with her. And then the phone rings and it's Damon with Kai in the backseat of his car. Now listen, I love Bonnie and Enzo. I do, I love them. But why did they think it was a good idea to kill him and then bring Kai back an episode later. Enzo dies in 11, okay? Kai comes back in 12. What was the point of that? As if like we weren't all gonna be like, so she is gonna end up with a witch? Like Bonnie is going to end up with a witch, right? That's what we're doing here? Or like at the very least, like are they gonna reach some ambiguous understanding with each other and we're gonna get to like think about them being together post season eight because I would just like to remind everyone of the fact that she never knew what he did on her birthday when he tried to like get them to her and he's the reason why Jeremy was able to open the garage nobody ever told her about that because Damon was manipulating her in 617 and he was basically like you're right he is evil we can all get what we want let's get rid of the crazy witch boy that has a crush on you that was Damon because I me over here I'm a firm believer that if she had known that, what happened in 1903 would not have happened. I'm not saying she would have been like, you're my best friend now, we're always forgiven, everything's great. I'm just saying she would not have dumped him back in the prison world and tried to stab him with a knife, effectively killing the entire coven in the process. That's another thing we leave out, okay? Bonnie is so blinded with her rage in 617 that she is willing to kill him, even if it means also killing Joe and Liv and all the other Geminis. That never gets brought up. She never talks about that. Nobody ever says, you know, Bonnie, if you kill him, the whole Parker family dies. You know that, right? No one talks about that. <laughs> so anyway, now I'm here suffering through Bonnie on the phone and Kai in the back seat trying to get Damon's attention, asking if he can talk to Bonnie, telling Damon to tell Bonnie he says hi. And then when Damon finally gets off the phone, he's like, did she sound like she missed me? And I'm supposed to just like feel nothing about that? Like be so for real right now, what? was the point. <laughs> so Bonnie asks what Damon wants because remember at this point her boundaries with the vampires are like firmly in place and she is standing on business to not help them anymore and she's calling them out on the fact that they only ever call to check on her when they need something. 
Damon lies and is like, oh girl, I was just calling to check on you and see how you were feeling and also get some information about if you know how to bring Enzo back from hell because maybe I have somebody that I also need to bring back from hell, but that's unrelated. I just wanted to know if you were okay. She's pissed that he would ask her for more help. And then, even though Miss Bennett has no magic currently, or at least magic that she is aware of and can control, she gets a weird little tingle. And we hear the witch whispers, you know, like the spirit whispers in the car with Damon and Kai. And Bonnie goes, who's sitting next to you? Damon looks over to the passenger seat, which is empty because he put Kai in the back. And he's like, uh, nobody, I'm alone. And she goes, really? Because I just got the weirdest feeling. And while she's saying that, Kai is blowing fog onto the glass and drawing a little heart in the window. What am I supposed to do with that? Oh my God, this is also the moment where Damon parks and gets out and he's still talking to Bonnie on the phone and he leaves Kai in the back seat and Kai doesn't know how to get out of the car, which is hilarious because when he grabbed Bonnie in the back of the car in <laughs> season six, this is where he they were in this vehicle. <laughs> so does that mean that he got stuck in the car then too? Because he literally has to like roll over the front and passenger seat and then he like tumbles out into the road. I, did he do that in season six? Because I had canon that now, he did. Bonnie figures out it's Kai because she's a genius and she's livid that Damon would even sort of kind of consider ever trusting him again. She decides to hell with Damon and his nonsense. She's just gonna go directly to Cade and ask him for help herself. We go back to Caroline. She is helping Matt in the police station to handle all of Stefan's victims. She's basically recompelling them with new stories. They are paying people off, which is like a nice thing to do, but also it's really bad. Like the amount of like ripple effect that Stefan has had, it's, it's really hard to like ignore it and look past it in this moment. Matt is of course livid once again, but thankfully this time around, Caroline doesn't take his shit. She calls him out and tells him to be quiet because she recognizes how bad it is and like him bullying her isn't doing anybody any favors. Stefan is digging his grave and like lightly taunting Dorian because that's how Stefan handles stress, I guess, but he's trying to get him to realize like, you know, you can't really kill me. Like, you know that, right? Have you thought about what you're gonna do after you kill me? Because hell is real, bro. And if you do this, that's where you're gonna go. And let me tell you, it's awful. Dorian isn't having any of it. And he calls Stefan out on how stupid it is that he thinks his suffering is anything like what Dorian has gone through losing his family. Stefan just keeps arguing that he thinks he can atone and he should be able to atone. And Dorian's like, you can't bring people back from the dead. And it just gets really intense really quickly. This is a really good scene. Dorian goes, in the real world, people like you get the needle. You don't get to be good. You're supposed to go to hell permanently. Like someone needed to say it. Someone needed to say it. And then Dorian shoots him. Stefan just falls down into the grave, gasping for air. Rick and the girls are settling into one of the armory cells. Rick then gets a notification that Kai is back on Twitter. Our boy is back on his social medias. I'm not surprised. And he's also pissed that Damon thought it was a good idea to involve Bonnie in any of this. Meanwhile, at the diner where Kai and Damon are, he starts bleeding from the nose and coughing up blood. He's also still the worst. Like, don't think that he isn't because he taunts Damon and is like, if you don't hurry up and fix me, I'm gonna die and your shot at happiness is gonna go with me. So chop, chop. Damon throws him into a booth and we get another moment of him being adorable and sick. Like I'm, I have such a type in men, okay? I want them to be a little pathetic, a little sarcastic. I'm, I'm easy to please when it comes to my boys on TV. All right, that's all I want. He tells us a little bit about hell, confirming like what we kind of knew from Damon, which is that you're on fire the whole time and you're just being like tormented by your past. He's clearly like very afraid of Cade also. I know I said that already, but like he's, he's like deeply troubled by Cade looking for him or maybe coming back for him. Damon tells him about the sirens and how he worked for Cade and he was also in hell, so he knows how bad it is. And that gives Kai the idea of being like, wait, hold on, what if I kill some bad people and we send them to hell and then that earns me my right to stay in the world? Damon's like, um, I'm trying to be good now, okay? I don't wanna kill people anymore. I don't wanna risk my future with Elena. And Kai laughs in his face and is like, if you think 
one more murder is gonna make the difference for you. Like I have some very bad news. <laughs> So Damon agrees and then they kill the cook who was like, you know, sexually harassing the waitress behind them over by the counter. Rick calls Caroline because remember him and the girls have been traveling and he's like, do you want to see them before, you know, we leave again once all of this is handled? And she's like, yes, absolutely. He says, great, because I also kind of need some parenting advice. And we see in the window behind him, like of the cell, that the girls are like levitating crayons above their heads while they color. So something's up with their magic. Stefan tells Dorian that it's obvious he's never shot anybody before because he did not hit anything fatal and he's gonna take forever to bleed out. But if Dorian would like, he could shoot him in the head and if he doesn't wanna deal with the mess, he could just do it in the heart. And Dorian's like, will you be quiet? And Stefan's like, I'm just trying to help make this easier on you, please. All of a sudden, Dorian, because he is a good man, he starts panicking and he's like, oh, what have I done? And he jumps down into the hole and starts like putting pressure on the wound for Stefan and trying to call 911, but there's no service. Stefan tells him it's really okay and he can just leave him there to die. And Dorian's like, no, this isn't okay, get up. And he like drags Stefan out of the grave and they start like limping away. Bonnie meets up with Cade back at the little coffee shop where they first met. We're learning more about her psychic powers, which if you will remember way back in the very beginning, like season one, early days, Bonnie was having like prophetic dreams and like she would touch people and get like flashes of things. And Grams was like, yeah, girl, that's cause you're psychic. <laughs> and like a lot of the witches have that, but Bonnie is going to become like a special version of that. Okay. So hers are like real strong, which is why Kate is so drawn to her. Also, now that they're like aware of each other, he says that they have a psychic link to one another now and that's why she was able to find him so easily. So similarly to how when Cade died, he created hell and that was his like big blast of power. That's what Bonnie did with Enzo and that's why I'm saying she's like a special type of psychic witch, okay? Because that doesn't normally happen. He says that he can help her make contact with Enzo because he can sort of like guide her power for her, but she's gonna have to trust him. And she she just freaking puts her hands in the devil's hands no questions asked and is like help me see my man immediately he has her remember exactly how she felt the moment Enzo died we hear her like scream echo in her mind and then the cafe sort of starts going crazy like the lights start flickering and there's wind inside from her rage he tells her that those emotions are like what made the world so she needs to stay connected to those so she's like living in the trauma of that moment they hear Enzo call to her. Kate tells her to stay in that moment of the trauma and call back to him. She does, and then when she opens her eyes, she's in the freaking burned down cabin with Enzo. We see him like walk right up to her. They can hug, they can kiss, they can touch each other. But he warns her that she needs to stay away from Cade because Cade is only pretending to help her. He really just wants Enzo's soul because Enzo was supposed to go to hell and Bonnie basically said no and put him in her own little world. So Bonnie blinks again and she's back in the cafe with Cade. He's like, what did you see? And she says, nothing, it didn't work. He goes, then why are you so upset? Because psychic witches. And she's like, um, you just made me relive like the worst moment of my life. Thanks for nothing, I'm leaving. Caroline is finishing up with the victims over at the police station and Matt now has some jokes about like, maybe now she understands how hard it is to blame everything on animal attacks. He's so wishy-washy with his annoyance and anger. That is one of the reasons why he annoys me so much. I'm like, just be consistent. Dorian calls and admits everything to Matt, begging him for help. Of course, Caroline is in the room, so she hears everything and like runs off before Matt can even get off the phone. We then cut back to Kai eating the cook in the diner. Now someone explained to me why we get to hear the sound of the little vampire fang face, okay? With the veins and everything it makes, there's like a little sound cue that happens. We hear that. And we see like a half shadowed version of like the faintest little veins on Kai's face as he like lifts up from the guy's neck. And that is it. That is it. That is all the vampire face we get from him. Whose idea was that? Did Chris just not want to wear the contacts? Like I want answers from somebody, okay? <laughs> Show me his fangs before I riot. Why is that so hard? Damon asks if he feels better and Kai is like, meh. So then Damon shoves him up against the wall and for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just the angle of the shot or what, the lighting, I don't know. It's significantly more obvious that Chris is like quite a bit taller than Ian. So Ian's like looking up at him 
and we can tell and he's trying to be intimidating but Kai just goes wow and it's so much more funny because it's like you, you could take him you could just take him right now just deck him you, you can get away he admits that he feels a little better but like emphasis on little and they're gonna have to keep killing people in order for him to stick around. Damon calls Bonnie and she ignores him and then gets to her car and Cade is waiting for her. He grabs her by the head and like uses his powers to look into her mind. So now not only does he know that she was lying about Enzo, but she's also aware that Kai Parker's running around in the world. And he's like, well, that's two things I don't like. So now I'm even angrier than I was a minute ago. He's super pissed because she is the first witch ever to make another dimension, like since he did it all those years ago when he died. Stefan and Dorian are still struggling along through the woods and Stefan keeps asking if Dorian is okay. And finally Dorian is like, no, I'm not. Would you shut up? Dorian says he wishes he wouldn't have done this to him. And Stefan's like, yeah, dude, me too. And then he passes out. Caroline shows up, but remember Stefan took the cure. So her blood can't heal him anymore. We then see Stefan like hovering outside his body, like in limbo with Cade talking to him. Stefan says he doesn't want to let go. And Cade is like, it would be so much more fair to Caroline if you would just leave her behind because like you're dragging her down. Okay, she's got no reason to go to hell, which now, Caroline did also kill people. So I don't know what the, I don't really know what Cade's criteria is for like what souls qualify as evil. I don't know how he grades. Okay, but Caroline has done some stuff. So she's not perfect. None of them are. But he basically implies that if Stefan just comes with him now, Caroline will be fine without him and she'll move on and she'll be happy. Stefan's too stubborn for that though. He says he wants to live. And Cade goes, that's only human. And then Stefan wakes up in his body. Kai dumps a body in a dumpster. And Damon rounds back on him and says that Cade is now aware that he's out and he's like looking for him. Now Kai freaks out here like significantly. And he's like, what do we do? What do we do? How do we go? <laughs> like genuinely panics for a second. A lot of people like hate this and think like his personality in season eight is kind of screwed up. And like, I'm not saying you're wrong by any means, but I guess just the way that I look at it, like, no shit he's scared of Kate. Kate is the devil. <laughs> like, like, the literal devil. Yes, they're all scared of him. Even if you're a person who looks at Kai and you're like, this is evil incarnate. There's no saving him. He is the worst of the worst. I still think it's completely valid for that same person to go, I don't want to burn alive every day for all of eternity. I mean, do you? <laughs> So Damon's big idea is like looking for atonement by like figuring out like a big thing that he could do to like make amends. And Kai immediately is like, I simply can't do that. Like that sounds like a terrible idea. Maybe I would rather die. <laughs> and Damon is like, no, no, trust me. People do forgive. And where there's forgiveness, there's redemption. So what you're gonna do if you want yours is bring Elena back to me right now. He really waited around all day with him for the perfect moment to spring that suggestion. Like, good work, Damon. I will give you that. You're trying really hard. Matt goes to Dorian in the hospital and tells him that Stefan is going to live. Caroline took care of the police, so it's all going to go away. It's going to look like a hunting accident. Dorian's not going to get in trouble. Dorian now thinks that he's just as bad as Stefan, and Matt is like, listen, Dorian, we've all done bad things, but that feeling of guilt that you have, that's what makes you different from them. That's what makes us better. Y'all are giving me some mixed signals. Matt then gives Dorian all of Stefan's cold case files and basically says that Stefan wants Dorian to have them and he can choose what to do with them at any given point. So if Dorian wants Stefan to just go to jail for the rest of his life, he will do that. Stefan's in his hospital bed. Caroline comes in and tells him that the reason why she was so busy that day is because she was like helping make all of his past misdeeds go away. He tells her about how he saw Cade and he basically had the choice to like go to sleep and just be done with it and she's like, you mean by going to hell? Like, is that, is that what you think you deserve? Cause you've only been a human for a few days and maybe you should just relax and try to figure out who you are now. He says that he thinks he can do that, but he's gonna have to leave Mystic Falls alone. She explodes on him and says that if he wants to be a martyr over everything that he did in his life, he cannot blame it on her because it is all about him. She also admits that she never knew what a future was gonna look like with him. And before that was exciting, but now it just feels misguided. And then she leaves him in the hotel room as she should. 
Bonnie lights more candles at the cabin this time. She's trying to reach back out to Enzo and then like, whoop, they go into her magic world and he's there in the doorway and he's like, hello, love. And they get to kiss. It's everything to me. He's also not like completely alive. He, he's basically a ghost that she can touch, sort of. It, I, I don't remember if they're gonna explain it better than that later on, okay? But it's different from whatever the people from hell are dealing with, okay? It's not the same as that, but it's similar. Rick brings the girls over to Caroline's house. They're still in town. That's a deeply safe choice that I'm sure will have no repercussions for anyone. While making dinner, Lizzie freaks out because she doesn't want the pink cup, she wants the purple one. And when Caroline is like, but you always use the pink cup, Lizzie just grabs her and starts siphoning her out of anger. It's almost like we shouldn't have attached the siphon power to negative emotions. Who saw that becoming a problem? Any of us, did any of us think that maybe that was a bad idea? I fucking told you. <laughs> Josie then goes, don't hurt mommy, and Cindy, and she almost lights Lizzie on fire. She legitimately almost barbecues her twin sister at the freaking kitchen counter. They snatch the girls away from each other, and they're like, that is not a fun, jokey spell, okay? You can't just shout that at people. Rick goes, yeah, I don't know what's going on, okay? They just started acting up three days ago. Their magic's being really weird. I don't know how to control it. Three days ago, you say, like when they're... Coven leader uncle came home? Interesting. <laughs> well, speaking of the coven leader uncle, Kai and Damon go to the crypt where Elena is being kept. I guess the Airbnb is gone. Kai leans over the coffin and he's like, hi sleepyhead, you remember me? Damon is not having any of that. And he's like, can you just get on with it, creeper? Wake her up. Kai says he needs more magic first since his is still being weird. And when Damon asks what he needs, Kai's like, you. And he just snatches his arm and starts siphoning Damon. He also steals the like Cade killing knife. He's like holding Damon like this and he goes like this and the knife like jumps out of uh, Damon's jacket into his hand. I love when he uses nonverbal magic. It speaks to me on a spiritual and emotional level. That is my man. Damon begs him to stop and Kai is still holding his arm and he just smiles and he says, I've been in hell long enough to know that there's no such thing as redemption. There are only promises and bargains and tricks we play on ourselves to make us believe that we're good people. I'm not a good person. I own that. And if I'm going down, I'm going out with a bang. And then like the Parker witch he is, he lets Damon go, smacks his hand on the coffin, whispers Invisique and disappears. Damon desiccates and then falls over like a little rock. Oh no. <laughs> So now Damon, who is close to death, gets a little spirit visit from Cade. Cade wants the dagger, but obviously Kai took it, so Damon doesn't have it anymore. Bonnie opens the door to the cabin after her little psychic romp with Enzo, and Stefan is standing there. He explains that he's leaving town to atone, and she's having none of it. She's basically just like, okay, have a great trip. Don't ever talk to me again, and she just shuts the door in his face. When she goes back inside, Enzo is still there. Turns out when she's in this like, you know, high emotion, whether it's like anger, or sadness, any of those kind of things, it's easier for him to like pop over and talk to her. He says, she's being a little too harsh on Stefan, but she says Stefan earned it when he killed Enzo. And so she's mad at him. She hates him actually. The whole Enzo convincing her to forgive Stefan arc that's one of my Roman empires. That's insane. Wh whose idea was that? Stefan is packing to leave town and then Damon shows up and says that Cade now has Elena. Kai traded her for his freedom, but now Cade wants the dagger because Kai like kept that. So he looked the devil in the eyes and lied to him and somehow managed to get away with the dagger. Please, you're telling me that's not the Kai Parker we know and love? Like, he's different in season eight. He is. He's going to be different later on when we see him again, too. But, like, he's just getting more unhinged. He's just settling into true insanity. Caroline catches the twins playing with their flower girl dresses that they, like, unsafely got down from the top of the wardrobe. She tries to explain to them gently, because remember, they're, like, three or four years old at this point, and that the wedding might not happen, and that, like, you know, sometimes things are more complicated and it's hard to explain. Josie starts to cry, and Lizzie 
lights a fire across the room on the desk. Like she just sets something on fire. And then when Caroline is like, oh my God, a fire, Lizzie starts to smile. It's a crime that we never see Lizzie with Kai, okay? They put Josie and Kai together and that's amazing. I love it. They didn't put Lizzie and Kai together because the shenanigans? That would have been pandemonium. Oh my God. Speaking of our boy, we cut back to him. He is shamashed at a karaoke bar singing Knocking on Heaven's Door. Unlike Caroline Forbes, Kai Parker cannot sing. This is stupidly funny because Chris Wood was like literally just on Broadway. Like, like recently, like within a year, that man was on Broadway. So they really made the decision that like Kai cannot sing because we cannot give him any more attractive qualities. And now we have to struggle through listening to Chris pretend to not be able to sing. It's very silly. And he's got a little fruity drink with an umbrella in his hand. Stefan's there to meet with him. Kai calls him not only Stefan, but also Steven. And Steven is my favorite. I wish that he did that more than once. That one's the best. We haven't really talked about that, I don't think, but that is something that Kai does. He says everybody's names wrong. Stefan tracked him down via Twitter and he wants the knife. Kai's like, no, actually, you cannot have it because it is my insurance policy. And Stefan's like, okay, how's this for an insurance policy? I will kill Kate if you give it to me. Kai's like, yeah, I actually don't trust you enough to do that. And Stefan's like, but here's the thing, you're afraid of him, so you're not gonna do it, but I feel no fear, okay? So I'm happy to do this for us. Kai tries to siphon him and then has his mind like completely blown by the fact that Stefan is now a human. And then just to be a jerk, he like vamp stabs, like really quickly grabs the dagger and stabs it into Stefan's hand on the bar. And he explains that when you kill the devil, you kill hell. So he doesn't think Stefan can handle that responsibility. He asks if Stefan has any last words before he kills him and Stefan says, Damon. And Kai's like, oh my god, that's so sweet. I will be sure to tell your brother that you were thinking about him when you died. And then, yes, Damon shows up behind him and snaps his neck. Like, I'm not saying he is the smartest. I'm saying he's my favorite anyway. Rick admits to Caroline that he was lying and the girl's magic has been going a little crazy for a while to the point where they are no longer in school because every time he sends them, something awful goes wrong and he can't keep explaining why Lizzie can make things explode with her mind. She talks to him about how screwed up things are getting with Stefan and all of that that she's dealing with. And then thankfully, she says that unfortunately, this is probably their fault. The girls are super sensitive and they've sort of just been throwing crazy stuff at them their whole lives. Then Damon and Stefan come in carrying a still very dead Kai Parker. They dump him into a cell and Caroline helps Damon do that. And Damon's like, I would like to know why you're with me and not your fiance. She tells him that Stefan once again has made the decision to leave her behind. Damon says that he would bet anything that Stefan thinks he's protecting her, which is, you know, of course, how he felt about Elena. Kai wakes up behind them and is like, can we stop talking about Stefan? What you need is somebody who can explain to you what's going on with your Gemini Cubbin twins. Who could that be? Right, yes, me, the freaking coven leader. Downstairs, Stefan apologizes to Rick for bringing Kai to them, but he says once he gets the knife and they kill Cade, then Rick can do whatever he wants and he can send Kai back to hell or anything else that he wants to do with him. They also need Rick's help and Rick is like, why would I agree to work with you on this? And Stefan just goes, because your name isn't Donovan or Maxwell. Enzo and Bonnie are in the burnout cabin again. Once more, he asks her why she can't forgive Stefan because Enzo also worked for Cade and did some pretty terrible things. No, say it with me, no. He reminds her that she still loved him through his darkness. And she says, okay, look, maybe I just need time. Maybe I will forgive Stefan, but I'm not gonna do it right now. It's only been like a week, if it's even been that long. He warns her that hating Stefan forever will eat her alive, which again, y'all are giving me some mixed freaking signals. Do you see now why the second half of season six gets on my nerves so much? Do you get it? Are you seeing why that annoys me as much as it does? Damon and Stefan go to square up with Kate. Damon is like, do you want to tell me why you were planning to leave town? And Stefan goes, no. And Damon's like, that's okay. Caroline already told me everything because I'm a girl's girl. 
We find out in this moment that Stefan is dead set on killing Cade because he blames himself since he's the one that compelled Matt to ring the bell in the first place. Damon didn't believe Kai when he said that killing Cade would kill Hell, so now he thinks this whole thing is a suicide mission. He's worried about what Cade might do to Elena if they screw it up and make him angry. Stefan says he's sorry about that, but he has to. Damon says, I'm sorry too, brother, but I can't let anything happen to her or you, except when he goes to like knock Stefan out, Stefan somehow manages to vervain him at human speed and Damon goes down. Caroline tucks the girls into bed and they apologize about the magical outburst with the dresses and the fire. And Caroline is like, it's okay, um, but do you guys think you could stop making weird shit happen? Like, could you just be more normal, please? And they are in bed and they just sort of look at each other and like creepy twin shrug smile. N I don't like the twins. I don't like them. <laughs> That's not true. I love the girls, but oh my God, they're creepy when they're kids. Caroline, realizing that like, yeah, they don't have a handle on this. They're three years old, goes to Kai and is like, I need to know why you want to help us. Now look, this is the scene that way back in season six, I told you it was gonna take forever to get to, but we finally reached it. Remember I warned you that the pieces of his puzzle are like few and far between, but once they all come together, you're like, oh, Oh boy. So he says that the same thing happened to him when he was their age. Because the siphon power doesn't leave you with like a constant source of magic, all of your like magical training is like sporadic and it ends up being like random bursts of magic, making them even harder to control because you can't practice the way that somebody who has a steady stream of magic can. He says it was torture and it was lonely. Caroline is like, um, baby, you're literally a twin. Like, wasn't Joe going through the same thing? He's like, no, Joe wasn't a siphon, okay? Joe was a Glinda. She was a perfect little witch who could do spells. Everybody thought she was super talented. And then I'm over here wandering about like an addict, fiending for my next hit like I'm on fire. He says the family isolated him and they made the rule that he couldn't touch anybody, which obviously at three years old would be a little stunting to emotional development. <laughs> like. Thank you. I'm so, this confirmation means everything to me because there are people who come for me routinely about my take on him, which is that if he had just been nurtured, like the oldest son with the birthright of being the next leader could have been, we would have had a different show. We would have had a different situation on our hands. The, the whole Parkers, the, that all that would have been different. And I would just like to say that I was right. This baby boy is a sociopath and not a psychopath. And there is a difference and the difference is it's half his family's fault, okay? I'm not apologizing for him. I'm just telling you that now we know all the reasons why he turned out the way he did. Anyway, Caroline is like, okay, thank you for the lore dump. Uh, how do we fix them? Which again, wrong language. We need to knock that off because what did he just say? He reminds her that she should really just be looking around, seeing as how they brought the twins into a literal hotbed of magical artifacts and activity. So no shit they're having trouble controlling themselves, okay? They are literal baby siphons in a giant house full of magical items. Like this is the worst possible place that they could be. And then he goes, I mean, there's practically magic in the walls, see? And he puts his hand on the glass of the window and it immediately starts to glow red and the glass starts shattering, like straight, just immediate. Caroline backs up, but for some reason does not vamp run away. She should have just immediately started running. So he lifts the other hand and snaps her neck and then explodes the window. Freaking alarm starts going off. The lighting turns like ominously red behind him and he holds up his casting fingers and goes, I can't be trusted around this idiot witch man. Like, oh, I love everything he does. Everything he does, I love. It's such a disease. It's Oh my god. Stefan wanders into a cave and finds Elena's coffin and then Cade shows up and starts talking about how Elena has a beautiful soul. Cade asks how Stefan thinks a human would ever manage to kill him and he wants to know what he thinks his chances are. Stefan looks down at his phone and he sees that it's 7.59 and he's like, well at the moment, not very good. Then at 8 o'clock, Rick starts banging the bell repeatedly and Cade collapses in pain. Stefan takes his sweet ass time walking over to him before he cuts him on the arm and like Cade does get a wound from it so we know that the dagger in fact works. But then 
the girls call Rick, they are under their bed, and they tell him, Daddy, a crash happened and we heard mommy scream, what do we do? He tells them to go hide where he taught them to go if a monster ever comes. And then he just leaves the bell to go save them, which, I mean, obviously he does that, but like, oh no, Stefan. In the cave, yeah, Stefan stabs Kate in the heart, but because the bell stopped ringing, I don't know if he just didn't do it hard enough or if Cade wasn't vulnerable enough. I, I don't know, but it didn't work. And then he just starts beating Stefan silly saying that he's missed this kind of personal violence. He's so scary in this scene, and he is still wearing the sexy gray suit. Then Damon rocks up and says that they had a deal, and he has the dagger now, so give back Elena. Cade is like, oh, you know what? I'm revising the deal. You can pick one soul. And he lights Elena's coffin on fire and tells Damon to pick between Stefan or Elena. In the cabin with Enzo, Bonnie starts having psychic flashes and seeing Elena's coffin on fire. She realizes that she's got a link to her too, so she takes off, leaving Enzo behind. Rick is racing through the tunnels in the armory trying to call Caroline, but Kai answers her phone. He says that Caroline's taking a little neck snap nap, and Rick is like, okay, so run away. Like, you already escaped, just leave. Kai strolls down the hallway. He sees the axe that Bonnie used to cut off Enzo's hand in season seven. He goes, and then picks up the axe, still on the phone with Rick, telling him that he's absolutely gonna go after his nieces and kill them. And I know and I understand that they are small, small children, okay? They are his nieces. He is their uncle. They are his flesh and blood. This is awful, nasty behavior. All I can think is that he's holding the axe that Bonnie held. And there are so many weapons in that giant house. Okay, we just went over how big the house is and how full of artifacts it is. And they picked the same weapon. Why did they do that? <laughs> Rick says, I will kill you. And Kai's like, uh -huh. I'd certainly like to see you try. You are gonna have to catch me first. So come and get me. The phone breaks up so Rick can't hear him, but Kai puts it down and says that he is going to look for the girls where children always hide. And then he walks into their bedroom, looks at their bed, and this time he just smashes the ax directly down through the mattress instead of flipping the bed. So like that's gotta count as some form of growth, I think. Damon's trying to get out of making the choice between Stefan and Elena. Cade says this has been the choice all along and it's time to finally end their suffering. So Damon chooses himself and says that he will give up his soul to Cade if it means that Elena and Stefan can be free. Cade breaks off a piece of Elena's coffin and throws it over to him so that he can kill himself. Stefan is begging him not to do it. Damon says he's sorry, it's been a hell of a ride before lifting the stake to his heart. He does make Cade put out the coffin and then he says like, you need to promise me that you're never gonna touch Elena's soul and Cade does. Stefan is still begging on the floor. Damon goes, see you in hell, Cade. And Cade goes, yes, you will. Before Damon stabs himself in the heart and dies. Like, do any of you guys believe when people die anymore? When did that wear off for you? I'd love to know when you stopped thinking that people would stay dead in this show. Because for me, it, it was a while ago. Was, I just stopped believing it. Anyway, back at the armory, Kai is now humming nursery rhymes while he drags the axe through the house looking for the twins. We get him being like, Josie, yoo-hoo, Lizzie, come out where Uncle Kai can see you. He's, he's cracked. He's lost it. We already knew that though, okay? Remember the look on his face when he was standing on the, the front of the house in 1903 and I told you that whatever was coming next, we weren't going to like it? Did you think that was just the wedding that I was talking about? No. He ends up down in the tunnels, like in the vault, uh, where he can hear the girls talking. And he unfortunately does say idiots, which is... I just, I wish you would have just left, honey. I wish you would just, I wish you would just leave. <laughs> and then he siphons the secret wall away to reveal Rick standing there with a phone recording of the girls. Rick freaking chain whips him in the face and knocks him onto the ground and goes, that was for my kids. And then he hits him again and he's like, that was for me. And then he raises up the chain again and he's like, and this is for, and Kai just freaking nails him in the nuts. Like I'm talking like bang, just gets him. Rick goes down instantly and Kai goes, Kai Parker don't fight there, which is one of my favorite lines. Put it on a t-shirt, I want it. It's everything to me. He gets in Rick's face with the ax and he's like, you were saying something that was for, 
And then Caroline snaps his neck and goes, Joe, that's what he was gonna say. Even as a Kai fan, I love this scene. I love Caroline getting to say that. And if you're like, man, I wish Rick had gotten to say it, don't worry. It's gonna take such a long time. I'm not gonna tell you where or when, but Rick is gonna get to say that to him. It's coming later on. <laughs> so Stefan in the cave pulls the stake out of his very dead brother and is just holding him. And then he realizes that the dagger is still in the cave. Cade is outside, snooping through the weird, like, limbo world, looking for Damon's soul. Damon comes out, Cade's gonna take him away, but then all of a sudden, like, the magic dragging Damon towards Cade just, like, cuts out. Bonnie walks up and can't see anything, but Cade tells her to just, like, open their mind connection, and then she's suddenly in that little limbo world, and she can see Damon, and she realizes he's dead, and she's super upset. She says that she will not be letting Cade take him without a fight. Cade warns her that if she tries to keep Damon from him, her mind will shatter, which will mean that Elena will lose Damon and Bonnie in one go. Damon begs her to just let him go, and then he's like holding on to a little rock while he's being like sucked up by Cade, and he lets go of that so that he will just like fly away. But at that very moment, Stefan shows up and stabs Cade in the heart with the dagger. He starts coughing up blood immediately, and Stefan goes, bet you didn't see that one coming, because he's a psychic. You, do you see what he did there? Cade goes, go to hell, and Stefan says, you first, before Cade just freaking implodes. It is such a cool looking death. I love the way he dies. It knocks them all out. Also, the siren song is playing in the background over this. Stefan wakes up first and crawls over to Bonnie and he wakes her up. She says, nice save but this doesn't mean I forgive you. He jokes and is like, it's a first step. I'll never stop trying until you do. Or you could just respect her boundaries and leave her alone. Damon's also back in his body safe and sound and they have a little group hug. We cut to Stefan and Damon then on the hood of Damon's car sharing bourbon that was supposed to be Stefan's wedding present. He tells Stefan that he's crazy if he thinks leaving Mystic Falls is the answer. Damon says the brave thing to do is to stay but Stefan is just convinced that he has to prove himself and pay for what he did. And Damon reminds him, like, my guy, we have literally all done terrible stuff, okay? I'm your big brother and I am like deeply screwed up. In a fun twist of writing, now Damon says that being with the people he loves, not just Elena, is enough to remind him of how to be good. Rick and Caroline are also drinking and Caroline tells us that they called Bonnie and she had a perfect idea of what to do with Kai, so I'm sure I'm going to love it. This is when Rick gets the idea to start a school for kids like Josie and Lizzie to help them. He wants Caroline to also help because she's so good with kids. We will be getting to that later too. Side note, do y'all want me to talk about the originals and legacies at the same time? Or do you just want me to do all of the originals and then all of legacies? Like we could alternate weeks or we could just do one and then the other. Let me know. Stefan shows up and once again ask Caroline to marry him. Rightfully, our girl has whiplash, but she says she loves him. She's just worried about the fact that he's human now. Like, does he know what that means? He says it means he gets to grow old with his best friend and help her raise her daughters and then help raise their kids after that. It will be enough for him because he loves her. She says yes, and they kiss again in front of the glowing yellow armory windows. My baby boy wakes up chained to a chair in the karaoke bar with the spin doctors playing on a loop around him. He's like immediately, no, this song makes my ears bleed. I can't be back in hell. What is going on? But Bonnie is there waiting for him to wake up and she says, that's impossible. Kate is dead, hell is gone. He goes, oh, are you here to punish me? Cause it's kind of hot. She says she's fully psychic now. And so she knows that his worst fear is going back into a prison world. And our boy goes white as a sheet. And he's like, that is impossible. You can't have done that to me unless you have. And she pulls out an ascendant. And she's like, you mean one of these? Yes, your nieces are so talented. You'd be so proud of them. She's like, it's just gonna be you and your insecure little mind and a song that you hate on the jukebox forever. And she didn't give him a weather event like the solar eclipse or the northern lights. So there is no way for him to get out. He starts 
begging her to stop. He's like, please, please, like rattling the chains, calling her name. And look, the smirk that she has on her face before she turns back around to him, you can't tell me. <laughs> like, Miss Girl, you did come here to torture him. You are enjoying it and it is hot. You need to just admit it to him, yourself, and us because I can't take this anymore. But then it turns out he's just screwing with her and he starts laughing. And he's like, I lost a bet. I can't believe you guys fell for it. We cut back to Elena in her coffin and Damon standing over her. Bonnie shows up looking sick to her stomach. She and Kai then simultaneously like explain to us what Kai told her. Again, why is it filmed this way? They are saying the same monologue and we just keep cutting between the two of them. Like, enough. Yeah, so hell was not destroyed. Ownership was just transferred to someone else. The only person worse than Cade who hates the Mystic Falls gang like it's her passion in life. As Kai says, the myth, the legend, the baddest bitch of them all, fucking Catherine Pierce. And then we cut back to Kai alone in the prison world after Bonnie has left him, just screaming for Bonnie in those chains. Like my poor idiot boy, I know what's coming for you and it's so not good. It's so not good. For any of you that read Crescent City 3, this is gonna be such a niche reference, but it amazes me that he didn't pull a Rune Dannon to get out of those chains, okay? If you know, you know. I He didn't do that. Why didn't he do that? You'd think that that would work. We hard cut back to Damon after witnessing Kai having a meltdown and Damon just goes, huh, we're toast. And then we cut to black. Okay, so we open with a back silhouette shot of who we can only assume is Miss Catherine Pierce. She's wandering around town in her boots. She kills somebody and then gets blood all over the Founder's Day float. Bonnie shows up to see Caroline and she's like, okay, I only want to talk about the impending doom on the town. We are not discussing Stefan or Enzo. Peter's back and he brought Kelly with him. They go to see Matt at the grill. Turns out he's not talked to her in four years. And now they're back together. The gang has a meeting to see what to do now that Catherine is back. They think that she came across when Kai did, so. There could be a lot of people back from hell, who's to say? Dorian is helping and he is also now planning to just hold on to those cold case files and blackmail Stefan for the rest of his life. They need to make a new devil killing weapon with Catherine's bones. Luckily though, Pete's back in town. So the boys are gonna go get the bones. Pete's gonna make the knife. Bonnie is gonna work on trying to uh, dismantle like that hell realm from the outside without having to mess with Catherine. And Stefan is gonna be used as bait with Caroline, they're just gonna throw the wedding because they know that Catherine won't be able to resist tormenting them. This obviously leads Bonnie to drink because she's very upset. It's complicated because like, obviously she loves Caroline and she wants Caroline to be happy. And so Caroline loves Stefan. And, and so of course Caroline said yes to marrying him, but also Stefan killed Enzo. This is when Bonnie says she will not be coming to the wedding, okay? Because she does love Caroline and she would do anything for her, but she will not do this. Caroline's really sweet and understanding about it and also sorry because she recognizes how hard it is for Bonnie to still love her knowing that Caroline is like so closely connected to Stefan and after what he did. But she says that she's just grateful that Bonnie's willing to be her friend at all. Stefan's listening in on this and he feels really sad and pitiful. Damon and Stefan go down to the cave where Catherine barbecued herself when she was trying to possess Elena. Remember that during the Traveler arc? Damon reminds him that evil Ripper Stefan is the one that killed Enzo, not good, nice human Stefan. So good, nice human Stefan needs to get over it. Damon also says in this moment while like playing with Catherine's bones um, that he hates her and he blames her for everything that happened to them and she is a terrible monster who he never wants anything to do with ever again. And Stefan is like, I wouldn't say she was like completely terrible. Like we did have some good times too because of her. Okay. And then Damon pulls out the bourbon and is like, we're having a bachelor party in the cave with the bones. Woo. And they start drinking. So Kelly's back. Who saw that coming? Uh, she's talking to Matt about how she's different now and she wants to be a changed mom and try again. But then she goes over into the bathroom and starts puking blood into the sink and bleeding from her nose. 
a girl comes in, sees the mess. Kelly says, yes, that's what happens when you die and then come back from hell. But then she kills the girl and maybe eats her? That part is left ambiguous. Damon brings human Stefan home. He is so trashed. He's so cute though. He like passes out on the couch and he's like, please don't be mad at me, Caroline. And she tucks him in on the couch and is just like, Damon, you're a terrible influence. And Damon's like, no, he's just a lightweight human. Come get drunk with me, Caroline. And so they go out to party instead. Bonnie is listening to Enzo's old man music because she misses him. And then he shows up because she's kind of sad and it's really cute. He's trying to remind her that she should not be relying on pain to keep their connection alive because she's a witch and she should just be able to use her regular magic. But she reminds him that she still doesn't have it back. They dance and once again, Enzo encourages her to be nicer to Stefan, but she just can't do it. So he says, okay, if you can't focus on his happiness, try to focus on Caroline. She's your best friend and you should love her through this even though it's hard. He tells her that he is happy and he shares a memory from when they were over in France together of him basically standing by a church with her and thinking about marrying her one day. He says he still considers himself the luckiest man on earth. Damon's doing practice best man speeches with Caroline. It's pretty freaking cute. He ends up giving her Elena's necklace at the end so that she can use it as her something borrowed during the wedding. Caroline opens up her wedding gift from Bonnie. It's gonna be her something new and it's this beautiful little princess crown because when they were kids, Caroline said she wanted to be a princess on her wedding day. Rick and the girls show up and like, yeah, it's not safe for them to be there, but he knew that Catherine wouldn't believe it if they didn't come. So they just had Valerie put like a special Gemini family like protection thing on them and they're gonna be fine no matter what now. Rick is also not staying because it's too difficult for him. So I guess Caroline's gonna single parent on her wedding day. Thank you, Rick, dad of the year. We get another weird moment also of Rick being like, you're right girls, she does look beautiful. And like crying and then telling Caroline to go be happy, get out. Kelly meets Peter at the wedding and tells him that she knows about the dagger. He says he already gave it to Stefan. So then she kills Pete. Stefan and Damon are getting ready. Stefan says he hopes that one day he can see Damon like this with Elena. And Damon says, me too. I hope your hero hair hasn't fallen out, okay? Cause I'm gonna need a best man. Matt meets up with Kelly and she lies and says she has not seen Pete. The boys go down the aisle and the musicians play the Founders Day Waltz that Catherine and Stefan once danced to together. Caroline has a meltdown over not having somebody to walk her down the aisle. And then Bonnie shows up and says she will do it. Someone texts Kelly game on from like up above the wedding venue. We go to Rick wallowing in self-pity about being in love with an immortal teenager who used to be his student at the high school. And Dorian is just trying to work on, you know, dismantling the hell dimension, which is what they should be focusing on. Rick gives a little speech about how he first came to town to kill Damon for taking his wife from him. And then slowly he learned to forgive him for that. And now it turns out that losing everybody is what brought them all together. That's what made them family. While he's talking, we see Bonnie uh, walk the girls down the aisle and then Caroline comes out. Her dress is beautiful. Okay, it's off white. She looks gorgeous. Stefan and her are looking at each other. It's all romantic as Rick explains that sometimes you have to just move forward and continue finding new happiness even when bad things happen. I can't tell you the rage it instills in me to see Bonnie Bennett at this wedding. Front row, front row at this wedding. Thankfully, she doesn't have to stand up next to Caroline, but oh my God, it enrages me. Once Stefan gets up to the aisle, he realizes that the something blue that Caroline thought was from him is actually Catherine's old necklace. Damon starts the ceremony and when he asks if anybody has any objections, Matt and Kelly sneak out, but nothing else happens so they have to just continue on even though they expected Catherine to attack at that moment. They did not write vows because they did not think they were gonna get this far, so they just wing it. Stefan says she's always seen the light in him even when all he saw was the darkness. He reminds her about when she told him when he had broken up with Elena that she figured he would just fall in love again like slowly over time without even realizing it. And he said, girly pop, little did you know, I did that with you. She tells him about how he told her one time that he would wait for her until she was ready for him and she's ready now. And she thinks she's actually been ready from the very first time she saw him in the hallway at the school. 
they do the rings and they kiss and flower petals fall. It's very romantic and nothing bad happens. At the reception, Damon and Bonnie dance and he spins her away and she lands in Enzo's arms and they get to have a moment before he spins her back to Damon and then he's just kind of ghostly watching her dance with his best friend. Caroline and Stefan are being all cute dancing with each other. Kelly freaking opens a gas line and then puts a giant gas container into the fireplace and we see Bonnie and the girls walk by it on their way to the bathroom. Matt's calling Kelly, looking for her, and then he calls Pete, and then he hears Pete's phone, and he finds him, like, in a ditch next to the wedding venue, but he's not dead, somehow. Damon starts giving the best man speech, nearly giving himself away to all the compelled guests by saying 150 years he's been waiting for this moment, and then before he can begin, Kelly shows up and snatches the mic. She says she's known Stefan for years, and she doesn't see the hype. And then she makes fun of Caroline for having accidentally killed Liz and saying if you weren't trying to cure cancer, maybe she'd be here with us today. She bashes Damon for hurting Vicky, and then she turns on the whole room and is like, all of you suck, okay? You never gave me a chance. You turned on me from the second I started screwing up. You treated me like a joke. You guys are the worst people around. She tells Matt that if he hadn't forgotten about her, maybe he would have known that she had a bad fall and she died like two years ago. But she wasn't alone in hell, okay? Catherine was there and Catherine Pierce cared about her. She laughs at them for thinking that they could ever play Catherine and then admits to starting a gas leak in the house. So Caroline goes running, sprinting back to the front doors and it explodes like the whole house every floor explodes into fire and Caroline just gets blasted back. We go to Bonnie and the girls inside. Enzo shows up and realizes that the twins are siphoning magic from Bonnie, which is weird because Bonnie's not supposed to have any magic. She's afraid if she lets them take it, then she will lose access to the world where Enzo is. He says that he will see her again. He believes it. And when they do see each other again, there will just be peace and no one will ever part them again. He begs her to use her magic and teach them how to put out the flames instead of just like bubbling a charm on them or something and walking through the house because they are currently standing in the middle of a burning room and no flames are touching them. So why can't they just walk out? Enzo says, live your life, Bonnie Bennett. All of it. Promise me. She promises him. She says she loves him. He says he loves her. And then he disappears. So Bonnie and the girls send the fire into the fireplace, okay, put out all the flames, and then they walk outside to Caroline and Stefan. So once again, Bonnie has given up Enzo for Caroline and Stefan's happiness. I understand she had to save the girls. It enrages me. Damon asks why Kelly would even work with Catherine. She says that Catherine promised to get her out of hell and basically like just give her peace for all of eternity. And Catherine's big plan is to burn down Mystic Falls with Hellfire. Matt is like, girl, only a Maxwell or a Donovan can do that. And Kelly goes, yeah, it's good that you're not an only child then. So this whole time that we've been looking at like fake Catherine from behind, if you thought to yourself, she's a little too bouncy. She's a little too girly pop for Miss Catherine Pierce. That's because it was Vicki Donovan the whole time. She is now up at the bell tower, ready to start ringing that bell all over again. Bonnie is back inside the house crying. Stefan is there. And then the bell starts ringing and Bonnie collapses in pain. Kelly chokes on her own blood and dies right in front of Matt. And Bonnie passes out in Stefan's arms, bleeding from the nose. I love a Vampire Diaries wedding. I do. So you remember how I told you that Bonnie passed out? Mm-hmm. I lied a little bit because I didn't want to leave you worrying. Um, no, our girl is dead, okay? We opened <laughs> with Stefan doing like frantic CPR on a very dead Bonnie Bennett. And he's like, the magic was too much for her. Excuse me? So she's dead on the ground. Caroline tries to give her blood. It's not working. She's not waking up. Go into like weird limbo land with Bonnie and she is walking through a forest and we see a sleeping beauty bed. Elena's on the bed. Elena wakes up. They get to talk and hug each other. Elena realizes though that this must mean that Bonnie is dead and she's devastated. And Bonnie, on the other hand, is like, it's okay. Now I get to be with Enzo. I'm ready. Girl, you are still basically a child. Don't talk like that. And then Enzo shows up 
And he's like, sorry, love, it's not your time. And he like yeets her back into her body. So she wakes up on the floor with Stefan and Caroline saying that she saw Elena. I do love that she's the first one to see her. It's really nice. And for any of you that didn't like realize this, it is Nina. Like she is, we're having scenes now with Nina. She's in this last episode. This was when I started going, wait a second. <laughs> Isn't she only in the last episode? But I was still like, no, I'm only on episode 16. I hadn't put the pieces together yet. This is how few times I have watched season seven and eight. I was genuinely confused. So Damon rushes over to the bell tower and stops Vicky from ringing the bell by throwing her out the window. Matt shows up and he's obviously upset about this, but then Vicky just comes running up the stairs. Damon snaps her neck and she wakes up again because they're not really alive. So she's just gonna keep coming back. So Damon leaves Matt in charge of trying to convince Vicky to not ring the bell and blow the town up. We get a super emotional Donovan sibling scene. Matt is like, girl, this is our town. Like you can't blow it up. And Vicky is like, Matt, this is your town, okay? I've been stuck in hell and I don't wanna go back there ever again. So I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to free myself. So Matt, knowing that he's not gonna be able to stop her, activates the town's evacuation plan by calling for yet another gas leak. The boys go home and they find Elena's coffin open. We hear Damon and Elena wanders out asking what's going on and where she is. They tell her that Bonnie's okay, and then Damon runs to her and hugs her, and immediately as he's hugging her, he's like, no, oh my god, and he drops her on the ground, and he's like, Catherine. I always love more than anything that Damon can tell, okay? I just think that that's so great. So Catherine is standing there, and she goes, hello, brothers. She tells them Elena's body is off somewhere, hidden away, and once the town burns, Elena's gonna burn and then they'll never see her again. She tells them that the whole thing with Cade was like her doing, and she had him wrapped around her finger from the second she got into hell. Love that for her. Basically the only reason why Cade ever wanted them in the first place was because Catherine wanted them. It's a mess. It is a mess. Stefan stabs her with the bone knife that they made and she passes out. We know that that sends her back to hell for a little bit, so she like her body just drops and she's gone, and then they rush off to go try to find Elena. Matt runs into Peter at the hospital and he's like, dad, you gotta go. The bell's being rung. And Peter's like, but who's ringing the bell if I'm looking at you? And <laughs> freaking Matt has to go, Vicky's a ghost evil lady and she's here ringing the bell to blow the town up. And Peter's like, oh, okay. Caroline and Rick are like frantically packing up the house. They gather a few like sentimental items, like some pictures and stuff, but Rick says everything else is replaceable. Now this is wild, okay? Caroline is like, I have to stay and save Elena. That's the reason why she wants to stay in this moment. She's like, I have to stay and help save Elena. And Rick is like, no, you're a mom. You have to come with me and go with the girls so that they don't grow up without a mother. You of all people should know what that's like. And Caroline fights back on this. I thought that was crazy, okay? After all the shit she's gone through with like, I'm their mother and I'm the one who gave birth to them. Now she's like, you know what? It's okay if I stay and risk my life. I have to help my friends. Okay. Stefan finds Elena's body near the furnace at the high school, okay? He picks her up and goes to leave, but the room's been spelled shut. Now I wonder who could have done that spell? <laughs> Catherine wakes up and she runs into Damon in the woods. Yes, it was in fact Kai Parker. He put the spell on the furnace room that locked Elena inside, but like other people can come and go, but Elena's body can't be taken from that room. If only we hadn't locked him in a prison world. Damon tells her that she's just jealous of Elena and she's really wasting her time like doing this whole like final evil scheme to blow everybody up because really she's just after Elena and it's just proving that she's jealous and petty. And she goes, I'm not jealous, you're jealous, okay? Because freaking Elena would pick Stefan over you just like me, because Stefan's the better man. And this feels so forced. I hate this conversation. I don't know if it's just like Nina and Ian on screen together after a while or what, but there's something about this conversation that makes me like 
this is bad. <laughs> it's not a very long scene though, but it, it I don't like it. Damon also stabs her again, just because she gets on his nerves and he's like, be quiet. So the gang has like a four way phone call where Rick and Bonnie are in the car together and then Caroline and Stefan are standing in the hallway at the school, trying to come to terms with the fact that Elena's gonna die because they can't get to Kai to get him to break the spell. And even if they could, there's not a world where he's gonna do that for them now, okay? That ship has sailed. Bonnie's too far away to try to break the spell, so they can't do that either. And they know that if Elena burns, Damon's gonna stay behind and burn with her. They get off the phone, all right? So Bonnie and Rick are in the car, they're still going. I think they're heading towards the armory right now. Caroline and Stefan are in the hallway and they start crying because they know that now they have to say goodbye. She needs to leave to go be with the girls. It's time, like time's running out. And Stefan needs to stay and say goodbye to Damon and attempt to get him to like change his mind and go home with them. They have a very emotional goodbye where like she is sobbing, he's also crying. He tells her she has to go though because he's not gonna be able to focus and do what he needs to do unless he knows that she's safe. He whispers, he's my brother. And she goes, family first. And then they kiss and she vampire runs away from him so she can't stop herself. This right here was around the time where I went, oh, this is the last episode, isn't it? Because I realized what that goodbye was gonna mean for me emotionally. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> Rick, Bonnie, and the girls get to the armory. He apologizes for picking Caroline over Damon and Elena. He says like, obviously he's worried about them, but like Caroline is the mother of his kids. And he's like, I, I have to have her come home. Like I can't let her like risk her life for them. Bonnie is like, don't apologize to me. Okay, I understand. I am just now learning how to set those boundaries for myself, dude. He shows her the Hail Mary project that him and Dorian were working on to explode and destroy Cade's hell world. But they said that they realized that in order to do that, because it was so magical and strong, they were gonna need like a surplus of magical energy. And Bonnie goes, like the kind of energy found in Hellfire? So Bonnie calls Stefan and explains everything to him. She says that the most important thing is that they have to make sure Catherine is in hell. So somebody has to stab her and hold her body in hell so that the hellfire can take her out and destroy hell in the process. If Catherine is not in hell when they destroy it, she will not die. Bonnie says goodbye to the twins and it is so cute. She tells them that they helped her realize that she had magic in her all along. She asks them for luck and they each like rub one of her cheeks before Caroline comes running in. She's obviously like, anybody heard from Stefan? Is he on his way? And Bonnie is like, um, about that. And Rick goes, we actually need to leave. Girls, run to the car. And he starts like sending the girls outside. And he's like, Caroline, sweetie, we gotta go right now. No time to talk, we will talk in the car. So Bonnie and Caroline hug and Bonnie is like, I love you, I'm gonna save the world you need to go with Rick and your kids. Caroline is like, please don't do anything stupid, Bonnie Bennett, be careful. And Bonnie promises that she will be fine. Damon and Catherine are now down in the tunnels talking. Damon and Catherine talk down in the tunnels and he's like, my girl Bonnie Bennett has a plan for your ass and it's gonna end really badly for you. And Catherine is like, Bonnie is like hours away. Like, what are you talking about? She can't get here to stop me. Like, she's not even strong enough for that. And Damon is like, yeah, maybe if she like drove here, you know, the normal way, but these tunnels go direct to the armory, Miss Ma'am. It's only about seven miles, okay? She can handle seven miles. Bonnie's plan is to draw the hellfire from the bell tower, like down through the tunnels to the armory and then like ricochet it back. Unfortunately though, Damon thinks that he is the one that's gonna stay and sacrifice himself with Catherine. So he tells her that, that like you and I are gonna die in the process cause I'm gonna make sure your ass goes back to hell. Catherine says that he's bluffing and he wouldn't really do that. And then Stefan shows up and is like, uh, yeah, we would, we can't stand you. <laughs> Damon freaks out and he's like, get out, you delicate little human. What are you doing here? Catherine tries to sneak out in this moment of like brotherly fighting and Damon stabs her to knock her out. So she's unconscious on the ground while they argue above her body. Damon says that Stefan has to go and he needs to tell Elena that he did this for her because he wanted her to have a good life and like save her friends and save the town. This is how Damon is gonna pay for all his past mistakes. Stefan is like, no, 
This is the thing I need to do. This is how I'm going to make it up to Bonnie and Enzo. And Damon's like, would you stop blaming yourself for Enzo's death? Oh my God. They quite literally get into a redemption argument where they're like, I'm the bad brother. No, I'm the bad brother. No, me. I killed more people. That is what they spend this scene doing in the beginning. <laughs> Damon's argument is basically like, if we're talking about kill count, I've definitely killed more than you, which I don't know if I believe because I, we know the kind of stuff Stefan got up to in Monterey, all right? I don't think, I think Stefan's killed more people technically. And then Stefan's argument is like, I'm a human in 60 years, I'll be dead. But if you get out, you're looking at an eternity with Elena. Damon's like, that eternity will mean nothing if I don't have you too. Stefan's like, do you think I want this? Like, I just got married, okay? My wife is out there waiting for me to come home to her. But he says this is what he's been fighting for all along. Damon is finally the man he always wanted him to be and he wants him to get to live. So he's like, Damon, please let me do this for you. Damon says no. So Stefan goes, okay, then let me do this for me. Damon like holds him by the shoulder and goes, I love you little brother. And Stefan says, I love you too. And then Damon goes, you're right though. You are human which is why I can do this. And he starts compelling him. Stefan is begging him not to, but Damon is basically like, get out of these tunnels, keep walking until my death ends the compulsion, go. Oh, this is one of my favorite Damon lines though. He goes, they're crying, right? Like this is a very emotional moment and Catherine is just unconscious on the ground at their feet. <laughs> but Damon goes, I'm the big brother. I'm sorry I wasn't better at it before now. And then Stefan leaves. Vicky is still ringing the bell and now it's glowing red. Peter shows up to see her with Matt. She says that like he's a little late to be paternal, okay? She's not gonna stop ringing the bell. They're not gonna talk her out of it. But they say that's not why they came. Peter just wanted to see her one more time. They hug and all three of them are crying. It's very emotional. Caroline and Rick are in the car racing away from the armory. She asks him to tell her what's going on and he goes, Caroline, I don't know what to say. Stefan, and then his voice like tapers out, the music swells and Caroline just starts sobbing in the passenger seat. Bonnie is lighting the candles in the armory. She calls out for Grams. She's also very emotional. She's not like cry crying, but she's like getting worked up about this cause she's nervous. Then she starts a spell and wouldn't you know it, wind starts whipping around the room. Our girl's magic is back. Matt and Peter watch from the town square as Vicky like waves goodbye to them at the top of the bell tower and then goes to ring the bell one more time. Bonnie starts chanting louder while the wind just like whips into like a little tornado in the armory with her. Caroline begs Rick to pull over and she gets out and like frantically makes a phone call. Stefan doesn't answer so she leaves a message begging him to call her back because she needs to tell him something. She says that she understands and she loves him and she will love him forever. Yes, Rick is listening from inside the car. We see him like in the rear view mirror looking very heartbroken. Peter puts his hand on Matt's shoulder as Vicky rings the bell one more time and it just freaking explodes, taking Vicky with it. But Bonnie is still doing her spell, right? So the fire sort of shoots out from the bell tower and then like comes back into it and starts going down into the tunnel system. Catherine wakes up with Damon and he's like holding the knife. The fire starts like whipping through the tunnels around them and he goes, <laughs> poof. Stefan has made it up above, right? And he passes an ambulance and then like, freaks out and turns around and starts running back the other way. Bonnie is alone in the armory as the hellfire just like shoots up from the vaults and comes rushing into the room with her. She holds her hands out and stops it, but then her freaking nose starts bleeding. She's like glaring at the fire though. And she's like, I can do this. I can beat you. You can't have me. It's not my time. Enzo shows up beside her and he's like, now you're ready to live. She looks at him and she just goes, oh, hi. It, it's so cute. The way she says hi, it's so sweet. He tells her to keep fighting and she's like, I don't think I'm strong enough. I don't think I can do this on my own. He tells her she's strong enough to do anything she wants and she's not alone. So he's standing over here, right? And then all of a sudden somebody takes her hand on this side 
It's Grams, y'all. It's freaking Grams. I cry every time. This whole scene for Bonnie is just like, it's so good. They restart the chant, okay? And Beatrice, the one that was like originally with the bell shows up in Enzo's place. And then at her back, we see like every Bennett just standing with her chanting. They do the spell together and they send the fire racing back down the tunnels toward the bell. Bonnie's alone again in the armory. She whispers, I did it, and then passes out. Then we're at the high school, right? And we can see like pictures, like early season pictures of the cast of like the girls in their cheer uniforms and the boys on the football team. And we can hear these like overlaid lines from the early seasons. And then we see Elena's face reflected in the glass. She turns around and walks into Stefan. He admits that he doesn't know about Bonnie, but Damon was planning on sacrificing himself. Since Stefan is human now, he compelled him and he left. But he says that Damon didn't think it through all the way. He should have known that Stefan would never walk a day on earth without Vervain. So we go back to Stefan outside of that ambulance, only this time we see that he like grabbed a syringe and took some of his own blood before he went back down into the tunnels and stabbed Damon with it, giving him the cure. Okay, now for the person who asked this and we were all kind of like, I don't remember why that happened the way that it did. Um, the cure only keeps you from not aging when it is in your body. Once the cure is out of your body, your like human years will catch up to you, okay? So Stefan gave Damon the cure knowing that he was gonna then die because the aging was gonna catch up to him. Make other sense? Elena goes, hold on, so Damon's okay? Stefan nods and she goes, but you, you're, and he whispers, I did what I had to do. We then see Stefan holding Catherine to his chest with the knife like poised at her throat. The fire is racing through the tunnels towards them. She begged him to let her go one final time and he whispers, burn in hell before he stabs her in the heart. Then he looks over at Damon and goes, goodbye brother, before the fire just sweeps them both away. Elena is, and I cannot stress this enough, heartbroken in the hallway talking to him about this. But Stefan is okay. He says that he saw the Damon from his childhood memories today and that's the Damon that he wanted to live. And he wanted Elena to have the opportunity to get to know him because that Damon is the better man and he's the right man for Elena. He touches her face and he goes, it's so good to see you Elena, one last time. And they hug in the hallway, oh my God. As they're hugging, he goes, there's something I have to say. And then he whispers something into her ear and she like tearfully is like, yes, okay, definitely. And they let go of each other. Then he slowly walks out through the double doors into the light. So. Elena wasn't awake. She was in limbo land and he was visiting her. Similarly to how Bonnie was like visiting her and she was like on the bed. That's what was happening there. Cut to Stefan walking out into the light of the parking lot where Lexi is freaking waiting for him like leaning against the hood of his car. Shut up, they get to hug. He spins her around. It's so cute. Then we go to Bonnie like holding a candle and speaking over Elena. And we hear Elena's voice saying, Dear Diary, today will be different. Today I will smile and it will be genuine because today is the day I get to live again. We watch Elena wake up and Bonnie's just standing over her like, I did it, yes. She broke his spell because she is the better witch. I don't want any of y'all to forget it, okay? I love him and I know this mm, queen behavior. They hug and cry and then Elena is like, where is he? And Bonnie goes, he's with Caroline, saying goodbye. Elena tells us as we like cut over to the crypt and we see like red rose petals falling around the Salvatore graves, this life will be good and beautiful, but not without heartbreak. In death comes peace, but pain is the cost of living. Like love, it's how we know we're alive. We then see Damon and Caroline standing at Stefan's grave. They're like looking at his little nameplate. He asks her if she thinks peace really exists. And she says, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna see him again. Damon goes, 
okay, maybe you will, but like they're probably gonna open up hell again for me. And Caroline is like, mm, I wouldn't be so sure. They're like holding hands and she leans into his shoulder and he holds her for a second and they just have this sweet moment. I love where their friendship went in the end and the fact that they're united in their love for Stefan just like means everything to me. We haven't talked about it yet, but Hold On by Cord Overstreet is playing in this whole montage here at the end, all right? And it will make you cry. I don't care if you never cry at shows. The ending of this is wild. If there's one thing the show is good at, it's manipulating you with music and visuals at the same time. You're gonna cry. I don't, I don't care who you are. So Caroline walks outside and sees Elena and Bonnie. She's gonna hug her, but then Damon comes out behind her and she's like, oh, let me get out of the way. And she moves and Damon and Elena see each other. They smile at each other and then they just run into each other's arms and start kissing right there in front of the crypt. It's everything. Then we cut to Elena sitting with Caroline and Bonnie on the bench outside the crypt. She says that she needs to tell Caroline what Stefan whispered to her before he died or like as he was dying I guess. He said tell Caroline I heard her and I will love her forever too. Caroline goes he got my message and they all cry. Ah it's so good. <laughs> We then watch them like lay special objects outside the crypt for Stefan, similarly to how they did for Bonnie. So Caroline gives him like a little Mystic Falls keychain snow globe thing. And then Damon gives his daylight ring and Elena leaves her necklace. We cut to a Matt diary entry because I know you guys were all so concerned about what Mr. Donovan was up to. He says they survived and the town is finally safe. He's the sheriff now and he's thinking about running for mayor. Hella controversial choice here, okay? Uh, but Tyler and Vicky are like together behind him, watching him being like, we're at peace and happy for you, Matt. We love you. I feel like they should have been like on either side of him and maybe like looked at each other and smiled and then walked off in separate directions. I, I just don't feel like they're having fun being ghosts together. That's That's not how I thought we left things with them. Bonnie is like packing up frantically in her bedroom and she tells us in her diary entry that she is gonna keep her promise to Enzo and she's gonna live her life to the fullest, enjoying every minute of it. So she's like going to Europe. Our girl's getting out. I'm so proud of her, leave. As she's packing, she's like, okay, do I have everything? What am I forgetting? And from the doorway, Enzo is like, your passport, your passport in the nightstand implying that he's gonna be like guardian angeling her and like showing her things forever. <laughs> when she gets the passport out of the nightstand she also sees his blood necklace and she picks it up and is holding it and for a moment he's able to like gently touch her face and she can definitely like feel him even though she can't literally see him. She's like aware of his presence which is just so sweet. We then go to Rick and the girls and he tells us that Caroline and him have been given what Damon believes was Stefan's last wish. And we see Rick opening up a sign that says Salvatore boarding school for the young and gifted. The girls run up to hug him and we freaking see Joe <laughs> like a few feet away watching them. And he is like hugging the girls and then he feels Joe and he looks up but she's not there because they can't see the ghosts anymore, but the ghosts are still in town watching out for them. Oh my God. <laughs> Caroline tells us that opening the school was hard work, but don't worry. They brought in a team of experts, including our boy Dorian and Jeremy Gilbert. <laughs> this part, oh my God, this part, this is the part, this is the part that destroys me. Caroline's like taking a stack of letters from somebody and she drops them on the floor. And when she bends down to pick them up, Liz touches her arm and Caroline feels Liz and she looks and obviously she can't see her, but we can see her and she's smiling at her. And Caroline has a moment and then she picks up the letters and sits down at her desk. Oh my God, why did they do that to me? Of all the ones that you, that one was uncalled for. Anyway, one of the letters is from none other than Klaus Michelson, and I'm gonna read it to you. Okay, I read you the Damon to Bonnie letter. I'm gonna read you the Klaus to Caroline letter. This is what it says. Dearest Caroline, I have often imagined the paths your life might take, but your chosen future is more noble than I ever fathomed. Little tiny detail about that first sentence that I noticed because I had to pause the screen and like transcribe it. He wrote, I have oft imagined, 
and then he like shoved the E and the N in between often imagined. It's so cute. <laughs> he's an old man, girl, and he's in love with you. Please accept this contribution to your virtuous cause. I do look forward to thanking you in person someday, dot dot dot, however long it takes. Yours, Klaus. When Rick tells us about this letter, he's like, um, but that's the start of another story. I want to know right now, Rick. Tell me everything you know. <laughs> Elena gives us the final update, saying that when she finished med school, she came back to Mystic Falls because it felt right. It's where she wanted to grow old. And she did. She says, and that's my life. Weird, messy, complicated, sad, wonderful, amazing, and above all, epic. And she says that she owes it all to Stefan because he came into her life and reminded her to live. She's writing in the graveyard in front of the crypt, mm -hmm, and a crow comes and like startles her. Then she sees Damon and he's waiting for her and they hold hands and walk back to town together. Then we hear her voiceover saying, even after our long and happy life together, Damon is still worried he'll never see Stefan again or find peace. We then see them walking down her street, holding hands, wearing wedding rings this time. And suddenly Damon fades away and she's like not holding his hand anymore. And she's like, oh, where did he go? She's back at her old house. It's completely back to normal, looking beautiful and her parents, and Aunt Jenna are waiting for her on the porch. They all start hugging, and then the door opens and Uncle John is there too. So they all start hugging. She tells us that she knows Damon is wrong because that's the promise of peace. That one day, after a long life, we find each other again. We go to Stefan, standing at the fireplace in the Salvatore house, holding the glass of bourbon. Suddenly, he turns to the door. He opens it to find Damon waiting there for him. And he goes, Damon. And Damon says, hello, brother. And they hug. We get a gorgeous final shot of the boys hugging in the doorway to the house, backlit by like the bright sunlight behind them as we fade to white light. That's the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As always, thank you guys so, so much for watching. Your continued support on this series is just the best, and I am so excited to be starting the originals so soon. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you so soon. Have a good one. Bye.